Okay. Aloha Chair, we are live on YouTube. You have the floor. Thank you, Rayanne. Good morning, everyone. This is the April 20, 2021 meeting of the Commission on Water Resource Management. It's 9.02 a.m. Thank you all for joining. We're having the meeting online via Zoom due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. And so commissioner staff, applicants, and testifiers are able to participate live online uh, via Zoom. And the general public is able to watch on YouTube. We have uh, written testimony we've received in advance that's posted on the DLNR website under the Water Commission uh, webpage. And uh, persons who signed up in advance to testify orally are in the waiting room until their agenda item is uh, up. And then we will bring you into the in the meeting online in Zoom for your agenda item. So thank you all for joining, uh, however you are joining. I'm going to read the standard contested case statement. In some of the matters before the commission, a person may wish to request a contested case hearing. If such a request is made before the commission's, commission's decision, then the commission will, re will consider the request first before considering the merits of the item before it. A person who wants a contested case may also wait until the commission decides the issue, then request the contested case after the decision. It's up to you. Any request must be made orally by the end of the meeting and followed up in writing within 10 days. If no request for contested case is made, the commission will make a decision and the department will treat the decision as final and proceed accordingly. Um, just for everyone's reference, we are going to be holding uh, item C1 before B2 because it's informational information that is uh, helpful. So we'll go A, B1, C1, then B2, and then continue on. First up is approval of the minutes. There's no public testimony on A, approval of minutes. Commissioners, any uh, comments or questions on the minutes of March 16, 2021? And if not, is there a motion to approve the minutes as submitted? Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Thank second. you. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. Any abstain? Okay, so for the record, that is Case, Meyer, Buck, Kawaoka, Hannes, Katayama, and Beamer. Thank you very much. That motion passes unanimously. Next up law, is- Law firm, sounds like a good law firm. <laughs> that passes. Uh, uh, next up on the agenda is item B1. B1, and before we start B1, Commissioner Meyer, uh, you have a statement you're going to make. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, I'd like to recuse myself from this item, and okay. uh, I will uh, mute my mic. Okay, thank you so much. All right, uh, Dean, go ahead, B1. Good morning, Commissioners. Uh, item B1 is a request for approval. Sorry, hang on one second. I want to make sure you have... Um, Ran is, do we have Mr. Buck in the room, in the waiting room? There we go. He's coming on now. Let's just make sure his audio is connected. All right, Mr. Buck, can you hear? Yes, now I can hear. My son was there trying to come me. Okay. Yeah. okay, thank you. Okay, Dean, go ahead, B1. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, item B1 is a request for approval of the payment plan proposed by Mr. Rayner Warner Buck, trustee, uh, for fines imposed by the commission on November 17th under item B4 in conjunction with the issued after the stream, after the fact stream channel alteration permit, uh, SCAP 5422.6. Um, and this is in regards to the East Kuyaha stream and Haiku Maui. Did I sound down a little? Um, as you're aware of the background, uh, I won't go through it all, but it goes back to August uh, 2016. Uh, there were several times in the past that we brought it to the commission, um, but the final, uh, the final vote on the matter uh, was given at the November 17, 2020 uh, commission meeting. 
um, which approved staff's recommendations with amendments um, as are noted in the submittal. Uh, this also included imposing a fine of $39,000 due within 90 days of commission action. I do wanna make note of the footnote at the bottom of page four. Um, this, the, notice of the notice of commission action slash notice of violation, which was sent to the permittee, um, after going back and listening to the recording of the commission meeting, noted that the uh, fine was due within 120 days of commission action. Um, but it also added a condition that the applicant submit, um, or the permittee submit a progress report to the commission staff in 90 days on funding for fine and remediation project. Um, <clears throat> we received an email from Mr. Bach on February 16th, 2021, uh, noting that um, he was informing us within a 90 day time period um, of his intent to pay the fine, but he also noted that he would, and his, um, the verbatim text is there in the submittal, um, but basically he wasn't able to obtain a loan and therefore would um, make an initial payment of $10,000 um, before the end of March at the time, um, and then make subsequent payments over a six month period. And so uh, in that we developed the uh, proposed recommendation um, and the fine payment plan as noted at the bottom of page five. Um, if I can just read it. In compliance with, with the recommendations approved by the commission at November 17, 2020 commission meeting, uh, Mr. Bach did meet the, 20, the 90 day deadline to provide a progress report on his efforts to pay the fine. Um, so the payment would be $10,000 due April 30th, 2021, uh, 5,000 due at the end of May 31st, um, and then 4,800 for each successive month for June, July, August, September, and October. <clears throat> the commission staff understands that Mr. Bach may also, may also have difficulty in initiating the remediation work approved under the SCAP um, until the fine is paid. Therefore, we'd like to reiterate uh, that the commission deliberately decoupled the fine from the actual initiation of beginning the remediation work so that work on the remediation project could proceed despite the status of the fine. Um, that concludes staff's recommendation, or excuse me, the presentation and uh, to put forth the recommendation that the commission approve the payment plan proposed by Mr. Rayner Bach as follows, um, as noted there, and then to direct Mr. Bach to proceed with the re remediation work despite the fine from the channel, the stream channel alteration permit expiration date of November 17, 2022, um, as well as providing an update on the status of implementing the remediation plan approved under the SCAP by April 30th, 2021. Thank you. Uh, commissioners, any questions? Mr. Buck and yeah, then uh, Dennis. Yeah, did the Dean, so thank you for that. I just wonder in your staff recommendation, we did decouple the remediation from the fine. Uh, to me, beginning the remediation is very important, maybe more important than actually getting paid for the fine as far as timing. I wonder how you handle how you handled those priorities in your recommendation, because it seems like we have a payment schedule for the fine, but that 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 might uh, delay any re remediation. Thank you. Um, I mean, as much as possible, if the applicant or permittee, excuse me, could um, could proceed on both fronts. Um, I understand that in, in successive communications with Mr. Bach, um, there has been some damage to his property resulting from the flooding. Um, experienced uh, the last month up in Haiku. So um, he may, there may be additional work that he needs to do. Um, we have yet to talk to him about that um, as a result of the, the damages from the flooding. Um, but as much as he can proceed under the per existing permit conditions, um, he can proceed with those at any time. And, and we just wanted to note that he does have two years to complete the project. So, um, you know, as much as he can complete under that work, uh, under that permit, um, he should be moving forward with that if possible. Chair, one more quick follow-up. What I forgot, Dean, what is the ramifications if he does not do the remediation or he does not, not stick to that schedule? Um, you mean the fine payment schedule? No, I, I, mean, I mean actually doing the remediation. Um, we'll have to see. I mean, uh, you know, a lot depends on, on his... his um, current status, I guess, and funding. Uh, he could come in for a permit extension 
um, after the two years, at which time, you know, we, we could bring that back to the commission if you wanted to. All right, thank you. Thank you, there any other questions? I, I do have a, a question. Um, Beamer. You, uh, you know, thank you, Dean, for all the work on this. I know this has been a, um, a long process and, and trying to get everything corrected and right. Um, uh, it, it just in lines with the remediation versus the the fine. Um, f personally, from my perspective, fixing the problem is uh, is critical. So, um, yeah, I'm just wondering how we're gonna how we're gonna ensure that the remediation happens. If if we levy the fine and we accept the payment plan, then um, you know what? Where do we go if if the remediation never starts, we have had thoughts about that. Um, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, Can I, I say something? Can I say something? Mr. Bach, go ahead. Yeah, first of all, the remediation will start. You know, I have all intent, you know, to get the remediation done. It is not that I'm trying to withdraw from a remediation. You know, I said from the beginning, you know, that I will do that and I will comply with the commission. So the question that I will not do that shouldn't even come up because I will do it. Now, you know, what has happened, you know, uh, recently, you know, when, uh, Mayor Victoriani uh, or Victoriano um, declared an emergency. You know, we had a, a dam break or got breached, you know, on Capacalua Road. And we had, you know, I mean, tremendous amount of water coming, coming down the East Coyaha and uh, which has damaged all the properties, not only my property. Now, you know, from the beginning, and I have sent, you know, I mean, a very clear, you know, explanation in a letter, you know, which explains, you know, uh, what happened in 2016, you know, till now. So what I explained is, you know, that it was told to, that I actually, you know, um, how would I say, let me read what I said here, that is better. Well, I sent uh, on Monday, April 19th, I sent, you know, a letter to the Water Commission, you know, and in this letter, it says very clearly, you know, uh, what has happened, you know, in 2016, because in 2016, nobody had an idea about, you know, uh, our weather situation. We did not understand about climate change. And so, you know, when uh, Mrs. Autry made a complaint with you, you directed that in a way, you know, that I caused this brown water. So I made it very clear, you know, that at the point, you know, when I did any work for which I apologize, you know, I did it without permit, but for, at the time I did the work, there was not a drop of water in the stream. And so, you know, when the Eo Valley flood happened in 2016, that was the first time, you know, we got hit by a flood. Now, you know, nobody understood it at that time, me not either, you know, why we would have these floods. But subsequently, we have had every two years a huge flood, you know. So in 2018 was the second flood, and now in 2021 was an outrageous flood. You know, and so I have sent photos to the commission showing, you know, I mean, what damage it caused. I have, you know, sent a letter, you know, on April 19 explaining in detail, you know, what happened. And so I think, you know, when, when in 2016 that whole thing started, first of all, I complied from day one, you know, with, the, with, the, with whatever the commission asked me to do from day one. I never, you know, I mean, refused anything and I always complied. Now, having said this, you know, um, my lawyer, Mr. Mancini, you know, he was not present at the time, you know, when I received the first communication. So I sent this communication on to uh, Paul and Paul replied that he was in Australia and he would get back, you know, to the deputy uh, director of, um, of the Water Commission to get an extension. He did get back, you know, to the uh, deputy, collect, uh, deputy director of the Water Commission, and he did get an extension. 
but still, you know, I was fined $39,000 on the grounds, you know, that 39 days or whatever, you know, uh, this uh, delayed, you know, to file for a permit. So I don't find this, you know, morally and ethically, you know, right. Because I've gone out of my way, you know, to show that I'm very willing, you know, to do whatever right, you know, what, what happened in a wrong way. You know, so I'm very apologetic and I really will die, try my best to, to fix, you know, whatever can be fixed. Now, Thank you, it, Mr. Buck. Sorry, I'm sorry, Mr. Buck. I, so my, my question wasn't, um, it's just my responsibility as a commissioner. It's nothing, uh, I, I, I respect your situation. I, I have empathy and, um, you know, I, I'm trying to do everything I can just to m maintain that the stream gets fixed. So it's nothing, uh, I, I, I'm glad to hear that you will do the work and I'm just trying to manage it from our perspective as a, as a commissioner. And, and, I, and I agree, I appreciate all of your testimony and everything that you've shared with us and um, the effects of climate change are serious. And um, so I, I thank you, I thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And now you have to understand the fact. The fact is, you know, that the stream is the double width by now. Because, you know, Mr. Buck, we're, we're only hearing um, the, the question of your payment plan today. So I know we, we have, okay. we appreciate all of your testimony in the past. Um, and so this is, this is really only about the payment plan. So I'm just trying to see if, um, do, you, do you have any problem with the payment plan as, as proposed? You're asking me? Yeah, you're okay. I'm, I'm assuming you're okay well, with this. For the payment plan yeah okay the, the situation is you know that i mean whenever that fine happened you know we were in a situation of COVID that okay. has not changed you know okay. in all of 2020 nobody could work in 2021 nobody can work you know and i'm supposed to a pay a fine which i will definitely try to do if if that's the case what i need to do but you know at the same time you have to understand you know reality and reality is if you if the government supports us by sending us you know payments you know we have to go then you know and and try to you know do whatever we can in order to pay a fine i don't find this you know ethically or morally correct you know i i don't even find the fine correct but if that's the case i will pay the fine uh, with the payment plan you know um, which was proposed yes okay thank you commissioners do you have any other questions mr katayama thank you chair hi this is to dean in your recommendation and item two, is a date April 30th, 2021, the correct date? Um, yes, Mr. Bach was intending to pay, he initially emailed us back in February and um, <clears throat> at that time he was intending to pay the fine at the end of March. And so that's why we were- No, but the question is, it says provide an update says approved under the SCARAB dated April 30th, 2021. That's a future date. Oh, right. So we'd like to see the status of the re remediation plan by April 30th. Um, you know, where is he at now in, in, the, in moving forward with his remediation work? So approved under, okay, that's SCARAB by the date. So is it just a one-time report? Yes. At this point, yes. Given testimony that you've heard or comments that you've heard, is it possible to uh, require additional updates if progress is not being, uh, or there's some change in the progress timeline? Um, we can certainly add a condition if you if you'd like to see another um, report. So uh, I guess I'm more what what you're comfortable with in sort of managing the situation um, to ensure that uh, the concerns of the commissioners are addressed before you know we get too delinquent on the matter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we could we could include a um, ask for a status again in April 2022. 
a year, one year out. That's that's fine. I mean, it, it's again, if you have the ability to do that, that's fine. You don't have to uh, codify it in any way. So in the so I think what you're hearing, Dean, is uh, the commissioners want you to keep an eye on it and and basically come back to us. Exactly. Come back to us if there's a problem. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Um, and we don't want to overburden you with more work. Yeah, the only thing I would I would add though is, is just to I mean you can if you could amend the, the recommendation to add it um, to add on that date that way we, when we provide the notice of commission action the date is included there as well. Okay. Okay. What? Well, that's that's fine. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Buck. Yeah, I yes. I, I, I would move to approve this. Uh, uh, item B1 with the added condition of an additional update report on August 30th, 2022. Thank you. Is there a second? Second from Mr. Katayama. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. If I can, aye. just to clarify, that was April 30th, 2022. Yes. Thank you. Any oppose? Any abstain? Okay. So that is unanimous with the recusal noted of Mr. Meyer. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bach. Good luck with your, your remediation work. Thank, thank you, Mr. Bach. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, I thank appreciate you, Mr. Bach. And, I hope, you know, and I hope we understand that climate change did hit Hawaii and that you know our life will never be the same because you know we have to adapt to these uh, changes. Otherwise, we're gonna have catastrophic things you know, happening to our island. That we really do not wish to this island and to the people. Thank you. Agree. Agree. Okay, okay, we are going to move you. on to agenda item C1. C1. So we'll just do a little switch out here. Uh, But Dr. Oki, are you the only one from USGM? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, Dr. Oki, please proceed. Oh, okay. Um, uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, the commissioners for this opportunity to present our results from a recent study that was just published. And uh, let me try to get this. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about a study recently published looking at the effects of groundwater withdrawals on uh, resources at Coloco Honokahau National Historical Park, otherwise known as Kaho. Uh, th so this is a kind of an oblique view of the Coloco Honokahau National Park. You can see it's within the Keaho Aquifer system as defined by the state. Um, it's also in the coastal part of the groundwater system, which I will briefly describe um, in the next few slides. So as an outline for this presentation, I'll, I'll give you a brief background of the hydrogeologic setting. I'll describe the study objective that we had and then just present quickly some selected study results. This is a map of uh, groundwater levels in the Keho aquifer system. And you can see that uh, there are two colors shown here, the two colored dots representing wells in the area. The pink wells have water levels that are very low, only a few feet above sea level. And this is consistent with the, the thin freshwater lens that exists in that area. In the early 1990s, a uh, few wells started being drilled in the inland area. And that was when we first discovered that um, those blue wells that indicate higher water levels, typically uh, greater than 40 feet above sea level and more commonly hundreds of feet above sea level. So there's a pretty uh, sharp difference between conditions in the inland area and in the coastal area as demarcated by the, or as shown by the blue and the pink dots. Uh, so this is a map view of two different modes of groundwater occurrence we know of in the area the coastal freshwater lens system represented by the pink wells 
and the inland high water level area represented by the blue wells. And that blue dashed line is kind of the approximate boundary between the two types of groundwater occurrence. Now in cross section, it's kind um, of- Sorry, uh, Mr. Mr. Oki, uh, no, sorry, this yes. is um, Commissioner Beamer. Could you just go back to the, the last slide? Just for, um, I, I'm just to get a, a context here. If you were to age the, the data that these wells were drilled, um, you know, between the, and it's color, I'm a little bit colorblind, but I think that's kind of purple between the purple yes. and, um, <laughs> and turquoise. Um, yeah. Am I right in assuming the turquoise probably would be drilled more recently and, and the, the purples are older wells? Is that? Well, the first well drilled inland of that blue dash, that dashed line, the first wells in that area, the inland area, area were drilled in about 1990, 1991. So all of the blue dots, the inland wells were drilled um, since 1990. The wells closer to the coast, they had been drilled at various times uh, prior to the 1990s and some of them more recently. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, so this map shows two types of groundwater occurrence, the high water levels in the inland area and the low water levels in the coastal freshwater lens system. But when you take a slice in the aquifer, uh, looking at it from a cross-sectional view, uh, again, you can see the inland area with high water levels. Um, and then you have a coastal freshwater lens system, which occurs just below the groundwater table. But as you go deeper down, uh, we discovered fairly recently within the, about the last decade or so, that there's a deeper confined groundwater system that contains fresh water. Okay, so this is the same, on the, on the left side is the same cross section. And back in about 2010, a deep well was drilled through the coastal freshwater lens system, hit salt water, and then penetrated that deeper confined freshwater. So in the graph on the right, um, is plotted a salinity profile from that monitor well. On the vertical scale is the altitude in feet relative to sea level. So as you get, as you move down, you get deeper and deeper. On the horizontal scale is a measure of the salinity of the groundwater. On the left side where the value is zero, that would correspond to fresh water. And towards the right hand side of the horizontal scale, uh, that would correspond to salt water. And as you can see from that, that blue line in the graph, uh, water starts out near, near sea level, kind of in the, toward the fresher end of the scale, the horizontal scale, but it's still brackish water. And as you get deeper and deeper, uh, you start moving over to the right-hand side of the scale towards salt water. And ultimately um, you reach down about 500 feet below sea level, you reach a condition that's uh, close to all salt water. Uh, as, you, as the well was drilled deeper, it eventually penetrated through a confining unit, which we don't know exactly what it was, but it could be um, a low permeability ash layer, a uh, low permeability lava flow, or possibly even just a weathered surface that um, has low permeability. Um, regardless of what it is, it confined a, a kind of a narrow zone of freshwater that you can see there's this blue uh, section here down about 1100 feet below sea level. And as the well was drilled deeper, the salinity of the water popped up again towards the saltwater end. So this, this well was, was instrumental in helping us to understand conceptually what's going on uh, in the groundwater system. There's really three different modes of groundwater occurrence in the Keoho area. There's the coastal freshwater land system, which we've known about for a long time. And there's the inland area with high water levels that we've known about since the 1990s. And then since the past decade or so, we've discovered that there's a deeper system of fresher water that's a, kind of a confined coastal groundwater system. Doctor, okay, uh, 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 can you just hold on that? Go back one slide, a okay. quick question. So I, I know it, it's relatively new, but the relationship between the coastal freshwater and the confined, 
are those really two separate flows or or what do we you know the current knowledge what's the current knowledge of their interaction yeah so uh based on information that we have uh from geochemistry information isotopes water isotopes um the the coastal well the the three systems probably have some uh, degree of hydrologic connection. Uh, the water isotopes that uh, have been collected in the coastal, coastal freshwater lens system do indicate a component of water that's originating from the inland area. And the inland area uh, of high water levels, that's probably connected to that coastal confined groundwater system. And um, there's not because nothing's totally impermeable, um, there, it's 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 kind of likely that some of that coastal confined groundwater um, discharges upward into the freshwater land system. So, um, from my perspective, there's probably some degree of interconnection amongst the the three types of groundwater occurrence. Sorry, Dr. Oyelki, uh Commissioner Beamer again, and yeah. just looking at this one specific graph, but trying to get a sense for, um, again, it's just one graph, but the, the submerged um, groundwater, um, the depth there, so is that, is that about, is that 30 feet, of, you know, where we're seeing it go fresh, and then it changes back, or how, What's the depth of that fresh water? Yeah, that, that's approximately right. It's about 10 meters thick, roughly. Okay, okay, thank you. And that's just at this site, of course. So, you know, just this one, just one measurement, yes, thank you. Yeah. Dr. Oki, this is Commissioner Hannes. Uh, so do I understand correctly that we have no active wells that are drawing from this uh, confined source? That's correct. There, there are only a few wells that actually have penetrated into that zone so far. Uh, this is one, the Kamakana well. Another one is the uh, state uh, water commission drilled a well um, at Keopu that penetrated into this freshwater zone. But those so are monitor and their purposes are wells. for monitoring purposes. Monitoring, yes. Were we to draw from that uh, were we to allow that, and I'm, I'm not saying we, we want to, but would there be a risk of kind of a collapse of that system as you kind of vacate some of the, the water beneath it? Well, um, it's possible that you would induce some salt water to flow into that system. Um, so for example, and let me go back into the bigger one. If you start pumping from this coastal confined groundwater system, a couple of things could happen. One is that you could start inducing some salt water to enter um, because you'll have less uh, fresh water discharge and you, you, you probably allow some of the salt water from the ocean to start intruding into this coastal confined system. Uh, the other thing that might happen is because you're gonna be reducing the essentially the pressure within this confined ground, groundwater system, um, it's possible that, um, well, it, well, certainly you'll, you, you'll probably get a little bit of intrusion from the coast, um, but it's possible that you also get a little less discharge from this coastal confined groundwater system into, you know, upward or downward, because you're going to be reducing the pressure in that uh, confined system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's going to have two effects, essentially. Well, one, more, one more question. Last month, we had a, a report uh, on the remarkable recovery of our East Maui near shore uh, due to the increased surface water discharge. Uh, is this uh, coast, this water discharging is, would you consider that to be important to the estuarine life or the near shore marine life? Um, well, and we can, we'll, I'll talk, I'll mention it. Certainly the discharge from the coastal system has some uh, importance in terms of supporting groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, the deeper, water. Um, I, I can't really speak to that. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, I have one more. And again, this is, uh, can, can you go back to that slide? Is it possible, uh, Mr. Oki, that 
if we do pump the coastal confined groundwater, that it would have an impact by lessening the, the coastal freshwater lens system because water would just be replaced in the coastal confined and the coastal freshwater lens system might be compromised at all. Yeah, that, that's possible. So if you start withdrawing water from this coastal confined groundwater system, um, you'll start to get a little bit of intrusion from the ocean of salt water. And also, you know, I've shown some arrows of discharge from the coastal confined groundwater system to the upper uh, part, of, you know, above the confining unit into the coastal freshwater land system. Uh, you're going to probably reduce uh, that discharge, whatever that may be. So there's going to be two effects. Okay, so um, in terms of the importance of the discharge to the nearshore environment, um, the one of the main reason, I guess, why the park was concerned about. Uh, groundwater development in the inland area uh, was that the park supports a number of ecosystems that are dependent on groundwater. And I've just shown a couple here. Uh, they have fish ponds, a couple of fish ponds in the park that are not only culturally important, but they also uh, serve as habitat for a couple of native endangered water birds. Although I, I understand that now the stilt, the Hawaiian stilt is being considered for potential ground listing to threatened instead of endangered. Uh, there's also groundwater dependent ecosystems in the form of um, these shallow anchoring pools. They range in size from, you know, just a few feet in diameter to, you know, tens to hundred feet in diameter. Uh, but these anchoring pools support um, a number of anchoring pool shrimp species, uh, at least one of them, I believe, is uh, listed. And the anchoring pools also support habitat for a native Hawaiian damselfly, the orange black Hawaiian damselfly, which is listed as endangered. So these uh, ecosystems within the park are dependent on groundwater discharge. Uh, we recently published our report on simulated effects of groundwater withdrawal and injection on conditions within the park. And the objective of the study was to quantify the changes in groundwater discharge and salinity in Kaho, Koloko Hono Kahau National Historical Park, for selected scenarios of groundwater withdrawal from an injection of high salinity, salinity water to the coastal freshwater lens system. Now for today's presentation, I'm not gonna talk about the injection um, I'm just going to tie myself into knots if I do, I, I think. It's, it's a little bit of an unexpected result, and I don't really want to get into that detail. But I will talk about the effects of uh, selected withdrawal scenarios. Okay, so to address uh, the objective, we developed a three-dimensional numerical groundwater model that's capable of simulating not only changes in water levels and flow, but also changes in salinity. So this is a, a map. There's on the left side is a map view of the model domain. It's kind of shown as a colored area. And you can see it doesn't cover the entire Keaho aquifer system bound area. Um, it just covers part of it. And that was intentional, partly because of computational constraints numerical uh, computational constraints, but it was also driven um, largely by uncertainties in our understanding of the groundwater system in Keaho. So for example, it doesn't extend to the inland area um, because uh, I wasn't entirely confident that we could successfully model the inland area in its entirety. Um, it also does not extend far towards the south of the Keaho aquifer system um, again, because of, uh, partly because of my comfort level with um, conditions in, in the southern part of the aquifer system. Okay, so we did uh, a couple of things with the numerical model. Uh, first, on the left side, 
one of the things we wanted to determine with the model was how withdrawals from the coastal freshwater lens system would affect the discharge of fresh water through CAHO. And so we can use the model to quantify that for a given withdrawal condition. Uh, secondly, what we did with the model was to try to quantify the change in salinity at selected sites that are known to ha uh, be habitat for damselflies. So these would be selected ankle ankling pools that support damselfly habitat. Uh, we started off with uh, a base condition in the model that represented kind of an average condition in terms of groundwater recharge and existing withdrawal. And then we superimposed upon that uh, additional withdrawals to see what the uh, effect would be on the resources in Cajo in terms of freshwater discharge or in terms of salinity at the damselfly habitat shown as the, those orange spots. Okay, so to start, I'm gonna kind of step through this because the, ultimately we're gonna to get to a, a, a map that summarizes the results but I think it's important to kind of take a stepwise approach to this because the map, the final map is a little confusing. So what I did with the model was to simulate uh, one site at a time, a withdrawal, first of all, in this scenario, a withdrawal of half a million gallons per day at a particular site shown as that blue dot in the upper part of the, the model domain. I pump the model at half a million gallons per day from this site one, and I quantified what the reduction in freshwater discharge was through CAHO as a result of that withdrawal at site one. So for this particular case, uh, the model estimated that the withdrawal through CAHO would be reduced by about 0 0.068 million gallons per day. Okay, so that's just one site. Uh, what I did then was simulate the withdrawal, same, same magnitude withdrawal, half a million gallons per day at a second site. And so that's shown the blue that it's located a little more towards the coast relative to site one. And if you pump half a million gallons per day from site two, the model estimated that within Cajo, the freshwater discharge would be reduced by 0 0.03 million gallons per day. Okay, so slightly less of a impact relative to, to site one. And then what I, so what I, what I did was I simulated that effect at 15 selected sites throughout uh, the model domain. And I simulated them one at a time independent of each other. And I, I quantified what the effect at each, pumping each one of those sites at half a million gallons per day, what the effect would be in terms of how much the freshwater discharge would be reduced at CAHO. And so you can see I plotted all 15 sites here and I've posted the numeric uh, values indicating the freshwater discharge reduction through CAHO. And it's a little difficult to get a spatial pattern from those dots and those numbers. So ultimately what I did was I just contoured those results. So these contours are represent the results of those 15 independent simulations. And it shows what the effect of withdrawing anywhere along one of these contour lines would be. If we, so for example, if we withdraw half a million gallons per day along this contour that's labeled 0 0.02, which if a well is located anywhere along that contour, pumping a half a million gallons per day, the model would estimate that the discharge through Kolokohonokohau National Historical Park would be reduced by 0 0.02 million gallons per day. Um, as you get closer to the park, you can see that this uh, inner contour, which is labeled 0 0.16. So if you pump anywhere along this contour at half a million gallons per day, the result the model predicts is that about uh, the discharge through CAHO would be reduced by about 0.16 million gallons per day. Um, a, a couple of uh, notes that I want to make about these contours, first of all, is it's unlikely that uh, the, it, there will be any withdrawals within the boundaries of the park itself. 
I don't think the national park would want to pump half a million gallons per day within the park. So these contours are just kind of an extrapolation or interpolation of the results. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> um, the contours would definitely benefit from a greater number of withdrawal sites simulated in the model. I just selected 15 and that was kind of adequate for getting a, a regional sense, a regional pattern of how fresh water would be uh, reduced in Cajo by pumping. But the contours um, are just an interpolation. They don't really factor in some important features um, that could affect the shape of the contours. Uh, so that's important to keep in mind. Uh, it's just an interpolation of the 15 sites. Okay, so that's a result uh, relative to how withdrawal of a half a million gallons per day would reduce freshwater discharge through Cajo. Uh, next, what we wanted to do was to quantify how uh, withdrawing half a million gallons per day would affect the salinity of groundwater at the Anklin pool habitat. So this is a similar type of map relative to the last uh, slide. Uh, again, it's the same 15 sites. They were all pumped at the same rate, one at a time, at half a million gallons per day. And I contoured the results in terms of how much the salinity would be increased uh, at these dams of fly uh, anchoring pools if you pump half a million gallons per day anywhere along one of these lines. So again, if a well withdraws half a million gallons per day anywhere along this line labeled 0 0.1, the model would indicate that the salinity at the damselfly habitat would be increased by 0.1% of ocean water salinity. Um, so let me give you a, a sense of what that is. 0.1% ocean water salinity uh, corresponds to about um, well, let me, let me, let me go to, um, 1% would be about 200 milligrams per liter chloride concentration. So 0.1% of ocean water salinity would be 20 milligrams per liter of chloride. And to give you a kind of a sense for what that means, uh, in terms of drinking water, now, of course, that's not really relevant to the damsel fly, but in terms of human drinking water, EPA has a secondary standard for drinking water of 250 milligrams per liter chloride. So this line point one represents about 20 milligrams per liter chloride. And the, the contour in the center of the map, which is labeled point five, that would represent about 100 milligrams per liter chloride. So that's, that's just trying to put this in perspective of maybe some numbers that people are familiar with in terms of um, uh, the salinity. Okay, so that was looking at uh, those previous two uh, slides showed the effect of withdrawing half a million gallons per day of water from the sites in the freshwater lens system. And then what I did with the model was I doubled the withdrawal rate to 1 million gallons per day. And I mean, I, I guess I wasn't totally expecting how linear the system was, but the response that the model predicted anyway was that relative to the previous scenario where the model was uh, kind of stressed at half a million gallons per day at each one of those sites, by doubling the stress you actually double the effect at Cajo in a rough sense. So let me go back a couple of slides. Uh, the largest value contour at a half a million gallons per day withdrawal is about 0.16 uh, million gallons per day reduction in freshwater discharge. That contour, the largest contour is 0.16. And if we double the withdrawal rate, now the effect in terms of reducing freshwater discharge to Cajo is 0.3 million gallons per day. So it's roughly doubled. 
Um, it's, it's, it's fairly linear in its response within the range tested. And then similarly, the effect on salinity at the damselfly habitat was roughly doubled when you double the withdrawal rate. So in the previous uh, scenario at a half a million gallons per day, the largest contour was 0.5% ocean water salinity, which corresponded to about uh, 100 milligrams per liter chloride. Now in this case where we doubled the withdrawal rate to a million gallons per day, we can see that the salinity at the damselfly habitat, according to the model, would increase to about would increase by about 200 milligrams per liter chloride, or 1% of ocean water salinity. Okay, so that's a really quick summary of some elected results from our study. Um, and this is a quick summary uh, of those results. So what we found that withdrawal of additional groundwater from the coastal freshwater lens system will affect the quality and quantity of groundwater discharge in Kaho. Uh, the magnitude of the effect is going to be rate and site dependent. Uh, one thing that was beyond the scope of our study was to evaluate the ecologic effects of the changes that we were able to quantify with the groundwater model. So we're able to quantify the hydrologic effects, but we're not able to establish what the ecologic effects yet are. Um, and clearly um, our conceptual understanding of groundwater occurrence in that Keoho aquifer system in general is uh, not 100% certainty yet, um, and, but we can improve as we start getting additional information. So with that, I will end. Okay, thank you very, very much, um, Dr. Oki. Um, uh, commissioners, um, other questions? Let's, let's um, stop. Chair, Chair, I have a comment. Uh, uh, Del, thank, thank you for your report. Uh, anxious to see how it's gonna to apply to some of the other matters before us, uh, even to, as early as today. But, uh, you know, having spent most of my uh, professional life correcting people who said, refer to Kamehameha schools as CAM schools, I'm just wondering whether you want to think, rethink your constant uh, uh, reference to Kaho as a proper reference to this place name. Uh, it, it might not be received well within the Hawaiian community. And as you roll this out, it, you don't want that to just stand in the way of people absorbing the content of the report, the feeling that they're somehow a little bit insulted by that kind of abbreviation. Uh, so even an acronym would be better, uh, but I, I have a hunch you're gonna buy some resistance in the community if you continue that reference. And I'm not sure if it's your reference or it's the park's reference or somebody else's reference, but uh, I'm just, be forewarned. I appreciate that. Uh, it's actually the, the National Park has these four letter uh, acronyms for their, each one of their parks. and. Kahu is what they use for Koloko Honokoha National K Historic Park. KHNP would be better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I, yeah I, I didn't want to keep repeating Koloko Honokoha National Historical Park throughout the talk. I, I, I got you. And I didn't want to okay. disrupt, I, I had the point, felt like it, uh, the point early on, but I didn't want to disrupt the flow of your, your presentation because I figured you, it was going to be a constant reference. Uh, we, it was really important to let you speak. So thank you, Del. Noted, noted. Uh, Mr. Katayama. Well, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Dr. Toki. I guess uh, two questions. One is, um, what is the next steps in terms of getting more information? Well, I would think that there would be two things that would be very useful. One is uh, collecting more information by drilling more wells, uh, more exploratory wells. I know the state has plans to drill a deep monitoring well uh, inland of the park. And um, more information would definitely help our conceptual understanding. Another, another thing that really needs to be done, and because this is an emerging issue, 
looking at groundwater dependent ecosystems. This is not the only place where it uh, is important, nor is it the only place where it's going to be important in the future. So understanding not only the hydrologic effects of uh, you know, humans, but also understanding the ecologic effects of, of humans on the, on, the eco on the ecosystems is very important. Um, so th those are the kind of the two things, improving our understanding of the hydrogeology and improving our understanding of the ecologic effects. And uh, sort of another comment, you know, I was, thank you for submitting the presentation beforehand because it gave me the opportunity to sort of go back and forth. And I thought your slides three, four, and five were very helpful in, in sort of giving a three-dimensional view. But I thought it would be helpful if you put like the locations of the well in each of your scenarios onto like your slide three, you know, take away all the extraneous wells, but just identify the relative location of those 15 wells that you were modeling to understand the impact of the flows. And, you know, that's just one slide. Okay. And I, I guess maybe, can you comment on the impact of the increase in salinity to the national park, whether a 0.2% increase at what point is there a red line or even a caution line that we need to be sensitive to, to protect the habitat? Or is no. that somebody else that should comment on that? I, I think you really, first, first of all, it's going to be dependent on the species of concern and the life state, life stage of that species. And I'm certainly not an expert in that area. I understand. No, I, I would, and we'll save, I'll others. save that question sensitivity. But, you know, it, I think identifying the relative locations of the wells that you simulated would be very helpful. And in terms of the coastal confinement groundwater, it was pretty interesting that it went from pure salt water to pure fresh water in a matter of maybe, what, 30 feet, 10 meters or so. Is that because of a cap or is that purely pressure? Well, there are... So as you withdraw water... Yeah, there are... So if you withdraw water, would that impact that captive coastal groundwater system? Um, if you drill through that confined system, if you drill into it, so if you penetrate what the low permeability unit that's kind of confining that groundwater system. If you penetrate that and you don't do anything about it, um, you let the, wa the water's gonna leak out, essentially. Um, and that's actually happened in the past. Uh, but if you, if you do seal it off well and you complete a well within that uh, confined system, um, you, you can withdraw fresh, potentially fresh water from it. Um, I don't know how much you can sustainably withdraw from that system yet. Um, it's going to be dependent on a couple of factors, you know, number of factors, how much actually is flowing through that system um, is, and how permeable those confining units are and how large that, you know, geographically how large that confined system is. So that there are a number of unknowns currently that um, more exploratory wells would definitely help us to resolve. Good, thank you, exciting work. Yeah, um, if, uh, I'll jump in for a couple of questions um, and thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Oki, I, um, you know, it's, uh, there's been a significant history with this particular issue. And I remember, I think it was shortly after just a few months in my first term as a commissioner that the national parks, you know, filed um, for designation. So um, I can see how much data and information we've gathered sort of over time and how much we've learned about these, um, the importance of these, um, you know, 
submarine ground discharge ecosystems. Um, and you know, I, I remember early on there being questions. Some, um, you know, hydrologists were questioning the connectivity between even you know the wells up Mauka and the impacts on the park. And and you know, there was a lot of debate and discussion um, on this. And so I just want to thank you for this important work. And and I remember thinking how needed this was for decision making and um, you know enabling us to do, uh, you know, the best of our abilities as trustees for this area as commissioners. Um, so this, this information is really important. And what you're showing is, you know, clear connectivity. Um, and, and it is amazing how, you know, the linear aspects of it, if, you know, you suggested doubling sort of doubles, you know, the impacts um, and, and those, um, you know, sort of the, the, the lines of flow are, are, are really, really interesting um, for me for considering, um, you know, kind of the management. I was surprised that, you know, sort of maybe <laughs> anecdotally, you might think, you know, just, just Mauka to Makai, but, you know, clearly there's, there's stuff that's moving uh, north, north to south and, and south to north and stuff. So, so I look forward to, to learning more and, and just really note uh, the importance of, of this understanding. And I think um, if I remember correctly, you know, the park's position was, you know, that it had already been impaired and just maintaining the, the status quo was, was really important. Uh, any additional uh, impacts, you know, and, and there would be other impacts there on the species. So I look forward to learning more and more of this conversation, but I just want to say thank you because just a few years ago, <laughs> people were saying there was no, you know, connection. Uh, and, and, you know, now we're, we really understand that there is. So, so thank you for your work. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. Other questions, Mr. Buck? Yes, uh, Dr. Oki, again, I, I'd like to also thank you for your work. Model has lots of variables. Um, can you give us some idea? Uh, obviously, drilling new exploratory wells will help, but, uh, the, the, the contours, especially the contours of those wells that aren't uh, uh, adjacent. Uh, you know, we've learning so, so much. Uh, to me, a big stretch, that's a big stretch of an assumption. But I, I'm just curious, can you give us some idea of your confidence in, in this model? And um, are we going to catch 22? We'll only be able to understand more how accurate it is by actually putting in more exploratory wells? Well, um, I can't give you a number, but what I can say is that uh, we did try to match what we did know about the system. And it does overall a, you know, a reasonable job of matching what we know in terms of the distribution of water levels, how those change from uh, Makai to Mauka. Uh, it does, generally match the salinity that we'd expect in some of these areas, both in map view and in a vertical, in a vertical sense. So with the limited information that we had at hand, the model was generally representative of those conditions. But, um, you know, sometimes when you drill a new well, um, that changes everything. You know, you might find that we were totally wrong in our assumptions or our conceptual understanding. So drilling more wells is the one surefire way of helping us to kind of improve our understanding. Thank you. Sure. Other, other questions, commissioners? So, so Dr. Oki, just in terms of your first, met, your first schematic, is it, is it uh, fair to say that the high level aquifer is feeding both of the, both of the, 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 the shallow one and the deep one along the coastline? Is that the water's coming basically from the cent center of the island and kind of being held under this concept, he held in a high level aquifer um, and feeding out so that, I mean, Kona is a dry area. So this fresh water then would be coming from this higher level aquifer which is coming to the mountains. Right. So I 
based on our, our current understanding, uh, which you know, based both hydro hydrological and geochemical understanding, it appears that water from the high level system is feeding in some, some way, either directly or indirectly, both the coastal freshwater land system and the coastal confined groundwater system. So that water in the inland area has to discharge somewhere and it's discharging to the ocean, either via the coastal confined groundwater system at depth or through the, the coastal freshwater lens, lens system near the water table. Thank you. All right, any other questions, commissioners? All right, that was a terrific presentation. Very interesting, very good work. So thank you uh, very, very much for that. I think um, we have, uh, we're going to move on to B2. We have a bunch of people to let in. So let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and do B2. All right. Thank you. What happens when you put non scientists in charge of making decisions? Uh, aloha, everyone. Um, you know, until you're uh, asked to uh, present testimony or question or commission, if you can turn off your camera and mute your mic um, throughout the presentation. Thank you.
All right, when everyone's back, we will uh, start the meeting again with agenda item B2. Hi, Terry, if you could give Khalil an, an extra couple minutes, thank you. Oh, sorry, he's back. Hold on, Chair. You ready? Uh, just making sure we have um, Mr. Katayama back. Okay. Okay, checking on um, all the commissioners. There we go. I think we have, I think we have everyone. Yes, please go ahead uh, with agenda item B2, B2. All right, Chair. Let me try to see if I can share my screen. I'm just gonna share some maps for clarity and walk through this in the middle. Uh, can everyone see the map? Yes. Okay. Uh, Aloha Kaleo Manuel, Deputy Director with the Commission. Um, Aloha Chair, Commissioners and Community that's uh, here and also watching on YouTube. Um, I'll be doing the presentation today to briefly summarize um, staff submittal item B2. We do have, I think, about 13 testifiers signed up, um, including parties to this matter. So I will try to keep the summary um, very brief. Uh, so that the commission can ask any questions it wants and we can hear from all the parties. So um, just to frame this conversation, uh, in summary, uh, where we're at, uh, we are proposing that the commission uh, approve the well construction permit uh, for the OTA well, well number 8-3957-006 with special conditions that aim to collect more data and information in the next two years uh, that will be used to develop mitigation measures to protect tradition customary practices that may be attached to the pump installation permit when it comes to the commission for future decision making. So that's the context of this submittal. Uh, the well owners are identified here as NELHA and HHFDC. Uh, the landowner of the well site is FHT Kamakana LLC and the driller and or applicant for this permit is Water Resources International Inc. Uh, if the well is uh, developed successfully and productive, NOHA and HHFDC plan to dedicate the well to the Hawaii Department of Water Supply for integration into its system. Uh, so for background, this project started in about 2016 with a legislative CIP appropriation to NOHA for about $2.5 million for an exploratory well. Later, NELHA and HHFDC entered into an MOU uh, and are jointly developing this well at a total estimated cost of about 15 to 20 million. Um, the water from this well will be used to help support NELHA's technology park, as well as to assist with the low income housing projects at HHFDC's Kamakana village. Uh, additional water or whatever water is available in the system or the well uh, will also help to supplement the Hawaii Department of Water Supply System. The well construction application was received in 2018 uh, and a final environmental assessment with an issuance of a finding of no significant impact was published in the November 2018 office, environmental notice with the Office of Environmental Quality Control. Uh, in normal fashion, we route this permit for agency and public review and as part of that process, we received various comments as evident in exhibits two through six. Uh, based on those comments, NELHA requested 
five extensions to address comments. And that time period ranged from January 2019 to about September 2020. Um, and those comments uh, are summarized in the submittal. Uh, this well is located, as shown on the screen, um, in the Keoho Aquifer system area. Uh, the proposed, let me oh, zoom down. Um, as you can see on the map, uh, this is all part of exhibit one in the submittal. Uh, the red triangle is the location of the Ota well. Um, in uh, Dr. Oki's previous presentation, he identified this high level aquifer boundary area. So it is within that high level aquifer area uh, in the Keho region. Uh, the well proposes to use less than 672,000 gallons per day. Uh, the current reported pumpage from the Keoho aquifer system, that's this entire region, uh, its 12 month moving average is about 13 million gallons um, out of the 38 million, ga million gallon sustainable yield. So that's this region here. Um, if there's any questions, feel free commission to stop and um, ask or if there, you need any clarification. So uh, the submittal goes on to highlight the eight alternative actions that this commission asked and directed staff to pursue uh, in light of the denial to designate Keoho Aquifer System Area as a water management area. So this is the first well that we are bringing back to this commission. Um, and so what, we're, the, what I'm gonna do is just quickly go through how those eight actions are being considered respective to this well and this well construction permit. So the first condition uh, was that uh, we refer all well permit applications to Ahamoku and DHHL for review uh, and recommendations uh, to protect traditional customary practices that may be affected. And if affected, special conditions uh, will be suggested, suggested as mitigated actions. Um, based on that outreach to Ahamoku and DHHL, uh, we did receive comments from Ahamoku that identified potential impacts to near shore fisheries uh, gathering practices and even Lavaya. Um, and they recommended that we convene a symposium to a groundwater dependent ecosystem symposium to, to develop more concrete adaptive management and mitigative actions as a follow up to the first symposium that we held. DHHL's comments uh, were really specific to, to uh, getting an allocation from the well to meet the reservation demands. Um, but they provided no comments on the impacts to traditional customary practices. So that's item one of the eight actions. Uh, for item number two, uh, the commission asked that for new private production wells in the four ahupua'a above the park, um, that staff encourage applicants to install a deep monitoring well between the new well and the NPS National Park Service if a monitoring well does not exist. So I'm gonna just bring up this slide and I will leave it on this for the rest of the presentation. Um, all of the blue dots or blue pen, pins are observation wells. The uh, red dot here with a circle around it is the location of the Ota well. And then all of the existing production wells are highlighted in yellow. Yeah, so you'll see this high level well field here. Ota well will become one of those. And then we'll talk a little bit about how these all work together within the recommendations presented to the commission. So for this well, in, it's located in the Lanihau 1, 2, and the Moyao or Puapua'a Ahupua'a, which is south of the four Ahupua'a that were identified in staff, uh, that, that action. So that would include, this is Kiahu Olu Ahupua'a, Kealakehe, Onokohau, Kaloko, yeah, Kaloko, I think that's it. Oh, and Kohanaiki is here. So these are the four Ahupua, one, two, three, four. So this Ota well is outside of that area. Um, and we also, we already have several monitoring wells uh, and two new deep monitoring wells under construction. So the Kaloko monitoring well um, by DWS was completed in November, 2020, uh, and that is, and then we have our Coloco deep monitoring well by Seaworm, which is expect, expected to be completed by June or July this year. Um, so we're not recommending any additional monitoring wells at this time to meet that second condition. 
Um, and we'll go over these wells and these modern wells in a little bit more detail towards the latter part of the presentation. Uh, the third item was to remediate the Keopu deep monitoring well and to construct new uh, Keopu 2 deep monitoring well to explore deep freshwater aquifer, to explore the deep freshwater aquifer that Dr. Opie just presented on. So both of those have been since completed um, and staff continues to collect data from those, those wells. Uh, four, item four was to convert the Kaloko Irrigation Well 1 to a deep monitoring well. Um, that is located here, Kaloko Irrigation Well 1, to a deep monitoring well. Uh, we have, or I've been apprised that there were issues with the landowner. Um, so we were not able to convert that well. And instead we've worked um, at developing the Kaloko Deep Monitoring Well as an alternative. So that's this well here. So it's a, near it, but this is the one that's being constructed now um, on behalf of the commission. Um, number five item was to continue to monitor pumpage, water levels and chlorides through monthly reporting, uh, and also to bring back any delinquent reporters to the commission for sanctions and or enforcement. Um, based on staff's review and our, our monitoring team and our survey team that goes out to collect data from these wells, um, to summarize, there's been stable to slight increases in water level, except for the nearby Como well site, which is right here. Uh, six basal monitoring wells show steady water levels, and re the remediated Keopu well one has shown a thickening of the lens. Um, we're not recommending any enforcement at this time for those uh, report those wells that are not reporting, which are identified in Exhibit 11 but we will be following up with them in formal letters. And just for the commission's understanding, a majority of those wells that aren't reporting are actually unused wells. So they should be reporting zero every month, but they haven't been reporting to us. Um, item six uh, that the commission directed us to follow up on is that if authorized planned use reaches 80% sustainable yield, that we shall conduct or commence with public informational meetings. Uh, the current 12 month, Moving average as of December 2020, again, is about 13 MGD, approximately 34% of sustainable yield. Um, item seven uh, is it, I, it addresses the connection to the Keohu Water Use Development Plan. So, if alternative water sources or future high level sources uh, Kaleo, identified in, in these yellows, yeah. Kaleo. Yep. Uh, sorry, this is Commissioner Beamer. Just Go for it. One, um, one quick question. So, um, you mentioned authorized plan use, um, but I, I think the example you gave us um, is is present usages, which isn't the same thing. So if you can just, yeah. Yeah, so I haven't, um, right now, one of the challenges, right, is the Keoho, the draft Keoho Water Use Development Plan um, hasn't been and approved by the county. Uh, the current authorized plan use, I'd have to get clarification from the planning branch on whether it's reached 80% sustainable yield. Um, as of this time, the there hasn't been any change in authorized plan use from what I understand uh, related to actions taken and what was presented to the commission since 2017. Um, but we can get clarity um, and I'll follow up with staff on that. But yeah, you're correct. The focus is really on current usage. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yep. Mahalo for the question. And, and hopefully we can uh, get some feedback to you before the end of the presentation. Uh, so related to um, kind of that planning horizon and what is proposed um, within the uh, Keoho Water Use, the draft Keoho Water Use Development Plan that the commission seen, uh, it does look at shifting uh, future well sources south, south of this QLT well here. Um, so if these alternative water sources or future high level sources in this southern portion from QLT downward um, do not uh, materialize and the actual rate of withdrawal based on the 12 month moving average reaches 45% of sustainable yield, which is approximately 17.1 MGD, uh, the commission will con commence public hearing, public info meetings. Um, this percentage is one half of the 90% criteria that is used 
or considered in designation and relates to the current well infrastructure that relies on the northern half of the aquifer system area. So the system area in this previous slide, uh, this section is considered the northern por portion of the aquifer system area from QLT well here, downward is the southern. So the Keohoe Water Use Development Plan um, <clears throat> recommends shifting uh, new well development south. Um, currently, that as, as identified, the Ota well is south uh, of this QLT well. So it is, it is consistent with that concept uh, and the policy of shifting south. Um, and then we are waiting for the council to move uh, that water use development plan through its approval processes uh, and get that approved and come back to the commission for final adoption. And then the last item um, of the eight action items uh, was to track the USGS 3D solute transport model efforts uh, and organize briefing when it's done. And so Dr. Oki just presented that information to the commission. Um, we did have conversations with USGS about whether or not uh, we could run this well through a scenario. Um, <clears throat> and, and Dr. Oki could probably present on that or respond to that. But in general, what we were advised is that we could run it, but it would be subject to the limitations uh, of the model as he described. Uh, continuing on, the, the, the submittal goes into quite some depth uh, on, on the comments we received related to this well application. Um, and for brevity and to allow time for all of those that have signed up for testimony to present, um, I will stand on what's written in the sub submittal uh, and if there are any specific questions about those comments received from commissioners, we can try to address those. But we did receive comments from DHHL, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, the National Park Service, um, the Hawaii Department of Water Supply, individuals, Megan Lampson, um, Janice Palmer Glenny. Uh, we received comments from Ahamoku Advisory Council, the Natural Energy Laboratory of Hawaii, NELHA. And yeah, those are those that have submitted testimony. And you've also received additional testimony, written testimony on this item uh, that was forwarded to you as well. And you'll hear from those uh, parties uh, right after this. To continue um, with the submittal and uh, the analysis, uh, it goes into how we review the well construction. Um, and generally the other agencies that provide comments. So Department of Health, Safe Drinking Water and Wastewater Branch submitted their review uh, and comments. DLNR Land Division did so as well and the State Historic Preservation Division. Um, those routine comments are in Exhibit 12. Uh, SHPD or State Historic Preservation Division um, did accept an archeological monitoring plan and data recovery plan for this project, uh, which is identified in Exhibit 12. Uh, this well does meet the standards, uh, the well construction pump installation permit standards that have been approved by the commission, um, subject to the assumptions of encountering water levels at around about 140 um, foot above median, mean sea level in this high level aquifer in Kehoe. Um, and the standard conditions are attached as exhibit 10. Um, as part of those standard conditions, uh, pumps greater than 50 gallons per minute uh, would require pump test. Um, because this is being proposed to be dedicated to a public water system, it would require a constant rate 96 hour pump test um, at the proposed capacity, which is uh, 700 gallons per minute pump and a standard step, drown, step drawdown test at rates below and above that proposed capacity. Um, we also, or the standards also recommend that when the pump test is done, that we use observation wells to test and assess the impacts. Um, and those are in the recommendations as we will highlight as special conditions. Uh, this project has gone through chapter 343 HRS compliance as mentioned earlier. And then the last part of the submittal, um, because of the, uh, our, our, our constitutional obligation, is uh, we go through a Kapa'akai analysis and, and, and try to answer and address the three part questions. And so the first question is really to identify uh, the identity and the scope of valued cultural, historical or natural resources in the petition area, including the extent to which traditional and customary native Hawaiian rights are exercised in the petition area. 
And so um, based on staff's analysis, uh, as well as uh, the documents that have been provided, um, the Ohakipuka database shows no sites or crown lands involved on the well site or in the well site area. Uh, SHIPD has accepted the archaeological monitoring plan and data recovery plan uh, for the well site. Um, Ahamoku Advisory Council has um, submitted testimony um, and identified that uh, most of their uh, traditional and customary practices relate to offshore or near the shoreline um, practices, and that a lot of a lot has changed because of the redevelopment of the um, coastline along Ali'i Drive, and that has potentially impacted spawning areas. Um, their concern is not really the land area where the well site is located, but really just the impacts of water withdrawals on their tradition and customary practices. The cultural impact assessment within the F final environmental assessment concluded that it's unlikely that the proposed project would have any effect on native Hawaiian traditional or customary rights, practices, and beliefs. However, uh, staff notes that the FEA and CIA scope was limited to the well site and it did not identify the cultural, historical, natural resource that traditional and customary practices of native Hawaiians rely on in the area or aqua that could be impacted by the extraction of groundwater from this well, as referenced in the Ahamoku letter. Uh, the second letter, uh, second point is uh, once we identify those, we have to identify the extent to which those resources, uh, including TNC Native Hawaiian rights, will be impacted or affected or impaired by the proposed action. Um, at this point, staff does not anticipate that the pumpage of the well will negatively um, impact any streams. There are no streams in this area. Um, or ocean discharge as more than half of the recharge will continue to ocean um, based on the sustainable yield estimate. However, the groundwater dependent impacts at this current sustainable yield uh, numerically modeled sample scenarios from USGS that was just presented and the connection between high level and basal aquifer areas are still not clear as we learned from symposium one and, and the limitations of the numerical model on the groundwater dependent impacts. The part of groundwater dependent ecosystem impacts. So we the groundwater dependent ecosystem GDE Symposium 2, um, we hope will help to further clarify uh, and determine the extent of TNC practices uh, and then come up with mitigative measures that can protect um, against impacting those. Uh, and the last is again the feasible action. So the GDE Symposium 2 uh, would help to reasonably protect Native Hawaiian rights as we, we hope it will. Um, the standard well construction permit condition number six on all wells uh, will require the driller to stop work immediately should any historic significant uh, remains such as artifacts, barrels, or concentrations of shells or charcoal um, if they're encountered during construction. Um, the well certificate could also reference mitigative actions uh, or outcomes of the GDE symposium to um, and ultimately, if future water use reporting data shows water levels excessively declining, uh, chlorides excessively increasing, uh, or impacts to tradition and customary practices, designation as a water management area is also another feasible action um, under this Kapa'akai analysis. Um, in general, again, to summarize, right now what you have before you is a well construction permit, not the pump installation permit, the well construction permit for the Ulta well. Uh, with recommended special conditions uh, that we as staff and working with the parties um, believe our data, as Dr. Oki kind of mentioned prior, um, to help guide us in developing mitigation measures that could help protect traditional customary practices in this region. Um, and that those, those mitigation measures could be uh, attached at the commission's discretion uh, to the pump installation permit when it comes before the commission for decision making. Uh, so with that said, um, I'm going to read through the recommendation uh, and the special conditions. So the commission, um, the recommendation is that the commission approve the well construction permit to Water Resources International Inc. subject to the standard conditions in Exhibit 10 and the following special conditions. Uh, one. A symposium shall be held to build upon the Commission's 2018 GDE Symposium 1 to further collaborate between traditional and customary practitioners by the Ahamoku Advisory Council, hydrologists, and biologists to formulate an adaptive management plan with mitigative actions. 
uh, there are three subpoints. The GDE Symposium 2 shall be funded by HHFDC under the guidance and subject to the approval of the chairperson. B, the recommended mitigation actions based on the GDE Symposium 2 shall be considered in decision-making by the commission as part of the pump installation permit approval and may be included as special conditions to both the pump installation permit and well certificate. Uh, the GDE Symposium 2 will be primarily focused on gathering information on impacts to traditional and customary practices and resources along the coastline and ocean of Lanihau 1 2, um, Moeao um, Ahupua'a, and how to mitigate those impacts, uh, and the Kohana Iki, Koloko, Honokoha, and Kealake Ahupua'a above the park can also be included um, in that. Mitigation actions should be developed, including possible modifications to estimated sustainable yields. Uh, C, a draft scope of work for the GDE Symposium 2, including participants, facilitator, monitoring plans, proposed mitigative actions, and deadlines shall be submitted to the chairperson for approval no later than August 1st, 2021. Uh, uh, special condition number two is during the standard 96 hour constant rate aquifer and step down draw pump Sorry, I will wait for the ambulance to pass by. Okay, uh, during during the standard 96 hour constant rate aquifer and step down draw, step drown, step draw down pump test, applicant is to provide additional monitoring well data collection during pump test. Uh, specifically, the wells to be monitored and coordinated for water level data collection during the constant rate pump test shall be the high level Como monitoring well, which is here, uh, the Keopu basal monitor, uh, which is here, and three existing NPS Kaho monitoring wells, um, which are one, two, and three, and the deep confined freshwater monitoring well of Keopu to deep monitoring well, which is located a couple 10 feet apparently uh, between are on the same site as this one here. So these wells will be used to uh, during that pump test. Other production wells, um, item B, other production wells to be considered for water level monitoring. Sorry, I will hold. Uh, Keopu 2 deep monitoring well, um, we're going to have to amend that. There is a typo. It should be 3858-002 for the record. Um, that's identified here. 3858-002, um, that was a typo, apologize for that. Um, moving to 2B, uh, other production wells to be considered for water level monitoring during the constant rate tests would be the uh, DWS Keohu QLT well, which is here. Uh, the Keopu well, uh, DWS Keopu well, which is here. The Dowder Coffee number one well, which is here and the HHFDC Kyoku number four well here. So as you can see, those these are the closest uh, production wells near the Ota well, and those will also be monitored during that pump test too. The monitoring shall be subject to well owner and chairperson agreement prior to the pump test occurring. Um, so those are tied to special condition two. Uh, special condition three is that the pump test will be used to evaluate the following impacts based on the pump test coordinated with the Department of Water Supply, USGS, NPS, and Seaworm, uh, subject to the approval of the chair, chairperson. Um, A, we're, we want to look at the impacts uh, to high-level production wells, uh, and those are the production wells that I identified prior in yellow. Um, by identifying and determining what reduction in water levels would be considered unacceptable to these near part production wells. So what impact would this Ota well have on the water levels within these existing production wells adjacent to it? Uh, as well as B, the impacts and connection between the Ota well pump test and the basal portions of the Keoho aquifer system area by monitoring water levels and basal observation wells at the wells that were identified in blue here. Um, that's item B. The last uh, special condition number four is we're requiring a tracer slash isotope study to gather data and assess differences between 
the summer slash winter seasons to assist in determining flow direction of high level water from the Ota well and possibly quantification of the connection between high level and basal water in the proximity to that well. Uh, so similar to Dr. Oki's presentation, which showed kind of some flow of water, we want to understand how this well and water withdrawals or where water flows, does it flow towards the park or straight down or even south? Um, this study shall be funded by HHFDC and NELHA under the guidance and subject to the approval of the chairperson. Um, and B, a draft scope of work for the study shall be submitted to the chairperson for approval no later than August 1st, 2021. Uh, and lastly, special condition number five is that Seaworm staff, Ahamoku, HHFDC, NELHA, DHHL, NPS, and the Department of Water Supply uh, shall meet quarterly on the bulleted proposed mitigation measures recommended by the National Park Service uh, to evaluate alternative sources and pumping regimes and, to, and for the planning and implementation of GDE symposium number two. Um, if the commission wouldn't mind, I'd also like to recommend adding a special condition six, which is that this permit is also subject to SHPTI archeological monitoring plan and monitoring procedures because we did receive substantive comments from them as part of this applicant application review. So with that, uh, that is the end of staff's presentation. So if there are any questions, um, we're open. I also have Roy Hardy here, who's the head of our groundwater regulation branch to answer more of the technical questions. Um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation, uh, Kaleo. Um, uh, questions, commissioners? Sorry, do you want me to stop sharing screen at this you time? Know, why don't, why don't we? Why don't we um, uh, leave the screen up for a little bit, just in, in case questions deal with the the map itself? So, uh, commissioners, do you have questions at this point? We do have uh, t public testimony um, that we'll hear, but I, I'm going to see if you have any questions uh, of staff for starters. Um, no, I, I think I'll wait for to hear from the testimony and this is a, <laughs> this is a somewhat complicated, um, submittal. Um, so I appreciate you sharing. I think the biggest concern, <laughs> the biggest concern I have right now is, um, you know, authorized plan use was, wasn't listed in our submittal at all. So, um, hopefully we can get clarification on that. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, commissioners? Chair, I have a question. Uh, Commissioner Hannes, uh, uh, Kaleo, uh, number one, very good presentation of a really complex set of issues. So thank you very much for that. And uh, for Roy and the team's work on this. With follow-up to Commissioner Beamer's point, uh, referring back to page five in that planned use, <clears throat> excuse me. There's a couple of points made in, uh, with regard to condition number six. Number one, that the current uh, uh, yield, uh, the current production is 34% of sustainable yield, but that was as of December, 2020. Now would that, that usage been su significantly be, uh, leave, uh, reduced by the pandemic and the reduction of tourism and, and other kinds of activity in the region? Uh, Roy, do you want to address that? If there's been any reduction in the 12 month moving average based on the pandemic? Um, I can yeah. check that real quick. Um, I don't recall anything significant though. Um, and, you know, the major users of the Department of Water Supply, they may have the, the answer for you uh, quicker than I, but if you just give me a second, I can go take a look. The, the second question, uh, while Roy is looking at that, is Kiahu Olu. Uh, I believe that's in kind of an early stage of develop redevelopment, is it not? And there's going to be substantial growth uh, that's going to be uh, uh, supplied by that production well eventually. So the numbers aren't there now, but this is where where Dr. Beamer's point comes in. I mean, it's it's isn't it an approved plan? And so if we're already 
allowed a production well that's going to meet the needs of that plan, shouldn't we kind of extrapolate out what those needs are and just kind of factor that in, see where that takes us against uh, the 80% limit of sustainable yield? Uh, Commissioner Hannes, I will have to double check if it if they have received authorized plan use entitlements from this is QLT's proposed development right, right within the Kiahu Olu Ahupua, right. um, and whether it's been calculated uh, against authorized plan use. Um, Roy, do you know if they currently are utilizing that well um, and how much water is being produced in the in that specific well? Um, yeah, I believe they, they are using it, how um, much that I can check too. Um, I did check for the, you know, entire aquifer pumpage and it's still, there wasn't really um, much significant change. There's a slight downturn, but given the historical, it's, it's, it's pretty much the same. You don't see a COVID effect, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Right. Um, but I can look up the QLT real quick um, as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, other questions, commissioners? Hello, I, I have a question real quick, or, or just a, 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 a request that you um, just remind us all about the difference between the sustainable yield measurements here and sort of public trust impact on ecosystem resources. Because I, I, I recall from the discussion we had in the, in the designation proposal that those are two entirely different concepts. Chair, I'll try to address, I'll try to respond to that. Um, and Roy can add to the conversation as well. Um, the sustainable yield is, is, has been developed out of our RAM model, right? That takes into consider recharge and percentage of recharge. Um, you know, similar, what we highlight in our water resource protection plan is that sustainable yield um, wasn't calculated to um, look at protecting you know, traditional customary practices or groundwater dependent ecosystems. Uh, that was a statement that was made, a policy statement that was made in the Water Resource Protection Plan. And so while we have the sustainable yield that allows and accounts for about uh, as a little over 50% of water to remain in the aquifer, um, the logic is that it would flow and discharge into the coast. But as Dr. Oki highlighted, um, it's a definitely a complicated situation um, in this specific region. Uh, and so the impact or how that sustainable yield number um, is utilized to protect tradition customary practices and whether or not that um, assumption on the, that a little bit over 50% uh, water discharging is sufficient to protect GDE um, could benefit from additional data information. I, I don't know if that answers your entire question, but. Yeah, that's, that's good for now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. That's a good question. And, and Mr. Hannes, your, your question uh, observations were, were helpful as well. Um, I have a, a question for Roy. Um, it, it's, uh, it's a little vague, but uh, uh, Roy, once this well has been in full operation for a year, do you, is, what do you think the chances are there will be uh, negative impact on the productivity of, of neighboring wells uh, in the area. Um, and uh, I guess as a corollary to that, uh, uh, does it make any sense to consider a conditional uh, permit uh, based upon uh, a look-see at, uh, at salinity and production rates and, and other impacts of the well a uh, year down the road, something like that? Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for that question. That's uh, looking into the future and crystal balling what it might happen. Um, this well, if it behaves like the other wells in the high level, um, assuming that um, there should be some uh, production and some good, uh, very high quality water uh, of chlorides, um, and the chlorides should be pretty steady, which is typical of high level water. Now, one thing, if people were considering it, you could use the model to to predict. I think there'd have to be some modification, but you can ask uh, um, Dr. Oki about that um, if you'd like. Um, uh, another um, uh, answer to uh, Commissioner Hannes's question about QLT, uh, I did take a look and actually there, there seems to be a COVID effect 
on that particular well. The, the production uh, significantly dropped off in, in the last year. Um, you know why? I don't know. That's probably something again for um, Department of Water Supply to answer. But there, there was a decrease in the amount of water pumped from that well. Thank you. And are they entitled for their future development? Roy? Pardon? Pardon? Do, do, do they have they received entitlement approval for, for their future development? Um, I don't know. I don't know. You'd have to ask the Department of Water Supply. Sure, we might add that to the list to, to inquire because it's a pretty substantial plan as I understand it. Yeah, I think building off of Commissioner um, Hannes' comments here, uh, yeah, yeah, right. I think um, it's really imperative. I mean, it's in our very, our own conditions that we designed, um, and it says specifically authorized plan use. But I, but I don't see you reporting on that. Um, so hold on one second. So just you know, <clears throat> not only for this submittal, but for future submittals, I, I'd, I'd like to get updated and make sure that we're paying attention to that. Okay, other questions uh, before we move to public testimony? All right, um, we, we'll come back to commissioner questions after public testimony, but let's, I'm gonna stop sharing, there we go. Um, all right, I'm, I'm just gonna go through this list in order uh, that I have it uh, here. So first up, for testimony is, um, and again, please try to limit your, your we have a lot of people testifying. So please, please try to be efficient in your testimony, but, um, and, and try not to do more than three minutes. Um, but first up is Dean Minakami, HHFDC. Uh, good morning, Chair Case and Commission members. I'm Dean Minakami, the Development Branch Chief for HHFDC. We stand on our written testimony supporting O2L and the staff's recommendations, and we wish to extend our appreciation to Deputy Director Manuel and the staff for bringing the parties together to address the concerns relating to O2L's development. And I'll be available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Buck? Uh, yes, uh, 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 Mr. Minakami, what's the nature of your funding source and, and, and how much between the 2.5 million CIP and the projected 15 to 20 million to, to build this well is, is coming from HHFTC? Uh, HHFTC and NELHA have a cost sharing agreement for the well. We basically will um, share the cost of development and each receive a pro rata share of the water um, that is authorized from the well. So basically it's, it depends on how much funding now has available. Uh, we will be using our dwelling unit revolving funds to pay our share of the well. Thank you. Any, any other questions? Okay, th thank you, Mr. Minakami. Next up is Keith Okamoto, uh, Hawaii Department of Water Supply. I don't unavailable uh, chair. I don't see him. Okay. Next up is John Brower. Broward. Well, I chair Casey, members of the commission. Uh, mahalo for this opportunity to provide the comments of Coloco Honoko Hal National Historic Park to you today. <clears throat> yeah, my name is John Broward and I'm the superintendent of Coloco Honoko Hal National Historic Park as well as Honanao National Historic Park. We are very grateful to Chair Case, Deputy Director Manuel, and other interested parties for the discussions related to the Ota Well. Because we received the staff submittal on April 15th, our review has been limited. For the record, we disagree with some of the analysis of the three proposed conditions Coloco Honoko National Historic Park requested be attached to both the well construction and pump installation permits. We also have comments on the proposed recommended action number one on page 15 of the submittal. Our comment is taken from our March 23rd, 2021 letter, which is included as part of exhibit three. 
As stated there, the National Park Service maintains that the proposed NPS special conditions should be enforceable in terms of both the well construction and pump installation permits for the OTA well. If the sea worm does not include NPS special conditions, the sea worm shall hold a hearing as required under HRS 174C-9 and HRS 91-9 to determine if the pump installation permit and well certificate should be issued and if so, under what conditions, end of quote. Based on that letter and the staff submittal, we do not wish to ask for a contested case hearing for the well construction permit. However, we would like to reserve the right to a contested case hearing related to approval of the pump installation permit and well certificate. We believe that can be done if the recommended conditions, one uh, point B point, has an additional first sentence added to read something to the effect as follows. The commission chair, deputy or staff shall not administratively approve the pump installation permits for the Ota well, but shall consider approval of the permit with special conditions only at a regular meeting of the commission. We believe that may be the intent of the condition, but here we are seeking clear language in that regard as an assurance for us. Again, we are very grateful to Chair Case, Deputy Director Manuel, and all the interested parties for having participated in discussions related to this agenda item. We appreciate the spirit of cooperation and everyone's consideration of our position. Protecting the water dependent ecosystems in the park is a public trust we take very seriously. Therefore, we will continue to collaborate, collaborate with interested parties. In the meantime, we have members of our staff available here today to answer any technical questions related to the freshwater needs of park ecosystems. Those would include uh, Jeff Zipfer, who's our environmental protection specialist here at Coloco Honoko Howe, Steve Rice, who's a hydro hydrologist at the Denver uh, Water Resources Division of the National Park Service, Peter Fami, who's a policy analyst uh, with the same division, uh, and Malia Kamehale, who's uh, is, uh, in our Honolulu office. Uh, and then just again, mahalo for your consideration. Hey, uh, thank you. Uh, let me just address the contested case um, discussion you just had. Um, and my AG can say if I'm doing this wrong, but uh, I'm, I'm taking that as not a present request for contested case hearing. Therefore, we will continue the discussion. Um, I know what you, the way you said it was, if there is a, a modification to the um, submittal saying that the, a follow-on, so we're separating the, um, the, the, the drilling of the well from authorization of pumpage and use. And what you're saying is that it's, um, uh, you want assurances that the second part of this would come back to the commission. And I can say that that is our intention. And so if any of the other commissions, commissioners doesn't feel that that's the case, um, you know, please speak up now. But, um, but that, that is certainly from my point of view, the intention here is to bring the second part of it to keep it before the commission in a sunshine manner. So Based on that, we'll, uh, without any objection from you, we will continue with this discussion on this submittal. All right. My AG is not correcting me otherwise, so. All right, so um, we do have uh, the other people signed up for, to testify and I'll, I'll just ask quickly, do they wanna add anything? So Steve Rice was next from the National Park Service or Peter Fami or Jeff Zimper. Nothing from Peter Fami. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair Case. Nothing from me unless there were questions from the commission. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, the next up then is uh, Neil Desai, National Parks Conservation Association. Okay, good morning, Chair Case members of the commission. My name is Neil Desai representing the National Parks Conservation Association. 
as our Pacific Region Senior Program Director. Uh, we were formed in 1919 as an independent advocacy organization for national parks and public lands, um, separate from the federal government. We testified in support of the WMA petition, as some of you may recall. Uh, we highlighted the strong scientific evidence showing we have a major problem on our hands right now with the water quality and quantity that is threatening the traditional and customary practices the commission is required to protect. And we are even more concerned today than we were years ago. Our members throughout the island, state, and country strongly support the specific mission at Koloko Honokohau to protect traditional and customary practices. Now, when the commission denied the petition, it wrote that well applications will come back to the commission for decision making if there is a disagreement on special conditions. And there is a strong disagreement on the special conditions for this specific matter. But staff bifurcated the application, as we've been discussing, from uh, separating the construction and the pumping, raising concerns for us. And um, I think like the prior speaker, we do not see anything in writing, including special condition 1B, that makes clear the pumping permit will absolutely come back to the commission for decision making. I, I appreciate the intention uh, of the chair that, that she shared that she intends this would come back. Um, but we would like to see this in writing, so we are not basing our decision making in the future on the intention of individuals that may or may not be around um, on this commission um, or, or things that are not in writing. So we hope that's a simple fix. Um, we are asking the commission to affirm that commitment um, and its intention with the written statement um, specifying this will be coming back. Um, I also uh, request an important, uh, I guess, procedural clarification from, from Chair Case on how the commission will um, check today at this meeting, um, check with the meeting participants if there are any parties who wish to verbally request a contested case hearing, depending on what exactly the decision is. So to be clear, I'm not requesting something, anything right now. I just wanna know uh, on Zoom, you know, I don't know if we'll get kicked off right after we testify, but um, uh, how will members be allowed to um, uh, uh, weigh in if they would like to um, following a decision, but prior to the close of the hearing. Um, we also have uh, significant concerns with the staff's analysis. Um, for example, uh, while, while staff and many of us here know very well, it could take years to decades for the impacts of groundwater pumping to impact park or coastal resources. The report states that a mere 96 hour monitoring test is able to monitor the impacts on the basal lens. And, and that just, doesn't make sense. Um, I think lastly, I would say, you know, I, 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 let's all admit that, you know, what we're doing here is, is commercial development. And, and let's have an honest discussion about that. When we were looking at this, we were happy to see that the staff report conceded that the water was, quote, originally to be shared between Nelha and low income housing. But from what we've gathered, the record now shows that at most one fourth, a quarter, will go to affordable housing, which uh, the developers um, allow to be 140% of median income. Um, so um, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to, um, to, to testify, to hear from all of you, to hear from others to, that will be speaking uh, and to reiterate our um, request and your consideration of that. Um, to put a simple statement in writing um, uh, that this will be coming back. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, just to address your comment, I did read the contested case statement at the beginning of the meeting. If anyone wants to ask for a contested case um, on this matter, they can do so at any time, but it has to be at least by the end of this meeting and then followed up in writing within 10 days. Okay, thank you. Next up is, and, and I apologize for not putting you first, but uh, Greg Barber. Sorry, sorry, Chair. Sorry, Chair. Can I just ask one thing? Um, yeah, but I think the question was if they get kicked off of Zoom, how do they do it? Um, I, I think I think that was a specific question. So certainly they have that right, but I'm they can I, log I, I'm not clear. Yeah, they can they log can go back in. I, I don't know how it works. So log back in. Okay. Um, okay. Next up is Greg Barber, uh, who is uh, from Nelha, who is the applicant, and I guess I I, I should have heard from Nelha first as the applicant. 
Greg Barber. Thank you, uh, Chair Case and members of the commission. Uh, I'm gonna be brief. We just strongly support the staff recommendation for the uh, for us to move ahead with the exploratory well. At this time, we've been working on this project for over six years. I think we've been very patient. We've tried to do everything proper and in conformance with the rules and regulations. And lastly, I just want to uh, thank uh, the commission staff, Kaleo, for uh, really getting everybody together to talk story. And uh, hopefully, we can create some uh, good, clean, green. Uh, renewable energy jobs and technology jobs and uh, affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. And we also have Alexander Le Leonard from Naha. Anything to add? Yeah, sorry. I, I didn't introduce Dr. Leonard is here with me. He's our chief projects officer. I'll Jace for that. Doctor. Okay. I'm here to answer questions if there are any. Thank you very much. All right. Any questions, commissioners? Thank you. Um, all right, next up is Lemana Damate. Aloha Chair. Thank you very much for the opportunity to give comments. Um, Ahamoku stands on its written testimony as submitted. We support the Sea Worms um, uh, recommendations and would stand by to answer any questions if needed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, right next up. Can I ask a question? Uh, go oh, ahead. sorry. Sorry, Lemana, this is Kamana. Yes. Aloha. 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 Um, so I just trying to be clear because I, I thought I also read in your testimony there would be adverse traditional and customary effects, Makai in this particular Ahupua'a, and some of the families had concerns with that. Yes, they did. We actually did meet specifically with the generational families of the Lanihau area. And their concerns are kind of, um, we met in person with Roy Hardy recently on April 10th when those concerns were brought forward. It was basically not understanding what the impact of the Kamakana village was going to be on the withdrawal of the well. But according to staff's uh, recommendations and their studies, at least 50% of the aquifer is going to continue to flush out into the ocean. That will sustain the current practices. They were especially anxious to hold the symposium too, because along with um, working with the practitioners from the Lanihau, we actually did talk to many of the practitioners within the Keho aquifer. And those concerns would also be brought up at the symposium, where specific practices, which were not actually related, um, will be uh, shared. They weren't anxious to do it publicly yet, but they are willing to come into it um, during the symposium too. Does that answer the questions? I, I think sort of, in some ways it relates to this authorized plan use conversation. Um, and then- Exactly. And I, and I and I respect your work so much, and you know I I, I want to applaud the Ahamoku and you know working with community and um, you know building well our community capacity is there, but you know I think better networking with our traditional customary practitioners and, and experts of our resources. Um, I guess it's just it, it seems a little bit. I'm I'm trying to struggle with um, the community saying that they're concerned and and you saying their concerns aren't really valid because they're a little bit misunderstood. And no, is, that, concerns, is that sound no. fair or, yeah? Their no? concerns are very valid. You know, they are, which is why Roy actually went to meet with them to answer whatever technical questions there were. Um, the practices still continue, specifically off the Lenny House. And that is based on the freshwater discharge that impacts the, um, the different fellow runs and where the fishing qua are out there. Those have not been identified specifically for public yet, with the fear that if it is, um, it's probably going to be 
I don't want to use the word rape, but it, you know, others will, will start impacting the subsistence fishing in those specific cores right off the line. So their uh, concerns were kind of mitigated when they realized that the water from the higher, from the ultra well, higher monitor wells um, are still, sufficient water is still going out right now and in the near future where the practices will not be impacted. And based on that, they support the recommendations of the, um, the condition, actually the conditions of the application. Okay, okay. Well, thank you. And again, mahalo for all your work. I really enjoyed the day oh. we spent out, um, you know, in, in Koloko together and, and yes. walking around and seeing, seeing the resources. So mahalo. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have two other people signed up for Ahamoku, but they don't seem to be in the room. Kavai Kapua, Kalani Hewitt, and Rocky Kalahiva. Uh, let me know if you are in the room. Um, next up is Jermo Kanuha. Uh, Chair, Jerome Kanuha is the sp spokesperson for the Kanuha Ohana for mm -hmm. Lanihau. And unfortunately, he had to have emergency surgery last night, so he's not able to testify today. Okay. Uh, I did check with him, he is recovering and he will be available in the near future. Okay, thank you. I also don't see uh, Charles Young who signed up. So the next up would be uh, Ruth Loke Alua Kue Ola Kawai. Aloha, I just wanna make sure folks can hear me. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, so my name is Ruth Loke Aloha. Uh, I'm speaking on behalf of myself and also on behalf of Hui Olakavai. And it's a group of community members, a uh, small handful of us who have an interest in the groundwater resources and the life that these waters uh, provide our practices, uh, feed our life ways, our lifestyles. Uh, before I move forward to, I also want to mention that Native Point Legal Court, uh, Ashley Aubrey will be speaking also uh, on behalf of our Hui. And now I can finally get into my testimony. Uh, thank you to the commission for uh, for accepting my request to speak today. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the mana'o that's being shared in this circle. I'm learning a lot. Uh, and I still have a lot of questions. Um, and thank you to uh, USGS uh, uh, Dawin Oki for his presentation, which was uh, so, so, so essential. I just remember, you know, I was thinking, man, I remember going to a whole Department of Water Supply meetings and telling them, hey, the water runs from mountain to ocean. And they was telling me no. And that was just like two years ago. And then now today to see this, I mean, wow, everything changed in two years, just through a USGS study. It's like really refreshing. Um, so, you know, before I begin, I just have to state my interest in the water. Um, I'm a Kama'aina of Kona. My grandma's family, we come from Kona. We're genealogically connected to these lands, uh, to this district. Um, I just in lower economic class, Kanaka just trying to make it. I don't have any benefit here. I actually take off from my work day. These meetings is like, I, now I gotta make up like four hours of my work day. So these meetings are like just really hard. I'm at Iloko, at Koloko Fish Pond. And the reason why this is so teary is because like, my family comes from Kono. My grandfather's family has connection to this local ER. As, as people who care for this local ER. A descendant of the advisory commission that helped to establish Koloko Honokohao National Historical Park. A lot of those people, those kupuna, those hard hitting kupuna, have, they have passed away. Some of them are re remain with us today. And back in the 1970s or 80s, these kupuna has said, hey, makala, watch the water, you guys, watch the water. Watch the water, right? So back in the 70s, they said this, and they, you know, they predicted this, they predicted this region gonna be developed. In the 70s, they're already seeing this happening. And so most of them have passed, still get some today. And now here I am after these kupuna come. And so really what they did was for me and what I'm doing today is, is not really for me, it's already for the next generation because my the impacts that I see, I'm gonna continue to see, but my nephew guys, they're the ones that are gonna be impacted by whatever we decide here and for other kupuna water matters. So I'm a practitioner. I don't really like that term, but that's the term Westerners give us so we can fit categorically, we, we're more uh, conceivable and easy to be managed. Um, but I'm a kia iloko. Kia iloko, what is my kuleana? My kuleana is to make sure that the loko ia has a voice. My kuleana is to make sure that the ia have a voice. 
that the Limu have a voice in these discussions. And, and in all honesty, I don't really feel like our Ita have a voice. I don't feel like local have a voice in this place. Um, and, and really, if I just like, I look at the handout, I, I, I read over the EA, I'm reading over these things, like traditional customary practices are rarely, rarely discussed. If not, they only mention, they only mention in the end. And, and I want to mahalo Ahamoku and, and Kaleo and others for reaching out, you know, like it's work, it's work to get to the Kama'aino because everybody's so busy, but it's still, when it's still not quite there, we haven't done enough. Um, and, and just like overarching, I think like my takeaway is the timeline is unrealistic. And this is another attempt to facilitate development. And, and that's not me saying no take no water. I'm just saying like the timeline is unrealistic. And for somebody who says realistic, it's unrealistic. Uh, if you're saying in five months, we'll get all these mitigated plans and we will bust this project in two years. I, th I think if Delwin's project, his, his like really informative study probably took several years to, to conduct. And here we say, no, no, but we're going to find all the mitigated measures by the time we're going, we're going to allow this permit for, for the, the pumping of this actual well to happen. So what are my concerns? I just try to keep it really short. My ultimate concern is, is this water for the next generation and to ensure that the practices can still exist for my nephew folks, for our Hui members and for our Hui Kiki uh, and our youngest member isn't even one yet. So I, I go and ask you guys, like, you guys can make sure that as commissioners, this decision and the following decisions will get water for my nephew guys for be remain kiai local. I, I don't know. I, I, I can't admit, I just don't, I just don't practitioner. I just don't come I know. I really ask you guys like, is, is that, is that possible? You, every decision you guys make, is it, is it known? Is it known? You know, I really, I really want to know that. And I just want to know the honest truth of what's the unknowns. Cause I feel like there's a lot of, there's a lot of stretching of truths in this space. And I just want to know like, how much do we actually know? And, and what are we actually trying to advance and why? And so I'm concerned about groundwater dependent ecosystems. I'm really thankful for um, the monitoring wells and these suggestions and these studies, because they do give us a, a, a look at something that we all can't see. And it gives us access to understand the geologic formations and how they're, they're facilitating water movement underground. However, what we're still missing from these discussions is how these withdrawals are affecting groundwater Okay, we have a momentary freeze here. Let's see if her um, internet comes back. Okay, uh, I think we will go on. I think she was about to wrap up, but if she has to reboot and come back in, uh, we can come back to that. Um, Next up, then, is Kim Crawford Salinas. Please go ahead, Aloha. Ms. Crawford. Yeah. Aloha, Chair and Commission. My name is Kimberly Crawford. I'm 28 years old. Um, I am born and raised in the Ahupua of Kalawa. Um, we're in the same home. I now raise my two children, my girls, eight and two. Um, I'm testifying today on behalf of myself, my ohana, and hui ola kawai. Um, and forthcoming to my testimony, I believe Ashley O'Bray from Native Hawaiian Legal Corp will be coming on as well, um, representing hui ola kawai. Um, today, I am testifying with the request of the commission to deny the Ota Well construction permit, agenda item B2, on the premise that I am greatly concerned for the continued health and welfare around the groundwater dependent ecosystems in all of the Keho aquifer, um, including but not limited to Koloko Loko Ia. Um, in 2015, I was blessed enough to reconnect with Loke on the Mauna um, when me and my Kane were young parents, um, still children ourselves. And when we got to go down to Koloko, um, we got to give our family a sense of consistency, um, motivation, um, something to, to connect with. Um, and we got to create our own family uh, with the Hui and um, we got to feel the reciprocal love from Aina um, because when you love Aina, Aina remembers to love itself and then it remembers to love you. Um, so if there's any damage to happen, to continue to happen to Kaloko, it will, directly affect um, myself and my ohana and our future generations. Um, at Kaloko, we have been working on the restoration of um, 
the whole entire fish pond. And um, we started with removing invasive species. Um, and when we did that, the native seed bed came back. When we removed the invasive species, we've opened up the springs. Um, we've gotten to, uh, we're working on fish survey studies right now. We're working on rebuilding the rock walls inside the fish pond because we've been fortunate enough to have Benson and Kendall who've really held down the cool paw for us, the foundation of the local. Um, and we've also gotten to do water, water quality studies. And that's been something that I've personally been, um, that I've personally done and I'm really am interested in. Um, and so I just wanted to share, shed a little bit of a light on some things that I've seen doing the water quality studies. Um, I got to do a 30 day study. So I've gotten to see um, the, the springs that all of um, And when, when I was doing that, we have um, some points inside the fish pond that we were consistently studying every day. Um, but there's specifically some points in the Ki'opua, which is the nursery ponds. Um, and those should be uh, fresh enough to sustain the life of the pua'ama, the, the mullet, the ava, the milkfish, and the aholehole, as well as the damselflies and all of the, the native um, plants and animals. Um, and when I was doing those tests, we were consistently seeing um, salinity above the threshold for those animals to um, thrive and survive. Um, I think, you know, I don't wanna uh, lie, but the, the ama ama really enjoy um, around 13 parts per thousand to 17 parts per thousand. And when we're talking about salinity, um, zero is completely fresh water and 35 is salt water. And so they really like that middle ground, but leaning more towards fresh water. And so when I did my water quality monitoring in those areas, we were consistently getting numbers above that threshold, 19, 20, 23. Um, and very rarely were we getting anything within those thresholds. And that tells me that we are already at the danger level um, and that we really need to make some smart decisions moving forward so that we don't impact these environments any more greatly than we already have. Um, like Loke was saying, um, we, we, I will continue to do this work even if I know that it's gonna be a continued degrading system, but I don't want to set my kids up for failure. I wanna do everything that I can to make sure that they still have this life vessel to connect onto um, when, they're, when they're older and our age. Um, so I just wanted to, um, share that we are already at a point of, of, of severe um, action that needs to be taken. And um, I believe that any more continued wells without the checks and balances um, will continue to harm these resources. Um, mahalo, Chair and Commission. Thank you. Um, I think Ms. Alua is back in. Uh, I, know, I know you froze up towards the end of your testimony there, Ms. Alua. Did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I sorry. I just, uh, I'm going to keep my video off because I think my Wi-Fi is uh, messing up. And so, you know, really, I just want to emphasize, like, I really want to ask the commission, please, what Kimmy's saying is in the checks and balances and trying to ensure that our current strap, trying to understand what is the impact to groundwater dependent ecosystems actually and being able to quantify it collectively and agree to the terms and conditions uh, and then also too I noticed in the submittal for recommendations it suggests Kwanaiki, Koloko, Honokohau and Kialake Ahupua'a can be included um, in symposiums regarding Lanihau and Moyao uh, which, I'm, which I'm very supportive of but if, if that language can be reframed to will be included um, because I think in Delwin's study it shows that the bandwidth of impacts of withdrawing freshwater resources uphill uh, can vary along the coastal resources so the need to really have a regional approach to our water planning present and future is going to really help shape um, uh, water for future generations. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next up is Ashley Obrey, Native Hawaiian Legal Corp. Um, mahalo Chair, Mahalo Commissioners. Um, aloha kako, my name is Ashley Obrey. I'm a staff attorney at the Native Hawaiian Legal Corporation representing Hui Ola Kavai. 
Um, I'm also a resident of Holualoa Kona. Um, we're here, you know, today to ensure proper decision making. And we think approving this permit today without first independently identifying all Native Hawaiian traditional and customary practices that might be affected without acknowledging the potential for other impacts on our public trust resources and without ensuring proper planning for our aquifer and community really is putting the cart before the horse, as the, the courts have said, and ultimately putting the resource at risk. And so we are approved to the, uh, um, opposed to the approval of this permit today. Um, first, there's some concerns just about the bifurcation of these permits, you know, whether or not legally permissible. The practical effect of approving this well construction permit in the absence of affirmatively reviewing impacts from the pump installation permit necessarily means that there's key information that's not before you. Um, as we know, the Water Commission is charged with taking the initiative in considering, protecting, advancing public rights and the resource at every stage of this planning process. And so it's important to really think realistically, if we treat this current permit as ministerial and separate from the pump installation permit, we're essentially creating kind of what amounts to a vested right. And what I mean by that is after millions of dollars are spent developing this well, when the pump installation comes back for decision making, um, the odds of there being real consideration of these impacts go down and saying no to NELHA and HHFDC is just simply not as, an, a reality or as easy of a reality. And as the commission, it's really not a situation you wanna be put in having to say no to a project that's been substantially completed. And so right now is an opportunity to address these concerns before money is committed and other opportunities are foreclosed. A few points I'd like to make. Um, Number one, um, the Kapa'akai burden has not quite been met. In Kapa'akai Oka'aina versus Land Use Commission, the Supreme Court concluded that Article 12, Section 7 of our Constitution places an affirmative duty on the state and its agencies to preserve and protect traditional and customary practices. And this requires an independent determination as to the identity and scope of these resources at stake and the Native Hawaiian traditional practices associated. Um, the extent to which they'll be affected and the feasible action to protect these rights. And the court explicitly stated that state agencies may not act without independently considering the effect of their actions on Hawaiian traditions and practices. There has been no independent analysis by the quorum here of traditional and customary practices on and around the coast. Although the commission has been tasked with reaching out to Ahamoku and, and um, getting their recommendation to protect traditional and customary practices, that in and of itself does not fulfill its kuleana to um, independently investigate. And I think this failure to address the first step of Kapa'akai is actually highlighted by this suggested mitigation condition of Symposium 2, um, to, which focuses on gathering information on impacts to traditional and customary practices. So clearly these practices have not yet been identified. Uh, and you cannot postpone this critical initial step until you know, down the road after you've appro approved this permit. And I think even if we could move forward with Ahamoku's findings, um, they themselves note that there are practices along the shoreline that have yet to be identified. And also Huiola Kavai's members were never consulted, even though their members have been testifying on water issues in this aquifer for years now. And I think Loke was only brought in a few weeks ago to sit in on some presentation talking about conditions and mitigation, which for the most part had already been formulated. Um, the potential for impacts on the shoreline are also being overshadowed by some assumptions. I read the submittal and it seems there's different conceptual models in different places that are prioritizing pumping over protection. Some places I see that all water is, is looked at as a single basal aquifer and that pumping and recharge is evenly distributed. And elsewhere, I see an assertion that the aquifer is you know, separate compartments with limited or no connectivity. And then we have different statements about whether the ahu, ahupua'a boundaries mean anything in terms of connectivity. But I think despite these assumptions and assertions, we know that there's evidence that there could be impacts to the shoreline. And in fact, Dr. Oki today explicitly stated that there's a degree of interconnection amongst the three types of groundwater occurrences. And he also noted the need to improve our understanding of both the hydrology and effects on groundwater dependent ecosystems. So this possibility is enough um, under the precautionary principle. Pursuant to this principle, the Hawaii Supreme Court rejected that scientific certainty is a necessity because it's, it's this idea of being, not wanting to be reactive, but to be proactive and preventative. 
Uh, and so it's not enough to say that the evidence is unclear and so we can just move forward today. Uh, I also think it's a little troubling. We've essentially moved to discussing mitigation when we have not clearly acknowledged, let alone identified all potential impacts. It's hard to mitigate for things when you don't know what you're mitigating exactly. And I think one other thing to consider before making any decision is that that current version of the water use development plan, which is cited by the submittal, has not yet been approved by the county council. And when this version of the water use development plan came before the council back in 2017, they asked for DWS to go back and, and talk to the community and look at traditional practices. And this hasn't been done. The plan hasn't been updated, but you know it's being cited for the purpose of allowing pumping here. So ultimately a decision on Ota Well sets the tone for all future groundwater management here in North Kona. And I just you know, want to know if the commission is going to allow for development at all costs, putting coastal resources and traditional and customary practices at risk, or whether you're willing to promote reasoned decision-making in keeping with your kuleana over water management in Hawaii. At this point, you simply do not have the information necessary to approve this permit while upholding your duties as the trustees of this public trust resource. Um, we are inclined actually to ask for a contested case, but that unfortunately puts the burden on Loke and Kim and Huiola Kavai, which is in violation of Kapa'akai. So we would like to give the opportunity for the commission to deny this permit pending further investigation and then reserve the right to request orally. And if we do ask, then we would ask that the vote be vacated. But that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Buck. You're on mute. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, do you have any specific suggestions as a condition to deal with the bifurcation of a approval of this well construction permit to an eventual a potential approval of the deduction well uh, uh, permit. Do you have any suggested language you'd like to add? Um, you know, I think I think the issue for me, or for uh, in terms of representation of the Hui, I think it's it's doing this permit without all the information. I think, I mean, whether or not it's bifurcated is, you know, maybe up to you folks as how you want to deal with each step in the process. But ultimately, the information should just be in front of you from the outset, because it, otherwise, it's almost like piecemealing. And we're just going to roll forward into all these, these decisions that may not have any real consideration of impacts. So I don't know that I have specific conditions I can recommend, except that I think more due diligence needs to be done and this can be tabled and this can, you can come back to it with a more complete record um, that would really be able to address all the concerns that have come you know, through my testimony and through others before me. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, okay, uh, next up is Jonathan Likeke Scheuer. Hello, my kako. Um, my name is Jonathan Lee K.K. Shoyer. My testimony today is offered as an individual, even though I have assisted various entities in matters regarding groundwater in the Keaho Aquifer, including the National Park Service, DHHL, and community members. Before I start the substantive part of my testimony, I, I really want to thank um, Mahalo Chair Case and, and the commissioners for your service. Um, I myself have now served for over nine years in um, public service on boards and commissions, three years, over three years on the Oahu Island Burial Council, now over six years on the Land Use Commission. And I really, I feel like I can say with great sincerity, I understand how challenging your job is, especially when you're asked as commissioners to rely on particularly highly technical analyses um, to make your decisions. So in that regard, the one point that I really wish to make for the commissioners today is that I believe the staff submittal is inconsistent and incomplete in a whole number of ways, but really I wanna only highlight one particular way, the multiple uncritical references to the sustainable yield of Keaho. And um, I believe that issue started to be touched on by you, Chair Case, in a comment or question you offered to Deputy Manuel. Most people, um, and certainly parts of the submittal seem to treat sustainable yield like a checking account balance. As long as value X is not lower than value Y, we're all good. 
Um, in the case of Hull, people say as long as pumping is below 38 million gallons a day, or as suggested by the county in their written testimony, below 80 million gallons a day, there could not possibly be any problems with sustainability in the Keahoe Aquifer. And there's problems with that. Most people don't understand that the purpose of the robust analytical model or RAM, the equation used to calculate sustainable yield, which is, here's my fancy visual aid. That's the one line equation um, that's used to, the RAM model used to calculate sustainable yield. Um, has some very significant limitations. First and foremost, its greatest limitation is that the RAM model, the RAM equation is designed only really to accomplish one thing. It is designed to protect wells from having unacceptable levels of salinity come into them. That's it. That's the entire purpose of why RAM was developed by Mink and others and why it's been applied. It's supposed to protect wells from not getting unacceptable levels of salinity, nothing else. And so I wanna highlight for you some of the limitations of that model. And in case I sound overly critical, I wanna point out to you the limitations and um, assumptions of RAM that I'm gonna quote from are directly from the State Water Projects Plan that your staff and consultants developed and that you guys approved. RAM, first of all, assumes fresh water occurs solely as a basal lens floating on top of salt water, a condition we know does not exist in this aquifer. It assumes there is a sharp interface between fresh and salt water rather than a transition zone which can be changed and flexed and narrowed due to pumping. It assumes the aquifer is entirely unconfined, which we know is not true due to both the high level wells and the deep confined system. It assumes aquifer properties are homogeneous. It assumes aquifer thickness is constant rather than what is actually the case for a basal aquifer. It's thickest at the inland layer and it's thinnest at the coastal layer. It assumes groundwater flow is uniform and laminar. It assumes wells are optimally placed and evenly placed throughout the aquifer system, drilled to the same level of depth and pumped at the same rate. RAM ignores the spatial distribution of recharge. And if you have ever stood on the shoreline of North Kona on the Keahoe Aquifer, you know just by looking up Mauka <laughs> that recharge is not uniform in the area. It ignores um, the spatial distribution of actual well placement. Um, the calculation of how much water is acceptable to be drilled is based on knowing what the initial head was of the aquifer or guessing. In the case of Keahoe, we did not know before development what the initial head was of the aquifer. It doesn't account for convection or dispersion. It doesn't account for variability in the transition zone. It doesn't account for flow between aquifer systems. It doesn't account for boundary conditions like cap rock. It does not account by the staff's own admission for the needs of groundwater dependent ecosystems. And it only models flow in two dimensions rather than three. So I wanna to go to Commissioner Buck's really, really excellent question. I was really so glad to hear it to Delwin Oki. He said, you know, Ms. Dr. Oki, there's, a, there's, there's limits to all models. What are the limits to your model? If we were gonna ask the same question, what's the level of confidence we have that sustainable yield of 38 MGD is based on an accurate model of the aquifer, the, answer, the honest answer would be 0%. We know the model is inaccurate. We know it is an incorrect description of the Keahoe aquifer. So when you as commissioners ask the necessary questions you have to ask, like, will this particular well affect groundwater dependent ecosystems? Or even, is there enough available water in Keahoe? Or at least enough water available for public trust uses? All the references and to the RAM model and a supposed at 38 MGD are, are incomplete answers at best. Mahalo Nui for listening to my testimony for your years of service. Thank you. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of the uh, people who have signed up to testify. <coughs> uh, questions, uh, commissioners or comments? Um, I, I just want to ask staff um, one more time if we have updated uh, authorized plan use. Yeah, Commissioner. The county wasn't here. Yep. Sorry. I'll try to take that. So um, as of as of now, uh, back in 2007, the submittal before the commission on the draft Keoho Waters Development Plan articulated authorized plan use as 28.07 MGD. Um, 
that has not been updated um, as we know. I mean, we, we don't know if uh, the current draft plan has not gone through county adoption, um, has not included or been amended to increase or look at whether that's increased or decreased. So that's the number that we have on file. Uh, that 28.07 MGD would include existing pumping and the authorized plan use as identified in the Keoho Water Use Development Plan that the commission approved in 2017. That's the most update information I have for you. Yeah, I, I guess when I, when I look at our, I, I think we all understand this is a highly complex uh, system and, and one that we're continuing to learn about as a commission. Um, and I think, you know, one, one thing I deeply appreciate about this entire process um, has been how much we've learned about the Keoho aquifer, aquifer system, groundwater dependent <laughs> ecosystems, um, you know, link with uh, <laughs> submarine groundwater discharge, all, all of these unique features that happen here um, that we don't necessarily find in other places. Um, but when I, so when I look at our, our set of rules um, I, that are, you know, determined to be adaptive and, and to really help us do something distinct and different because we decided uh, not to designate. Um, I'm not, my reading, I don't feel that we're, we're implementing those, those particular sets of rules that we've governed ourselves by here. Um, and so that's, that's where I'm struggling with. And so something like authorized plan use, um, you know, I know it's not easy to calculate, but when we're going to look at a permit in this area, I would expect us as, as a commission, as staff to actually, you know, meet with the county, not, not, I'm not talking about just looking at the last plan that was approved, but, but look at, you know, recent developments with the county um, and board of water, as, as well as the planning department just to have an additional level of, of certainty, you know, um, that the community <laughs> deserves, that our water systems deserve. So, so I'm struggling with that. I'm also struggling if, you know, Kaleo or others, the bifurcation of the permit. Um, I'm not, again, my memory is, is usually good, but right now maybe not as good, um, but, I, but I can't recall examples where we do approve a well construction permit and it's separate from pumping it's I, I want to say the majority is usually attached together and and I you know really value the arguments that were made by Ashley um, from Native Hawaiian Legal Corp that that you know it does feel like if we as a commission approve a well construction all this investment goes into it and and then we do a, a more thorough analysis in terms of allocation of water it's going to be hard. <laughs> it's going to be hard for the commission to say, "Oh, you know what? Close it off. Never mind." <laughs> um, so I don't know. I, I'm not sure where other commissioners are at, but I'm. Um, and I and I and I want to also thank uh, Loke and and acknowledge, you know, how difficult it is to testify, you know, for certain peoples of amongst our community that are experts, but you know, have to take off work. And um, so thank you for, for being here. And I'm sorry, my daughter is pounding a piano in the background, so I'm gonna have to click off for a second. Mahalo, Commissioner Viewer. If I can just try to jump on on the bifurcation question, um, in, and, and AGs may be able to advise on, on the approach, but, um, and Roy may be able to add a little bit more. Uh, there. Oftentimes, uh, there are times when wells have come in just for the well construction. Uh, we'll run a pump test and then apply for a pump permit based on the productivity or lack thereof of the pump of, of the well. So it, we have done um, approvals uh, bifurcated where we approve just the well construction and then the applicant will so apply for a pump installation permit. Um, again, the majority of those have, have been managed ministerially, so they don't come before the commission um, at this point in time. The times that they have come before the commission has been in water management areas. So I just wanted to highlight that the commission has, uh, or at least the staff or deputy and chair have approved um, both well construction and pump station permits together as well as separately. Uh, and it's been based on, on that. So that is a practice um, that we've gone through. 
Uh, if, if I can just add, um, in particular in this area, uh, when this commission voted not to designate the Keoho Aquifer, it recognized this issue of of the um, of the the difference between groundwater dependent ecosystems, impact of water withdrawals, and uh, the sustainable yield calculation, and specifically said uh, they wanted to keep a close watch on this, this question in this, uh, in this area. Uh, and so that's in particular why we are bringing it back before the board and providing the special conditions. And the other thing I wanted to uh, just note is with regard to the uh, adequacy of information, that's another reason to bifurcate it here because um, the very information you need to make the best decision possible will come number one from the symposium to, to dig deeper into impacts on traditional and customary practices where we don't have adequate information um, and, and um, that the well itself will give us a lot more information about the, the well and the, and the test will give us inf information that we need for this. It is, it is an issue that it's gonna cost a lot of money to do the well, and so that's a risk that the applicant has to judge. And we, we know that it's a risk and we know that it's expensive. And we know that this is an area, Kona in particular in, is an area that where there has been a lot of develop and a lot of uh, water use and a lot of plans for further um, development and water use. And this is, this is just the place where we have to keep a close eye on it. And so that, again, that's, that's the reason to bifurcate it and to get more information in the process, but it is a risk for the applicant. Um, uh, Mr. Katayama was next, and then Mr. Buck, and then Mr. Hannes. Thank you, Chair. Um, Kaleo, the Department of Water submission for this comments was dated in March 2019. Is that the current status? of their relationship with the different parties, or can that be updated? Sorry, the- I noticed they weren't on today's testimony. No one was here from the department. Yeah, the Department of Water Supply, Commissioner Katayama, didn't, uh, is not here, but they did submit written testimony on the item, which you all should have received. So there is an updated um, testimony on their behalf. Did you- you should have gotten that from. I see a memo dated uh, March 2019. Is that it? No, it it was attached to an email. I will forward that to you, Justice. Okay, I'm sorry, I didn't know. Nope. Thank you. It's, it's okay. embedded in the testimony um, that we received that we forwarded to, to you, folks. Okay, I, I didn't see it. Thank you. And maybe it'll be helpful, Roy, if you can comment on how the impact of freshwater servicing the shoreline is measured as we go through increasing withdrawals of pumps. It seems that uh, we, we sort of not mention that or not comprehend how you're looking at that. Um, thank you for that question. It's a tough one to answer too. Um, when you're in the tidal zone and all that mixing is going on and it varies, you know, depending on what the tide is, low tide, high tide, and how much, how much of that is um, attributed to just the basal area, how much of that is attributed to high level. Um, and it's three-dimensional. It's just not at the coast. We know that there's submarine, uh, you know, offshore in deeper water. And what's the percentage of that compared to near the coast or in the ankyline ponds? So, you know, real difficult. I think, you know, more studies, um, not just at the National Park to look at their ankylion ponds. Um, the university has been doing quite a bit. Um, EKVI, um, I don't know if you've heard of that, but they've been funding some uh, other alternative ways of quantifying and looking at, at uh, and getting at that question uh, and answering that. And they've been looking at all different things, just not chloride. They've been looking at radon and and um, you know other things, microbial uh, tracers. Um, I think you know the more uh, we look at this, and I think the symposium will be a helpful 
um, way of trying to gather all this, these different studies that are out there, because I'm, I'm sure there's others we haven't even heard of yet um, that, uh, you know, masters or doctorates are working on um, will help, you know, to get at uh, what's the best way to, to monitor and, you know, come up with an adaptive management plan. You know, Kim testified that she has been taking measurements of salinity and uh, maybe you can, you know, sort of look at it or help her or help people sort of rationalize or understand the impacts of, uh, as we look at uh, increasing withdrawals up above and how they're going to, right. their systems are going to be impacted. Right. And that's, you know, taking the, the salinity is just part of it. You know, that's the physical hydrologic. There's also the biological component is, well, what do those mean, you know, to the biota and, uh, you know, specific species and their specific thresholds and so forth. Good. I think, you know, as we get uh, more information, we become more and more comfortable with uh, looking at the uh, ability to withdraw additional fresh water at higher elevations. Thanks, Roy. Sure. Mr. Buck, we can't hear you. Um, are you connected? <coughs> now you're on mute. Now. Wait. Now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Uh, at this point in time, uh, leaning, I'm leaning toward approval of this item. I want to thank the staff. This has been real, uh, a very complicated issue. Uh, when we did not designate this area as a water management unit, we worked really hard to try to put some triggers in. Uh, to have extra careful scrutiny. And uh, I think the staff did, did, did a good job on this. A ministerial, this is hardly a ministerial uh, item. There's many things on this. So I think being that referred to that is not really accurate. I am concerned about the bifurcation. And I think it's really important for all current and future water developers in this area to realize that um, this area has extra scrutiny. And I would like to add a, con a, 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 a written condition, which I think is the intent uh, of Chair Case and the commissioners that the approval of this well construction permit is not approval of a subsequent produ production well permit, which will be brought forward to the commission as a separate item in, in the future. Uh, I think it's important to kind of let, make sure there is no there is no confusion on that. And the, the applicants and any future applicants are aware that this is probably the process for, for any sort of uh, production wells in this area. And so I, I, think, uh, I think if we add that in, that would be helpful. And at this point, I, I'm leaning toward approval of this item as submitted with that, with that uh, subsequent condition with uh, addressing the bifurcation. Thank you, Mr. Hannes. Yes, number one, I want to join uh, with Commissioner Beamer and I'm sure the rest of the commissioners in thanking those who took time off from work and uh, to be here, Loke, uh, Kimberly, and, and others. Uh, uh, appreciate that your voice is important, and especially I move that uh, yeah, our fish, you know, our, our local, they, they need to be represented too, and, and you've done an excellent job in doing that. Uh, by the same token, I'm disappointed that the DWS is not here at the table. This is an important matter. And uh, uh, granted, uh, people are busy and so forth, but I wish they were here uh, to speak on behalf of their, their plans and their issues. Uh, uh, third, uh, the people who are here, uh, I want to thank all of you. I mean, you've represented yourself in, in very reasonable way and very reasonable ideas. These, these, uh, there's a community building here. And that's what leads me to uh, be concerned about the motion, Mike. Uh, I appreciate your willing to, to move it. And I'm, keen to be supportive of staff uh, having done all this work, but I'm, I'm fearful that uh, we get into some of the issues that uh, Ms. Obrey so 
uh, articulately expressed, uh, that we just kind of start to roll into this decision where to to points where we cannot go back uh, because of the 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 weight of the investment. Uh, I'm wondering why we can't have that symposium right away. Now, it won't be informed by the exploratory well, but that exploratory well, if we approve it, it's going to take a while to develop. And that pushes a really valuable discussion that we're primed to have right now, you know, to a more distant future. And I worry that in doing so and taking that action, we start to drive these very reasonable constituents here to their corners rather than to unity. Uh, so my my hope is that or my recommendation uh would be to defer my inclination i should say my would be to defer the the approval of the well per se but to accelerate movement toward this symposium i mean mr oak dr oki just presented this information let's not just tick the box and say okay we got that now we can move let's let it miko let's let it settle in let's let people discuss what we just the, the, the knowledge and the, the information that was just shared with us, let's let the parties bring their ideas together uh, and let's have that symposium sooner than later. It won't have the exploratory well information, but maybe we'll have DWS at the table and they'll be able to share more about their plans. Uh, and, and we won't take an action that divides our community. We'll, we'll take an action today that build, helps to build the community. And I appreciate National Park have waited a, a long time for this. Uh, and this further um, it perhaps extends the process. They won't get what they wanted today. But I worry that if we if we take another course, we might get a contested case that that actually extends this further. Because uh, we know people feel very strongly about these issues. They're not going to let's give them a chance to come together on them rather than really uh, you know, put up their resistance to, to protect themselves and protect the things that matter most to them. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions, comments, uh, commissioners? Sure. I'll, I'll piggyback on that. Um, I, I want to support, you know, this um, idea of a deferral. I, again, I think given what's been brought up, we, we still haven't been, it says in our rules, to report on authorized plan use. And I don't feel that we've done that in our own rules. Additionally, I, I echo Commissioner Hannes' comments about you know, gathering more information on traditional and customary rights through the symposium, as well as, you know, we also heard testimony that Ola Ikawai um, and, and other groups, you know, weren't really included in, in this conversation. So I think there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, and then, you know, again, I. I really, when when this was approved to to take on this sort of heightened level of, of adaptive management for the area, I, I had really anticipated it it being truly adaptive. And and so when we hear testimony about RAM and and how that model, um, you know, doesn't doesn't seem to fit with this aquifer system and, and yet we're still relying on it to make decisions. I think those are the kinds of things to me that we should be presenting to the commission and updating, you know, how, how are we thinking of sustainable yield for this area and not relying on, you know, models that, that clearly, you know, aren't, aren't helping us to be informed. Um, and I also think the commission would benefit, like why bifurcate, you know, if um, have all the information presented to the commission on, you know, building as well as pumping, and then make that decision, you know, well informed with all the available data so that even for the developer side, they don't go and put in large amounts of investment, and then they lose out in the long run. So uh, a deferral and gathering more information, a more complete, you know, analysis of uh, authorized plan use, Let's talk about RAM. You know, is that the model we want to use for sustainable yield? Given what um, you know, Dr. Um, Likeke Shoyer identified from our own plans. Um, so I, I think there's a lot more we can do here with a little more time. Okay, are there uh, comments? And I, oh, yep. Sorry. Questions, uh, commissioners. Okay. Um, I think I think at this point we. Um, 
uh, want to entertain a motion. Uh, the the first the first uh, potential motion I heard was from Mr. Buck uh, to a, approve with uh, an additional con condition. An alternate motion I heard was to defer. So, um, how, how do you want to proceed? I'm prepared to make the motion to defer, uh, Chair, and then if it fails, uh, we certainly would entertain other motions, but uh, my motion would be to defer action on the well um, uh, permit and to, in lieu of that action, accelerate our commitments and this expression of desire for the parties to come together in, in the convening of this symposium, too. Okay, is there a second? Would you on enter? Sure. Would you entertain uh, just an additional sort of amendments to the motion, Commissioner Hannes? Abs absolutely. So, uh, I was kind of making it up yeah. without scrolling okay. back to, <laughs> to the all that was in that uh, original motion. So if I left out something sure. very important, I'd happily entertain. Sure. No problem. So I, I think you know, updating authorized plan use, um, you know, updating the commission on the use of the RAM model for this specific aquifer system, um, and and ensuring, I think, as Commissioner Hannes said, you know. Uh, Ole Kawai and, and Kalamai, if I'm messing up the Hui's name, I can't see, um, but I, um, it, you know, is included in, in these conversations on traditional customary rights. So I'll second that. Okay, um, discussion, commissioners? Mr. Katayama. Uh, thank you, Chair. What are the benchmarks for this def deferral that we want to see arise. You know, we're they, deferring it. They, they have the reason. symposium. They have the symposium. Okay. They have an opportunity to discuss the USGS work. They have an opportunity to discuss future plans by the DWS. They have an opportunity to discuss uh, what we already know about uh, impacts upon traditional customary practices. And I, I would add, Wayne, so I, those additional amendments Ram, that yeah. suggested. So yeah, so uh, the commission oh, okay. actually reporting on authorized plan use. The county wasn't here today, so we we actually, in in my interpretation, others can disagree. I'm not sure we have up to date authorized plan use information as it included in our rules, and I think also you know uh, get an update on the RAM model. Does the RAM model fit for Keoho Aquifer, and you know is it are we being adaptive in our management if we're holding to a model that doesn't seem to uh, allow us to anticipate, you know, the complexities of this aquifer system? So I think those would be some of the, the benchmarks, Wayne. Chair, can we get uh, staff's comment on uh, the ability to provide sufficient uh, research on the proposed uh, more inform additional information? Or are we sort of just within staff discussion or commissioner's discussion? Well, I mean, if the staff would like to um, add anything, they may. I, I, my main, my main issue is that I think the 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 crux of this is the impact of this well on withdrawals on um, on ecosystems, and we're not going to get that information from a symposium. We're going to get it from pump tests. I, <clears throat> Chair, I think that the challenge for me with that is, is having Dr. Aoki's information just presented today. Um, the more data we gather, the more that we're understanding the connectivity and the, the impacts of groundwater withdrawals, Malka, and even north and south on the park. I mean, and we've been saying we need more data, we need more data. The more data we get so far, the more connectivity we see and the more harm that withdrawals cause. So it's imperative for us as a commission to, to extradize, you know, let's make the decision that preserves the resource. You know, let's not ask for more information when we're already seeing that making decisions can actually bring harm to the public trust resources that we're in charge of, of managing. So I, I think that's the way I think about it. And that's why updating the RAM model would be really, really valuable. That's why getting authorized plan use numbers would, would better able for us to anticipate that, allowing for more, sorry, go ahead, Chair. No, no, go ahead. 
allowing for continued community participation as well as multiple community groups to be able to take part in the symposium, I think is really valuable. Again, um, respect the work of Ahamoku and, and um, Commissioner DeMonte, um, but, but also, you know, we saw a, a little bit of some of the testimony said there would be impacts, right? Um, so, so I think there's more that we can do here. So uh, I, just to comment on it, maybe staff can comment. I, I, my recollection from the discussion at the designation is that sustain, the sustainable yield model is set in statute or regulation. So, you know, if, if we have a different model, it's, it's got to go through a long process to, to change the model. So I think, I mean, you can, you can do a sustainable yield analysis and you can do a, a separate sort of public trust analysis. I'm not, I'm not sure this situation will be resolved by, um, I mean, it, it is an issue. The, the issue is that the sustainable yield model doesn't address this uh, impacts to ecosystem and cultural use. Um, it, it, it doesn't, so we need other information. So, you know, if, we, if we're going to just rely on the sustainable yield model, it doesn't get us there. So I, I'm, I'm acknowledging both sides of this. And I, I just, the other thing is I, I wanna, I, I am also bothered that the Department of Water Supply is not here. And I, I just wanna read the testimony that, that they provided yesterday. It says, Hawaii Department of Water Supply cannot accept limitation on pumping as proposed by the National Park Service. Um, the intent of developing the high level, high quality sources is to reduce the pumping of the basal sources. This in turn will provide customers with better quality water as well as reduce impacts to basal discharge at the coast. It should also be noted that in Appendix F of the 2019 Water Resource Protection Plan, more recent studies show that the calculated sustainable yield for the Keoho aquifer system area is significantly higher at 80 million gallons per day. However, the more conservative 38 million gallons per day sustainable yield is still being used. And he goes on from there. And so, uh, you know, the, a couple of things just to comment on this is number one, he's, he's the county water department of water supply is just pointing to sustainable yield. Number two, what they're saying is they're, they're pumping this, this proposal is to pump from the high level and the assumption it's, it's going to reduce pumping on basal sources. And so it is important to basically confirm that approach that the county has. And I think we're all hopeful that it's the correct approach, which is that you can pump from the high level aquifer and not have significant effects on the basal level at the coast. And somebody's gonna have to bite in order to Prove that, and so that's that's why number one, I, I do think the county needs to engage because you know, I mean, he starts out. They start out by saying they can't accept limitation on pumping. That, with all due respect to the county, that's the water commission's duty, not the county's duty, and that's why we're having this discussion. So, I, I'm I'm still in this. Um, I mean, it's a bit of a catch twenty two, but I'm still in this. Um, uh, in support of the staff submittal um, with the amendments that Mr. Buck proposed so that we can get the information we need at this critical next, next step, which is what is the impact of pumping the high level aquifer on the basal level? And we're at a point now where we can answer that, but it's gonna take somebody a significant investment to do that. And with the understanding that if the answer is wrong, it's going to come back to this commission and the commission is going to have to take a very, very hard look at that. Chair, I appreciate your comments uh, uh, and, and sharing of the DWS uh, uh, comments on their behalf or just to read them into the record, if you will. Um, I, I just don't see why we, I just feel like it's, 
we need many steps, not just one, a couple big ones. Uh, we need to break this down a little bit, let people kind of engage the information and live with it and share thoughts every step of the way. So, uh, you know, this, the fact that there's a symposium too, doesn't, that doesn't have to be the last symposium. I mean, in fact, this is a community of users and, and they're highly integrated interests. And so why not create a, this opportunity for them to come together for a symposium within the next few months? I'm not sure, just, to, just around what we already have. And yes, they might make them really ono oh for the the test, uh, the pump uh, exploratory uh, uh, pump data that you've you've highlighted is is important. Uh, but they've got other stuff to talk about and to and to address uh, before we get to that point. And right now, if we if we don't have that discussion, we kind of wait to get that approve the pumps and wait to get that information to have a, a richer discuss granted a richer discussion. I think they will feel like. There, there's a concern that they will feel like those other issues were not important. Uh, and I don't think we want to send that message. And, you know, we can hold for a gigantic agenda or we can kind of break this into pieces and encourage kind of uh, people to, to, to build agreements along the way that are going to help us in the longer run. Thank you. Any other comments? You know, uh, uh, this is really a tough one, uh, this Paul, um, and uh, a difficult decision. Um, I, the concept of, uh, of going ahead and, and putting in a well uh, without having uh, the ability to use it um, and uh, is, uh, is, is pretty foreign and a, a great breathtaking step. Um, I tend to agree uh, with you, Chair, in the sense that uh, it would be very, very helpful, and ultimately, um, you know, the, the right answer is is to try to get more perfect information. Um, the right way to do that would be to put this well in operation and pump it for a year or perhaps longer, and determine by tests the ultimate impact. Um, it doesn't sound like that's something uh, that we can do or or will do. Uh, so it's, it, it is really a difficult situation. I don't happen to think that that we would get a lot of useful information uh, out of a symposium in terms of the impact. Um, I think the real empirical uh, pumping effect uh, is, is ultimately only obtainable uh, with time and experience um, and actually uh, operating the well. So it's a it's a very difficult uh, exercise. Um, in that case, um, I think that the right way to get that information, the most direct and straightforward way to get that information, is to is to approve the permit uh, and uh, and uh, uh, see what happens as we go forward. We'll be a little bit smarter uh, when we establish the pumping limitations uh, on that in terms of the, the pumping permit. That's uh, I don't have a I don't have a very good so very good recommendation, but it's uh, if I had to make a decision, I think that's where I'd come out right now. I appreciate that. L let me ask Steph: Is there another way to get, um, without doing like a new two-year study, or however long it took in cost, um, to get that th this this proposed well location is outside of the four aquifer area. Um, w at least with regard to the national park issue, it's it's in an area that that is already heavily developed, uh, right above uh, Kailua. I I don't know what the um, I don't know what the freshwater discharge is in, in in this area. Is there a way to do pump tests with current wells to try to test the USGS model further. Roy. If I can take a crack at that, we actually do have, in a sense, a pump test going on and that's what's being reported right now from all the wells as far as the total pumpage, the water levels, um, the chlorides. And um, the thing is that I think with, um, you know, Dr. Oki's model, 
you know, it's limited to just the basal. We have a lot of information up in the dike area, but that wasn't modeled directly. So, um, in, you know, in lieu of that, that model, you do have that data though. So um, I'm just saying that the, you know, the continued reporting month to month and being on top of that and, you know, watching the trends, we have monitor wells too, to see how the entire uh, thickness of the aquifer is changing. Um, and I think um, Deputy Kaleo mentioned that the Keoku wells were, were noticing, um, you know, some indications of, of thickening of the aquifer, which, it, which was, it's kind of strange because we just fixed the original deep monitor well, which was leaking a lot of fresh water. We fixed it, prevented that leak from the deep confined aquifer. So you would think that there's less fresh water coming into that area. So the, the, in that area, the, the lens would have, you know, shrunken down. So um, not sure what's going on there, um, but we do have, you know, pump tests. It's ongoing all the time, actually, with the water reporting. So Roy, what's the amount of proposed pumping from this well? Um, 672,000 per day. So what would it take to pump that amount from a different well and also to do the isotope study? Oh. And, and, and see the impacts on, the, in, on wells in the basal la layer? Um, well, um, you know, any of the existing wells, I guess you could, like, for example, the earlier question about what was it from Commissioner Hannes, you know, what's up with the Queen Lilio Kalani well, which hasn't been pumped that much. I think it would be able to, you know, I don't know how long it's going to be down. Um, um, I mean, you could, you know, turn that thing on and go up that amount. Um, how that relates to isotope, um, uh, you know, gathering isotope, that's, that's part of the criteria that should, you know, you can look at as well as water levels and chloride changes as well. But again, that's, this is from high level. Um, you could certainly use the observation wells that we mentioned in the submittal. Um, so is so this information that, you know, we could get in three to six months at a staff level, or is it information that requires, you know, a two, a two year USGS, you know, very costly, we don't have the money for it study. Yeah, I think it's the coordination between all the different, you know, um, people involved with all these monitor wells. I mean, you have the park, you have uh, us, um, you have the owners of Kamakana, um, and then of course the Department of Water Supply and how they're pumping, you know, they, they, they shouldn't be changing the pumping, they should keep it pr pretty steady uh, with the exception of like a QLT well. Um, so I don't know, um, I would say at, at least a year though, just to get everything in order and, you know, get the, uh, I'm sure consultants would have to be hired for some of these guys. Um, we can do ours um, uh, or they can allow us to do that. But then that would, you know, require more. Co so it's a coordination um, problem. Um, six months to a year is, I guess, possible. Um, hard, hard to speculate that way. We were hoping that, you know, the colloquial irrigation well was going to be our deep monitor well. Uh, and, uh, you know, we ran into problems with the owner way back and uh, fortunately we have a new well that's almost, it's getting close to uh, the maximum depth uh, on the Department of Water Supplies uh, site directly above the park. So it's just these practical things working it out with the various players and parties. Dr. Beamer. Yeah, I just wanna, um just um, kind of mention for, for the record, I, um, you know, it, I, I echo everything, uh, much of what Paul had, had kind of said about the complexities and, um, and trying to be adaptive and, you know, sort of not knowing uh, the implications of, you know, without more wells and more pumping. Um, but I, I do want to really caution, um, you know, the idea that the symposium, and traditional customary knowledge is, you know, some somehow secondary to um, analytical or quantitative or you know um, engineered knowledge system. So, and in fact, the courts and you know our, our duty as a commission is is really to preserve traditional customary rights. And in fact, 
it's the courts has been clear on multiple occasions when we lack scientific certainty, what we're supposed to do is take the precautionary principle to preserve the resource, um, knowing that in, in these complex situations, we don't have enough information. We're not supposed to say we need to drill more and pump more to get more information to learn we have to save <laughs> and protect things. That's actually um, in some ways, you know, the, the complete opposite, I think, of, of the direction that we should go in. Um, so I, I just, I just want to stress that with the utmost respect, and, and I understand, you know, we all come from different uh, backgrounds and, and experiences, um, and that's what's unique about the commission, you know, is, is we're trying to bring these backgrounds and experiences together to preserve the public trust and in this mandate, so mahalo. You no, know, like if, if I could, I, I'm just going to respectfully comment on your comment, which is that I, I, I think the issue is, number one, we need to know what, what the natural and cultural resource values and the practices are, and that's the value of the symposium very much. But as far as what would be the impacts of pumping, we can't get that from the symposium. That, that's, that's the issue here. That's what I'm, I'm trying to figure out if there's another way to get to the actual impacts that's that's chair chair i would i would entertain an amendment to the motion to a deferral to include some of the suggestions that staff should pursue those other means for getting that kind of data uh, incorporated and uh, 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 developed so that they could be shared at the symposium thank you mr kaoka uh thank you chair um just kind of adding to what uh, commissioner beamer said and I'll take it from a scientific engineering perspective. I know there's a whole lot of range of other issues involved in this situation, but, um, you know, this is a real dilemma. And in the department, we face that not often, but enough that it has very huge consequences. Um, you know, I, I, I can understand where, you know, Deputy Emmanuel and Roy are going through where, you know, we're not going to get perfect 100% information. I don't know where we are in terms of the spectrum, but we're not there. Um, just look at the modeling aspect. Uh, you can take the same model and you have different people putting in different inputs and you get totally different conclusions. And, you know, as technical managers, uh, you know, we're not experts in those areas, but we're expected to make those kind of decisions or at least propose it to our policy um, people to make those kind of decisions. And we're kind of sort of in that situation. Um, we can't take forever. We can't kick the can down the road, um, but, you know, if, if bifurcating this kind of situation will get you that information and still proceeding with the the project um rather than trying to get information that we already have or doing some additional effort to make that f uh get information i i don't know how long it'll take either way but uh we're certainly missing technically a, a very critical piece of information to go forward. Or, you know, if we stay with the bifurcation, we can get information in time to, to really contribute to, at least from a technical engineering standpoint, what effect it's gonna be. But right now, um, as a technical manager, you know, we're joined the, club. I mean, we're in that kind of situation a lot in, in our situation. And it's just, I'm not saying it's, it's, it's not just technical, but it's all of these involved. But from a technical standpoint, uh, yes, you want all the information you can. Um, but a lot of times that's not doable. And you have to make that recommendation without that perfect information or imperfect tools at this point. I mean, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm interested in knowing what we could do on a deferral with a much more abbreviated time frame. 
you know, right, right now that it's, you know, have a plan for a symposium by August. And, you know, I mean, could we, could we accelerate, could we, you know, could we try to evaluate both, both the symposium, hold the symposium and, um, uh, and um, re review the USGS study in conjunction with the information that we have already to, to see if we can come up with any better projections about projections or ways to get, get an answer without drilling a new well, a short answer to try to refine it a little bit better before making this commitment. Because I, I do hear everybody's, um, you know, I think everybody's feeling this, like even bifurcating it, 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 does, it does create this, um, you know, risk of a heavy investment that then we'd have to make a tougher decision on later on. So, um, Mr. Buck. Maybe I can add something in that direction you're going, Chair. Um, you know, obviously the RAM model, we aren't going to change because it is by rules, but we're very obvious that the RAM estimate did, does not include some of the EV ecosystems. So in using the pre 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 precautionary principle, it would be helpful if we came up with a, a number that we believe is, is, is a, a appropriate for this uh, aquifer. And that sends a message to cook kind of everyone and that potentially could well be a deliverable uh, short term of the sim in uh, of a uh, of the symposium i'm sure people wouldn't agree but um for the commission to have a uh, a number that that is not the ram but something that we're comfortable with that might be very helpful for us to uh, uh, be able to make the decisions. This is going to be a long-term issue. Water development in Kona is going to be controversial from now on, no matter what it is. So uh, I think if we could have a number that's lower than RAM that does represent traditional cultural and the ecosystem attributes that we're comfortable, that frame really might, might help us. And if we can do that in, in a short amount of time, then maybe a deferral makes sense at this point, if that's a deliverable of the symposium. Mr. Katayama. Thank you, Chair. It intrigues me that can we put together a series of wells, existing wells that will withdraw the 700 gallons per minute and that we avoid the installation costs of drilling and, and going through a pump to get you know, the information that we need. So would a 30 or 60 day deferral to allow staff to evaluate these alternatives and see if there is something that would be adequately put together to help us move forward in, in actually even a quicker you know, pace rather than drilling a well, going through a, a permit for a pump installation that put together a consortium of wells, have them withdraw the 700 gallons per minute and, and see what the impact is. Okay, some good discussion here. Dr. Beamer, your hand is up. Was that up before or again? Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, no, I just wanted to piggyback. I, I, I like that idea, um, Commissioner Katayama, you know, if we can use wells that are already drilled and can better inform. And I, and I agree with, you know, with, with Chair and others, you know, that getting more of this information and data, you know, would be helpful. Um, so if we could use existing wells, that, that seems like that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but I, I do want to piggyback a little bit on Commissioner Buck's, um, you know, maybe I, I'm not clear if, you know, if the RAM model um, is, is something that we can't deviate from in specific instances. And that would be another thing I think we could look to as a staff, because if we're acknowledging the model doesn't work for the ecosystem that we're supposed to be managing, um, that feels like 
you know, we have a fiduciary duty to, to actually adjust our management and the usage of that model. I, to say we're going to use the same model when we know it, it doesn't apply, doesn't, you know, I, I, I think there's a way that we can perhaps look into that. So I agree with Commissioner Buck and maybe we can get some updates from staff as to how, you know, we might approach this a little differently. Chair, do you want me to jump in? Sure. Quick, maybe to mahalo commissioners for the awesome conversation and dialogue. I, I appreciate it um, in my capacity as deputy to kind of understand where um, your folks' concerns are and where you see um, potential areas for improvement. So I take that as you know very constructive criticism uh, and suggestions on improvement. So I appreciate it. Um, you know, hearing the conversation, um, you know, the applicants are here. Uh, that's NOHA and HHFDC. They're still online. And so um, there's been discussions about potential deferral. Obviously, that would impact their time frame. And or, um, you know, there's been conversations about potential um, potential requests for a contested case. So there's a lot to consider in this process. Um, I, at this point, maybe, you know, hearing the conversation about deferral, um, you know, and, and already the motion by uh, Commissioner Hannes and second by Beamer, um, you know, we could try to look at within the next 30 to 60, come back in two months um, to look at addressing some of the questions and concerns of the commission. Um, and at that point, either recommend, you know, continuing with the recommendations as drafted by staff with some tweaks and amendments. Hopefully we can get you know, some answers to these questions that have been raised um, related to, you know, authorized plan use updates, related to uh, applicability or of, of alternatives to RAM to determine sustainable yield, um, whether or not a tightened timeframe for a groundwater dependent ecosystem symposium could be held. And then ultimately who pays for that? Because right now the recommendation is that HHFTC and they, they have agreed to pay for it tied to the approval. Um, if we're deferring, you know, that would be something that we would have to potentially fund on behalf of the commission. And so those are things that I, I'm thinking through and considering as this conversation is occurring um, right now. Uh, but, you know, if we set a time frame to defer to and shall come back, you know, by June uh, commission with a report kind of on all these outstanding things, um, I, I, I personally, two months um, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I, I don't know um, from the applicant's point of view if they have any concerns or questions or, or suggestions as well, so. Thank you, Coleo. And if I could just add to your list this question of, is there a way to do an uh, alternative yeah. pump test? Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and to um, clearly understand and articulate um, in more detail, I think what Roy was saying is, what are we seeing from our, our survey branch in our observation wells, water levels, chlorides, what, what is it? And, and lay that out very clearly for the commission because I'm, I'm hearing that that's maybe something that needs to be presented more thoroughly. And then how this pump scenario or pump test, you know, what, what will it show and what won't it show? Because there's been test of testimony shared today that believes the pump test won't show anything um, and that the delay in pumping may actually not be seen for time, right? And so we, we, we can... In 60 days, I think, come up with something that clearly lays out, you know, um, uh, either approval or strategy to move forward um, based on this conversation. Okay. Um, all right. I, I think, does somebody want to make a motion? Uh, or I think we have... Amend, amend the motion. To I've amended, I've accepted amendment of the motion to include your uh, uh, direction to staff to look at alternative ways to provide the pump test data. Okay, so the, the so co come back in 60 days, uh, address the question of sustainable yield versus all, all alternative models and what is the legal framework and the practical framework. Re review the possibility of what review what we know from existing wells and the possibility of a of a of a, a, a pump test. 
um, the the question of um, let let us add determine whether we could hold that symposium uh, uh, to have a discussion by the key stakeholders of the information that we already have. As yeah, well let's as let's have let's have include uh, a plan the plan for the symposium. Right. Um, and the information that we want from the county. All right, are we all okay with that list? All right, anything, anybody else wanna add? I just wanna say mahalo to Kaleo. Um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Paul. Uh, oh, I, just a question popped, uh, popped into my head. Do we need 60 days for the staff to do that to determine feasibility? Could it be done in 30, for example? Just I will, um, There, there's some, massive coordinating uh commissioner meyer of agencies and as much as i would totally love to come back in 30 days to get on the agenda it gives me about two weeks to get the data analyze the data and draft something so realistically the 60 days is is still tight but it's something that i think we can live with um i think 30 days would be really difficult to get back on that uh what is it may the may agenda would be really really difficult Thank you, Kalev. Uh -huh. Okay, Dr. Beamer. And sorry, I, yeah, I was just saying, you know, I appreciate Kaleo, your work and all the staff. And, um, you know, I certainly, none of these comments were critiques on, on, you know, your work and your leadership. I mean, this is just, this is a function of one of the most, we're in the midst of learning about this ecosystem, right? And it's been ongoing. And so I think this is just one of the most complicated areas of water resource management. Um, well, certainly in Hawaii and, and perhaps, you know, in other places in the world. So, so I, we got to learn. And, and, and I think this conversation has been great. So mahalo to all the commissioners for sharing. Okay. Mr. Beck, did you want to add anything or you looked like you were going to say something? All right, let's go ahead and take a vote on this motion then which I won't repeat. <laughs> All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed, any abstain? Okay, that passes unanimously with all seven commissioners. Thank you very, very much for a very robust um, discussion on a challenging topic with lots of different um, pieces of information and perspectives. And I, I think this is a really important process so chair, chair i just want to commend your leadership and you've kind of established an environment where we can all speak our mind and the, the crossover effect of other people trying to solve the other guy's problems i think is really uh commended it makes working on this commission really gratifying and i think it tone is set at the top and so it's a signal we send to our stakeholders who also have the same differences that we may have that this is how you get things done it's a better way to do it. And, and so I appreciate the, your allowing this discussion and, and helping us to arrive, lead us to, uh, you know, it may not be a perfect solution, but it, but it feels good in the moment and it feels like the right thing to do. Model. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Okay, commissioners, that brings us to the end of the decision-making items. We still have some informational briefings. Um, um, and people signed up to testify. So we're gonna to wanna to take a, a break. Uh, so uh, do you guys want 15 minutes, half an hour or 45 minutes? Okay, let's just vote for 15. Who wants 15? Two people, half an hour? Three, 45 minutes? Okay, half an hour. So we'll be back at 1.15. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, commissioners.
hard to see. Okay, I think we're about to gather again in uh the Water Commission meeting. Hello. Hi, uh, I, I know you wanna testify on item C2 and so we're gonna put you on mute until uh, that it's that time. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, okay, I think we, we, we did lose one commissioner and Dr. Beamer just confirming if you're back in the room. Sorry, Chair, I, I'm back. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ran, are you ready for us to proceed? Ready, Chair. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, staff, uh, we're going to move to item C2. And um, please, please proceed. Okay, can you hear me? Great. Okay, uh, good, good afternoon. Aloha and good afternoon, Chair Case and uh, Commissioners. This is uh, informational briefing, item C2, Maui Department of Water Supply. 
Molokai Water Use and Development Plan update process. Um, sorry, Neil Fuji here with the planning branch. Um, so today's briefing is, is going to be on the process for updating the Molokai Island Water Use and Development Plan, uh, which was last updated in 1990 as part of the County of Maui's Water Use and Development Plan. Um, the County of Maui Water Department of Water Supply is responsible uh, for this update, updating the Molokai Molokai Water Use and Development Plan. And um, we've also included a proposed project description in your packets, in your agenda packets uh, for your reference and to give you an uh, understanding of the details uh, of this important project. So um, the purpose of today's meeting is to give you all a heads up about the update process um, and that the Maui uh, Water Department is gonna head with it. Uh, and also, um, an idea of some of the scope, scope of work and tasks that will be going, will uh, go into updating the Molokai Water Use and Development Plan. Um, and then staff intends to bring an action item submit on next month, back to you guys, to the commission, uh, to approve uh, the scope of work for updating the Molokai Water Use and Development Plan. So this is kind of a uh, deputy manual suggested uh, we do it in, two parts, you know, first like a briefing and give you guys some information and give you guys some time to think about that. And we'll bring it back next month uh, to approve the water use development plan, which has been um, customary what, if, what we've been doing and is a recommendation of the, um, the framework for updating the Hawaii Water Plan. So before we begin, uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Eva Blumenstein, Planning Program Manager from the Maui Department of Water Supply, as well as Bruce Suchita, he's president of Townscape Inc., who's uh, the contractor that was selected for the uh, to assist water department with the project. They will be giving a short briefing today, and they're going to be available for any questions you may have um, on the briefing, on the scope of work. And we also have, I think, uh, Marty Buckner from Maui Department of Water Supply. Uh, we also have Sherry Hiroka and Lily Makaila from Townscape to support the presenters. So with that, I think everyone's, I can't see who's on the line, but um, Eva and Bruce, please proceed. Thank you. Aloha Chair, Commissioners. I'm Eva Blumenstein. I'm the Planning Program Manager for Maui County Department of Water Supply. Um, and as uh, Neil said, we are embarking on updating the 1990 Molokai Water Use and Development Plan, it's been that long. Uh, there was an effort to update select district for Maui County uh, Water Use Development Plan with some limited outreach conducted on Molokai in 2008, but there was no final plan submitted to this commission. I wasn't part of those um, early efforts, but I'll give you a brief overview of where we are at now for Maui County. Uh, the Lanai plan was adopted in 2011. And we started the public process to update the water use development plan for Maui Island in late 2015. We completed all six regional plans in 2018, where each regional plan is an aquifer sector. Um, compared to how Honolulu Border Water Supply, they do um, they do eight planning districts, right, to present their plan. So I last briefed this commission in May 2018. And we shortly thereafter submitted the draft plan to our board. Um, and they held public hearings through the end of 2018. And then per county code, we submit the plan as a bill for an ordinance to county council. Um, so it was submitted to county council in March of 2019. And then council reviewed the plan over about 10 uh, council committee meetings. It passed unanimously out of committee for full council adoption in August, 2020, and then it came to an abrupt halt. Uh, council was not ready to adopt it. Uh, they wanted more community input and they sent it back to committee. So that's where it's still sitting today. Um, we didn't want to hold up the very important water resource issues on Molokai any longer. So we decided to hire a consultant that understands community driven water planning. So we picked Townscape. We were really impressed with the work they've done for Honolulu Water Water Supply and on the um, Water Resources Protection Plan. So, um, so we're just getting started. It's sort of the first one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, held about just the last few weeks. And I will let Mr. Tushida 
speak to our community engagement approach and um, the proposed project description. Thank you, Eva. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, commissioners and commission staff. Thank you for including us in your agenda today. Uh, I'm Bruce Tuchita. Yeah, I think we have a internet issue here. So we'll just give him a moment to see if his internet catches up to him. He's, he's probably rebooting, so we'll just give him a second here. This replaces what a traffic jam is. All right. Go ahead, um, can you folks hear me now? Yes, we can. All right. Um, so we have a short uh, slideshow just to share with you some of the highlights of this planning process, where as uh, Eva mentioned, we are just beginning this process. We've been at work now, I think six weeks, and we have a long way to go. <clears throat> so next slide, please. Uh, this next slide is a very simplified uh, diagram of the Hawaii water plan components. So as you all know, there are statewide plans and also county water use and development plans. Um, <clears throat> so this one is for Molokai Island. <clears throat> as Eva mentioned, the Maui Island water plan is still are being considered by county council, but uh, we are moving ahead with the Molokai plan. The Lanai plan was completed quite some time ago, <clears throat> but it's not under consideration right now. Just a few um, <clears throat> comments about Molokai. As you all know, it's a very unique place some people call the last Hawaiian island. And as you also know, the entire island is a groundwater management area. So it is the only one of the major islands where the entire island is a groundwater management area. Also, uh, there are a number of different system, water systems on Molokai. And as <clears throat> most of you probably know, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands is a major water supply uh, manager. Uh, they have about 580 water connections and serve about 2,400 people. So they are a major player in the water systems there. Uh, I'd like to touch on a few of our main planning principles that we uh, <clears throat> adhere to in all of our watershed and water system planning, and including applying these principles to Molokai. So there are at least three major principles that we try to respect. Holistic understanding, of land and water resources, community-based planning, 
and respect for Native Hawaiian culture, traditions, and practices. And I'll comment a little bit on each of these core principles in the next slides. So when we talk about holistic understanding, and I'm sure you folks uh, understand those principles quite well, but unfortunately, many people do not really understand that land and water processes are interrelated, interdependent, and have to be understood together as a whole. The other factor that we are increasingly um, have to <clears throat> research and understand are the impacts of climate change. And as I'm sure you know, that the, the sciences relating to climate change are still evolving and our understanding is still um, far from perfect. And then um, <clears throat> the water plan also needs to align with the community plan for Molokai, which was completed in 2018. Uh, as well as reflect and be influenced by um, the Department of Hawaiian Homelands Molokai Regional Plan, which was recently completed, as well as the DHHL Molokai Island Plan, which dates back to 2005. <clears throat> so in terms of community-based process, uh, <clears throat> It's important to um, understand that we are strongly committed to a real partnership process with community. Uh, it's not enough to just have a, a few uh, community meetings and talk stories. trying our best to develop responsible plans, but we need to partner with them and understand their issues and their points of view uh, in order to put together a good plan. So that's a critical part of the planning process. And then um, very much a part of that process needs to be uh, developing an understanding of Native Hawaiian resource management practices on Molokai, uh, Native Hawaiian <coughs> history, issues, values, traditions, and all of those we need to do our best to fold into the planning process so it is really strongly oriented to those values. So I believe uh, is part of your information packet for today's meeting. Uh, your staff has provided you with uh, copies of the detailed work plan that we submitted to uh, the Maui County Water Department for this project. But here's a real brief uh, synopsis of what we call the main work elements and the schedule. For, for that work plan. So there are basically uh, five major elements. There's preliminary analysis of water resources, issues, and needs. Then we develop uh, what we call elements of a preliminary draft. So that's still a working document. Um, then thirdly, an official draft that goes out for community, agency, and, and other <coughs> reviews. Uh, the fourth step in the process is we would get back comments and develop the final Molokai water plan. And then it would go to <coughs> um, for formal approval by both the county and by your commission. So we're thinking uh, preliminarily, at least, each of these five elements would take six to eight months to complete. 
So we're looking at a project schedule of 30 to 40 months. Um, sometimes these plans take longer than that. But frankly, my experience is, has been the longer a plan drags out, the less uh, relevant <laughs> the data and findings are. So we are going to do our best to keep the schedule on track. And finally, here's a summary of our major deliverables. There are going to be some what we call working papers on various issues. We need to put together a partnering plan on how we're going to work with the community. We need to summarize <clears throat> regional water use. There will be related kapa'akai analysis. Uh, we're not sure what those details are yet, but we will need to get into that shortly. Then a preliminary draft, a draft together with a summary document. As you folks, I'm sure know, these water plans can be very cumbersome and very detailed. A lot of people don't understand them or won't have the patience to wade through them. So part of our contract is to do a short summary document of the draft as well as the pre-final and final plans. So that's a quick look at what we're up against. Um, we have a ton of work to do and lots of people to talk with, but we've started. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Um, it's great that we're able to start this planning process and I know all of the commissioners and all the community members appreciate it very much. And so, um, Commissioners, any questions at this point? And um, pending that, uh, we do have one person from the general public who wants to testify, um, Mr. Kamaunu. Um, if you could unmute your phone and go ahead, please. Okay, aloha, um, Commission. Kanilo Kamano uh, from uh, Maui, Wahe. Uh, so, one of my major reasons for uh, participating today, even though I'm not uh, a member of the community of Molokai, is uh, the water development plan. Um, and it talks about. Um, and when you look at the, uh, the appendixes, we as uh, people are down in appendix 10. And what alarms me about that is one, referring to us as Native Hawaiians, which is very, um, uh, for me, I call it a slave, uh, because according to the uh, 1959 uh, Admissions Act, according to the claims that the United States makes, that it doesn't uh, change anybody's um, citizenship. Uh, no citizenship was given, no citizenship was taken away, no changes can be made. Uh, that goes along with its uh, 1993 um, apology bill, Public Law 103-150, and whereas 29, that we as a people never gave up any or any consensus to be part of this process of annexation and that our our lands, uh, we never gave up any rights to our lands, uh, which would also include water. And according to this person's analogy, uh, land and its resources are all together. And that's our practice too, as far as Kanaka. So, um, for us to be a second thought, uh, especially to be put down so far down into um, uh, being looked at and then making light of our significance as far as having um, vested rights in all resources. Um, you know, here in Hawaii, the United States has no um, actually patented lands. The lands still are patented under the Kingdom of Hawaii. 
Uh, and with that, all the rights and privileges that come along with it uh, are still there, which is the water rights. And for as far as I can see that when you look at this water development plan, uh, the issue I have with it is where you place us. We are the ones that have actually protected rights. Uh, we are the ones that to secure our rights. It is the policy of this uh, government that that public trust that you talk about is a trust that belongs to us, and you're entrusted to protect that trust on our behalf. And this is not what's being taken care of. Our resource is being damaged, and I've been to Honolulu and I drank their water, and their water sucks. Um, I, I don't know anybody can drink the water from the faucet. It's terrible. I come from Waihei. I know what good water is. Um, in fact, in my home, I don't have any county system. I still live off the. I still live off the land, as many of my brothers and sisters do on the island of Molokai. So for me. I, I'm in opposed to this uh, water development plan just for the misuse and misunderstanding of us as Kanaka Maoli and our rights uh, to the resources, especially a finite resource such as water, which if you look at the water development plans here on Maui, their first concern is economics. Their first concern is how are they going to provide developers with water. So, you know, if you go ahead and pass this plan or, or um, agree with it, I'm just putting you on notice that our rights are not being secured in this process. And to put us number 10, when we should be put number one, especially being Kuliana, she has to be put into that situation. Because if, if you look at the case notes on um, your HRSs, Right? It talks about the Kuliana claim um, and the significance of it. And so it would behoove this commission to understand. And I've come in front of this commission since 2010. I was in the water case with Navaiha. I was also in a case where the permits are given out. I was recognized by Seaworm as having superior rights. So I, ex I um, uh, exercised that right that uh, this commission continue to protect that and that the discussion should be brought to us and we should be met and the county shouldn't have the right to uh, have authorization to make up plans for uh, a source that they don't rightfully own. And I've asked this before and I told this before also and mentioned it that I don't see anywhere where the state of Hawaii, the United States, or the county of Maui were given power over water. I don't see that, and I don't know uh, why I'm subjected, and any Kanaka suggest, uh, subjected to such a process. But uh, this is my testimony. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Uh, next up is Jonathan Lee K. K. Scheuer. Aloha, commissioners. Um, my testimony today, which will be less than one minute, is on behalf of the Department of Hawaiian Homelands, just to acknowledge and thank Eva Blumenstein and Boots Suchita that even though they've only been in this process for six weeks, we've already had our initial meeting with them. We've had some productive discussions about how to specifically target the Department of Hawaiian Homeland and its beneficiaries and homesteaders as one of the four recognized public trust users of water, and we look forward to continuing to work with them in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's all the public testimony we have. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions? Okay, uh, Mr. Buck, then Mr. Hannes. Uh, just real quick, a comment. Uh, Bruce, as you know, uh, Molokai is not a Oahu. People kind of pretty engaged in the water issue. Uh, I, I, PowerPoint, I wouldn't show that PowerPoint on your first meeting. <laughs> Uh, in Molokai, it's kind of uh, apple pie. And, uh, you know, I think some recognition of what everyone knows are some of the existing issues and conflicts on Molokai, uh, kind of getting that out front might help you as you work with the community. Thank you. 
Mr. Hannes. I want to uh, thank uh, Mr. Kaniloa Bin Kamonu for his testimony, and I want to assure him that uh, the Kanakamali interest will not be ranked 10 in, in all this study, and I'm sure Bruce will uh, con concur with that. Uh, Bruce, I do have a question for you. Uh, when I think about the name of this report, it's a development and use plan. It seems to be at the uh, posed at and poised at the back end of the privilege of the of having access to the, the developing access and having use of the resource. What about the front end of conservation and assuring watershed management? It, it doesn't feel like this report is going to address that. And yet that resource exists because of those land activities that aren't about somebody granting use to the water, but really uh, creating land cover and, and practices on the land that really recharge the resource. Will that be covered in this report? Oh, um, it's a very good question, Neil. The title of the plan, as I'm, I'm sure you folks know, come, comes from the uh, guidance for water planning in Hawaii. So it's not the title is not meant to exclude um, those natural resource and watershed management issues at all. Um, we will certainly be looking at those um, resources and issues. Uh, however, I have to say what, what we cannot do or are not scoped to do in this plan, and I, I need to be clear about this, is this plan is not going to try to articulate specific land and forest and watershed management programs. Uh, you may know that uh, the border water supply watershed management plans have been trying to articulate some of those kinds of programs. But in this case, because uh, for Molokai, the constituencies for the issues related to those kinds of management actions and plans are extremely complex and in our judgment would really be perhaps a companion plan, but not at least at this time included in this scope. Well, Bruce, I know this is not your first rodeo, uh, so I'll, I'll leave you to it. But when I look at holistic understanding of land and water resources, when I look at respect for Native Hawaiian culture, traditions, and practices, to me, it encompasses this sense of reciprocity and understanding that uh, you don't have the use if you don't have the responsibility to care for the, 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 the supply side. So uh, yeah, I think the, I'm, sure, I'm confident the people of Molokai will bring that to uh, uh, put that on the table and be interesting to see how you deal with it. Mr. Hines, can I jump in real quick? Um, uh, Clement, Deputy, obviously as a planner, I'm extremely excited about planning processes. Um, and I, I, I work closely with both Ava and Bruce. Um, and so maybe to frame where maybe this, um, this comment about watershed and, and larger protection, the protection and conservation measures rest is really the water resource protection plan. That is the that is the overarching framework that then is supposed to feed into the water use development plans, right? It's supposed to limit this use conversation after we've already addressed the protection policies. And embedded in that is the sustainable yield conversation and embedded in that is the identification or quantification of in-stream flow. And so it's supposed to trickle down into the, and then give, the counties and ability to understand, well, how much water do we have available for use? Um, but noting what you said, I the reason why we brought this for to the commission as an information item is to give better guidance. And if we need to um, ask them to tweak the scope, because once the scope is approved by this commission, it's the marching orders for the county. Um, and it's better to deal with framing and scoping now um, and get that covered versus at the end of the process saying, hey, why wasn't that included in the scope or outreach? So um, it's noted, I think we can circle back with um, Maui County and, and talk through some of those issues. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, mahalo, Bruce, um, <clears throat> for the presentation. And 
Yeah, I just want to kind of echo. I, um, you know, I know you, you're a master planner and have done so much uh, important work for our community. So I respect that. Um, <clears throat> and and I and I do think, uh, you know, just making sure there's clarity on, um, you know, we have a lot of existing um, issues on Molokai when it comes to this commission, and you know, well, seventeen we have sort of. <laughs> Um, IIFSs that we're trying to set and stuff. So, you know, I would just make sure this is kind of distinguished from from that work, and because um, our you know our commission has to move on those things too. But I imagine when you get out in the community, it, it could get pretty confusing. Um, so I'm not sure if you want to get in front of that or or relate that into the scope. Yeah. Well, just real quickly, uh, I, we are going to have to certainly look at those kinds of issues and problems relating to existing wells, sustainable yields, uh, proposed new wells, and other water systems there, and how well they're working or not working. And if not working well, then what are the potential solutions so that systems work better, including management solutions, because as you folks know, there are, there are multiple water entities now operating different water systems on that, on Molokai Island. And, and um, at least preliminarily from what we've looked at, um, that's not in the best interests of the resources nor of the community to have so many different systems. May I add to that? Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, that was certainly some of the challenges we faced in updating the Maui plan because there were so many major water resource issues that were uh, happening and changing as we were developing the plan with you know, contested cases being resolved, um, the first proposed decision order for Nava Eha, et cetera. So I mean, we tried and the community wanted you know, the plan to resolve those issues while at the same time, we just needed to integrate the decisions as they happened and then you know, adapt and adjust the plan. We are, we're up to two addenda already um, to do that. So we kind of learned lesson from, from Maui and I hope we'll do that better for, for Molokai. You know, we know that that's what the community is so passionate about and we have all these unresolved issues that will be discussed in the plan, but they may not be resolved in this plan. You know, it's gonna be concurrent paths. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Katayama. Can I just add one thing before Wayne jumps in? And I, I think that's great, Eva. And, and I think also respects the work that the community has done on these significant issues for many, many years. I, I think that that's also really key is, you know, going in there and, and honoring that that commitment and that work that communities have had for, for justice for water. So mahalo. Hi, thank you, Chair. Um, Bruce, in reading through your proposed work plan, what is the balance between looking at groundwater and surface water in developing your the water plan? Good question. We, we certainly don't have any kind of detailed answer that we can give you today. I think I can say though, in general, um, the, uh, we are going to need to look at surface water in, in considerable detail because of the relationship of obviously of groundwater to surface water and then surface water to nearshore waters. We know that the nearshore water quality and biota is a big concern on Molokai, uh, including of course the coastal fish ponds. So surface water will have to be um, probably, well, certainly a more important concern than might be the case uh, in some other uh, islands and other island planning. So yes, we will. That's high so on our priority. Would you be addressing that in tasks two and three? 
is that where you would sort of uh, encapsulate the relationship and the resource potential? Um, yes, I think if, if, if we want to kind of find a place where that analysis would take place, yes, but I, uh, my general answer is we're, we're going to need to look at those relationships throughout the planning process. So really from our first discussions with community folks, these interrelationships clearly are already coming, being put on the table. And we're gonna to have to work with these data and relationships and planning concepts, I think throughout the development of the plan. Good, I look forward to the results of that conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other questions, comments, board members, commissioners? Um, all right, thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, Chair, uh, Chair if I can real quick. Um, just a note to commissioners, we um, take a look at the scope. Uh, if you have any additional edits or recommendations, please get that to us. I'll, we'll, we'll regroup um, with Maui County folks and Bruce uh, based on some of the comments today and see if we can um, either address those clearly in the scope or make amendments. The idea is to bring it back to you ready to approve scope by next month. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on yeah. to um, agenda item C3. Chair, may I share my screen? Yeah. Also, also Chair, um, if we can do C3 and C4 and then um, open up for questions, they kind of piggyback off of each other, if that's possible. Yeah, we can do that. OK. Um, good afternoon, Commission. Uh, Aaron Strauch, hydrologist with the Stream Protection and Management Branch. Uh, this is for information only. It's a briefing on the draft interim in-stream flow standard for Wiley Stream on Kauai. Um, Wiley is on the north shore of Kauai. I'm sorry, I didn't have a, um, a larger map of the entire island, but it's just west of Hanalei. Uh, the geology is dominated by Waimea Canyon basalt and older alluvium. It's uh, obviously this is part of the um, this afternoon commission. Uh, Hello, is it? <laughs> yeah, if somebody has their YouTube on, please turn your YouTube off or we'll get an echo. So uh, the geology is some of the oldest in on Kauai, which is the oldest of the main Hawaiian islands. Uh, as you can see, the Kaloa uh, salt or Kaloa volcanics um, remains east of Hanalei. And so we have some exposed dikes and older alluvium throughout the Wyoli uh, hydrologic unit and uh, a number of uh, tributaries. The watershed is fairly unique in that it has more of the amphitheater style, uh, older watershed at the headwaters, but then it kind of narrows again and it opens up into a floodplain uh, closer to Hanalei Bay. Um, to flip the map so that uh, Malka is up, um, the Wiley hydrologic unit right here um, is surrounded by Hanalei. Uh, now east is to the left. Um, uh, Lumahai, Waipa are to the east, and Wainiha also um, uh, dominates the region uh, further east, further west. Sorry. Um, you can also see the historic and active USGS gauging stations. So Seaworm funds. In collaboration with uh, USGS, the station 16103 on Hanalei and 16108 on Wainiha. Historically, there was a stream gauge on Lumahai and in Waioli itself. Uh, 16105 was active uh, from 1914 to 1932. Um, here is a close-up of the watershed as it flows down into um, Hanalei Bay. As you can see, uh, 16105 is at about an elevation of 500 feet, uh, 550 feet, somewhere in there. Um, the the Monovai and Poovai, and then the Awai that feeds the East Wiley, um, or the Wiley 
Karahui. Um, that is an elevation of about 140 feet, 160 feet, somewhere in that range. Um, actually, the Awai starts at about 120 feet. So um, there is a, I'm trying to emphasize is that there are a number of tributaries and the stream is gaining between the USGS stream flow, stream gauging station and the, the location where water was historically utilized. Um, so we can look at low flow statistics from 1914 to 1932 up here, but they don't really relate to how much water is available down here. And unfortunately we don't have a lot of um, measurements or other um, hydrologic data to work with. We do know that rainfall has historically declined um, from 1920 to 19, 2012, annual wet season and dry season all declined according to uh, Fraser and John Beluca. More recently, there's been a substantial decline in dry season rainfall, which has led to um, a decrease in uh, dry season low flows. Um, but again, we don't have any monitoring in Wyoli specifically. What we did do for to develop low flow characteristics is look at all of the nearby gauging stations and develop regression formulas. Um, unfortunately, we are um, about a year behind when USGS or ahead, I guess, uh, when USGS might have their low flow uh, study complete for the whole state. So we're kind of uh, jumping ahead of them. But, uh, Based on the regression formulas, we were able to get really good agreement for median Q50, um, somewhere around base flow or Q70 and low flow Q90. Um, the, the regression model explained using drainage area and mean annual rainfall, um, these uh, flow statistics for all of the uh, index stations for North, North Kauai um, and the regression formulas were fairly accurate in terms of R squareds, anything above um, 0.8 is pretty good, and, and uh, Nash Sutcliffe efficiency index, anything over 0.6 is pretty good. So these values are um, excellent. Um, that being said, we, we don't have many point measurements to um, verify the information, um, and I'll get to that in just a second. I do want to specify that there is a uh, tributary that flows along the right bank that the monovi transfers water to. And so it's the combination of flow from the main stem and the tributary that contributes to what's available for the AWI. And so that's why I have broken down um, the tributary estimated flows here with CFS on the top and MGD in parentheses. And then the flows in the main stem um, above the mono Y uh, here in CFS and then MGD in parentheses. Um, and then at lower elevations. Uh, and these, again, are estimates based on regression formulas, and we have very few data points um, at, this, at these elevations to verify this, but um, this is the best information we have. So to simplify the uh, plumbing diagram, if you will, the historic USGS station is up here. Um, the estimated flows, the tributary and the main stem are right here. We have the monovi that diverted water into the tributary, the poovi at the start of the Awai or the East Wyoli Ditch, and then the East Wyoli Ditch uh, transferred water throughout um, the, the low E complexes. There are many of them. Um, and I'll get into in-stream uses in just a second. Um, the proposed IIFS location would be at the confluence between these two um, because it would wreck um, would uh, capture the restoration of flow past this diversion, but also what's available in the main stem that's not diverted. So we do, as I had briefly mentioned, we do have some point measurements uh, made recently. So um, sea worm staff measured in Wiley Stream at, above the Monovi and in the, um, at the Awai um, in 2019. Um, recently, uh, or last year, USGS took a few measurements downstream, um, kind of near where the IIFS would be located. Um, those measurements are right here. The, um, for the, the Hui, um, they have a, a hydro, hydrologic consultant that has taken a number of measurements in Wyoli Stream above the Monovi again, in the tributary, and then in the Awai. And I put 
the flows at Wainiha stream and the percent flow duration value for reference, um, mostly because uh, it's, it's key to understand that uh, certain flow measurements were made when um, just following fairly high flow events. So mean daily flow uh, in Wainiha was um, over twice uh, uh, the long-term uh, flow and that Q value is Q14. Um, same with um, uh, the recent measurements by the consultant, at least in March, um, the flow values in Wyoli uh, reflect here, um, nearby index stations were at Q24 and Q35. So these don't represent necessarily low flow statistics. Um, the, what we do know is that the USGS was able to measure during um, at least two out of three measurements were during low flow um, uh, periods of time as determined by the Wainiha USGS station. Um, similarly, uh, talking with um, the community and, and the consultants uh, in January of 2021, these measurements do reflect fairly low flow conditions. In fact, potentially the lowest flow conditions they've seen recent in recent years. Um, based on conversations with them. So um, these values are um, more reflective right here of what we might expect um, during low flow conditions. So just to um, go back uh, a little bit, 12.3 uh, MGD above the monovi, um, 0.8 in the tributary and 0.6 being diverted. Um, uh, what we estimate that, so this, um, the regression formula is estimated about 11.8 or 12 MGD as medium flow. So, and then you know, 0.29 MGD as um, in the tributary. So, they're not great estimates, but it's the best we have, um, and they're within the ballpark. I would say um, the uh, recommendations moving forward for interim IIFS or interim in-stream flow standards. Um, for Wiley are um, with the understanding that uh, we need to collect more data and potentially make more recommend, uh, amend the recommendation at a, a future time, but that shouldn't stop us from making a, a reasonable decision um, in the near future. So the uh, monovi right here, the poovi right here, and the awai feeds this complex of taro um, uh, or kalo um, throughout Wiley and into the Hanalei um, area. Um, the, the actual um, operation of the color production, I'm going to leave to the next presentation. I'm not going to get into many details in that. I'm just going to briefly touch on the in-stream values as identified by commission staff. Here's the um, Wiley stream above the Monovi um, post-2018 flood. So um, one of the, the things you can see is that the stream is incised uh, a decent amount. And um, we've had uh, a lot of mobilization of older alluvium moving down slope. So we, um, for every flow event um, subsequent to the 2018 flood, uh, we've seen a lot of boulders move and that movement has um, wreaked havoc on the reconstruction of the monovi and ovi. In 2019, this is the original, um, the location, I should say, of the original monovi. Um, it's, it's completely filled in with boulders. Um, this is a photo, the upstream on the right, downstream on the left. Um, the photo is taken on the left bank. This is the photo, same location, only on the right bank, upstream to the left, downstream to the right. You can see this, this area is just completely filled in with boulders. And so the, in 2019, at least, the operation of the Monovi as originally designed um, was not, not possible. This is the temporary monovi um, that was constructed uh, slightly downstream. You can see um, some water is being diverted back into or diverted into the tributary. Um, but as historical operations and present day, um, the, the farmers tended to only take 50% of the water anyway. Um, so the um, might, you might perceive the lack of efficiency in the diversion, but that's mostly on purpose. It's that you don't wanna take more than 50% of the water. 
Um, more photos of the monovi or temporary monovi um, across the um, area that was just devastated by the flooding in 2018. Um, the flow into the um, tributary right here. And this is the historic monovi and the tributary. As you can see, no water is coming in because it's just completely filled in with boulders. Um, this is the, the tributary and the temporary monovi right here in 2019 at least. Um, as you can see, the tributary does contribute some uh, small amount of water um, and flow. Um, tributary carries or conveys the water diverted from the main stem uh, to the Po'ovi, which is uh, in our database diversion uh, 1412, which is this structure. And the honey boards right here keep the head behind the, the concrete uh, high enough to divert a certain amount of water to the Awai. Um, this is looking downstream right here, and the Awai is flowing off to the right right here. Um, and it's uh, a fairly uh, uh, genius construction in that the as, as high flows rip through here, they continue to carry um, boulders and stuff downstream and don't necessarily clog the Awai unless the flows are such so great that they overtop this um, concrete structure. This is the Awai or East Wyoli Ditch um, in a couple of locations. It was also affected by the flooding in 2018. There were landslides. There's been a lot of siltation issues. Um, they also have a, an issue with a lot of how bush growing in or um, non-native species. Um, and again, I'm not gonna get into details on the operation of this system, um, just that it carries water out to uh, various low E complexes. So to quickly go through um, the in-stream uses of water, uh, other than the um, uh, hollow production uh, part of it, we're going to um, briefly identify that uh, outdoor recreational activities were ranked outstanding um, by the Hawaii Stream Assessment in terms of their diversity and Blue Ribbon resources, their hunting, fishing, swimming, boating, hiking, and scenic views, three high quality experiences. Um, so that in itself is of note. Um, there are also um, uh, you know, greater than 30% of the watershed is considered native forest up in the Malka portion. Um, and four species of threatened endangered birds are found in Wyoming, including wetland bird species. Um, there are a number of pigs and then um, how bush and California grass are problematic. Um, and Wiley stream does not appear on the list of uh, impaired waters, but there are high levels of bacteria during, especially during runoff events, which likely indicate contamination from feral or domestic animals. The Hawaii stream assessment ranked the aquatic biota as substantial, meaning um, at least three species of uh, native species group one and two were identified and, and one or fewer introduced species, uh, introduced species group one was identified. Um, Breakdown is that uh, Awaus is found throughout the estuary and up to the middle reach as expected. Um, Nopili is found in the lower middle reach. Um, Opai is found in the lower middle reach. And um, there is a native macrofauna diversity, more than five species found. Um, so it's, a, it's an excellent stream for protecting um, native uh, aquatic biota. Um, briefly, uh, there have been various estimates of how much Kahlo is uh, in or the acreage of Kahlo in production at any one time um, in certain documents around 35 acres uh, were in production uh, during the registration phase in the late 80s, 113 acres could be, be accounted for, but there might be some duplications because um, some registrations were um, registering acreage that was leased from other landowners. Um, in the 2007 Gingrich report on Kahlo production, um, about 45 acres were estimated to be in production. And then more recently in the um, uh, agricultural water use, not agricultural water use, well, the um, Agriculture survey in 2015 that um, Peroy conducted uh, over 100 acres were in Kahlo production um, using satellite imagery based on their analysis. So it's quite substantial. And in fact, on the Hawaii Stream Assessment, I identified Wiley Stream as one of five uh, or six uh, Ahukua'a that had greater 
than 50 acres of Kahlo in production across the state. And as you can see there, um, uh, Kahlo as far as the eye can see, um, and uh, I'm not gonna get into the specifics of that. Um, I just wanna identify that the IIFS location would be downstream of the confluence between the tributary and the main stem. And that uh, this location is at least uh, measurable. Um, it may not be ideal for monitoring long-term, but um, for making point measurements, it's definitely an adequate location. There's a nice straight channel. Um, the proposed interim in-stream flow standard was based on the estimates of water available at the Monovai and Poovai, um, so in the main stem and tributary combined. So um, at about the 160 foot elevation, there's a, an estimate of 14.7 uh, MGD median flow and 8 GD low flow. Um, the um, base flow would be estimated to be um, uh, uh, about 11.6 MGD. Uh, the interim in-stream flow standard, we were um, proposing 50% uh, of the low flow based on the communications with the um, rural farmers uh, that they only diverted half of the flow anyway um, at any one time. That 50% of the low flow would be uh, about 4 MGD. And this would be measured at the confluence or below the confluence with the tributary. Um, however, this, you know, as, as more data come in, as we need to refine these, this estimate can be modified at a, at a future date. So that's what I had um, in terms of summarizing the in-stream values and the hydrology of uh, Wiley. The um, Terahui is prepared to present on the actual operation of the of color production. Okay, let, let's go ahead and have the presentation for C4 and then we'll take questions and comments. So who, who's presenting on C4? Dr. Sprout. Aloha. Can you all see my screen and hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great. Sorry about that slight delay. Well, aloha mai kako and mahalo for the opportunity to take you all on a virtual huaka'i to Waioli Valley, Kauai, this place of aloha aina. I'm Kapua Spurt and I'm here today in my capacity as a professor of law at the University of Hawaii at Manoa's William S. Richardson School of Law. For several semesters now, it has been our great honor and privilege for our environmental and native Hawaiian law clinics to work with the Waioli Valley Tarahui. We started in the spring of 2019, working on a right of entry and easement for the farmer's mono and have focused our work this semester on the requirements for a long-term water lease, including this IIFS. We are so excited to be here today, which would not be possible without the fabulous kukua of your staff, including Deputy Director Kaleo Manuel and Dr. Aaron Strauch. We'd like to really mahalo them. Um, I have to say it's, I've had the great privilege of working on water issues for over two decades now. And in that time, I believe that this is one of the best examples of interagency coordination in support of natural and cultural resources, traditional and customary native Hawaiian rights and practices and our community. So mahalo for all that you have already done. Our plan for this afternoon is to take you again on a site visit to this place of Aloha Aina. We know it's been a long day, so we will endeavor to keep it short. To start us off, Devin Forrest, who is one of our clinicians and a kupa Aina from Halalea, where we'll share some of our cultural and historical context for this incredibly special place. Then Joanne Kaona, one of our farmers and a board member with the Hui, will walk you through the Lo'i Kalo irrigation system and introduce you to the Hui Kalo. Then the Hui will be available to answer any questions that you may have. To maximize our time together this afternoon, 14 of the farmers have already submitted detailed written testimony and many of them are here to respond to your questions. Unfortunately, given the recent flooding and the fact that only one lane of our highway is open during set times, um, several of them were here waiting but had to leave to pick up kids from school. But um, the rest of us are zooming in here from Kianalani Hale at Waipa, Mahalo Commissioner Beamer. And for the record, I'd just like to note that we have with us here in the room, Chris Kobayashi and Demi Rivera, Reed Yoshida, Dwight Morishige, Joe and Shorty Kaona, and Lily Noe, and um, 
Kahikili and Anad, wrong son. And we have a couple more on the way if the convoy um, is on time. So we are unmasked, but we have all been fully vaccinated and are in the same bubble. So unless there's questions about um, our game plan, I'd just like to turn it over to Devin. Aloha nui kako. I am Devin Kamela Forest from Halelea, from Haena, he come out of Haena. And um, I'm here to talk about Waioli. And Waioli is truly an aina ho henui kaua, a place that is cherished for and by the rain. It is located in Halelea, the northern district of Kauai. And just, you know, without even doing any research or nothing, you know that this place is famous for vai. It's in the name, Waioli, joyous waters. Um, however, by using mele, we can understand how this vai is related to the place, as well as how vai moves within this area. And so these are just some excerpts of mele. Um, it talks about how the vai moves from Pu'upua, which is the where Princeville Hotel is, if any of you guys know, that's that far off point, how the rain moves from that point, comes across and goes all the way into the back valley of Waioli to eventually come down through Kaliko, which is the central waterfall of Namolokama. It also talks about how that vai flows down from Waioli into the neighboring uh, Waipa'ahupua. And so, you know, just that, those little snippets tell us that these vai are interconnected, that this place feeds all these areas, the Vailani, the Vai from the mountain, all of these places help to sustain this, this apana, this kalana. And it's not only through mele, but also mo'olelo. And I think one of the most valuable pieces of mo'olelo is this one about the mo'o of Kauai. So in Kau Mele Mele, um, the mo'o clan travels back, to, comes down to Hawaii, and one of the mo'o, Kiki Ula, decides to reside in Waioli. And she is known as the Mo'o of Hanalei, but she resides in Waioli. And the reason for that being that from Waioli, she can help manage and control all the vai from that area. It is her job to make sure that the vai is clean, that it is flowing and it sustains the people. And, you know, we're blessed, mahalo, you know, blessed, whatever, you know, whatever you can call the mahele, we were blessed from the mahele documents to be able to actually map this relation of vai and so and this uh kalana concept and how this place was managed all the testimonies the lcas the native foreign testimonies all give us a map of how this place how people live where they farm what vai was flowing through it and you know we have four vai names but there's many many more that you know haven't been mapped but it tells us you know for example this uh one of the uh, claimants, Apollo, claimed Lo'i up near the border of Hanalei in Waioli, where the Awai comes in, as well as uh, a parcel by Kanoa, which is the fish pond where um, the Ho'i 7 goes out. And so, you know, that along with Uloa, a bunch of other people that lived along the Awai or the upper reaches where the Lo'i and Awai moved, had places that were near the lower Kai areas of Hanalei, which just gives us that idea that maybe they did that because they needed to manage where flow happened, where things grew, and they could see, you know, the effects of the vai from Malka to Makai. Uh, you know, because of missionary contact, we also have um, newspapers. Newspapers are very valuable. And we know from them that the farmers in Hanalei decided to actually memorialize these, their, their uh, tradition of working together and managing this kalana by creating a farming association. 1860s, the decline of the whaling industry, they decided, okay, we need to make this place more productive. So how are we gonna do this? And so they got together as they usually would do probably in the ancient times and figured out a way, created some kind of association to manage the area. And that's what this is. It is a kalana and the best evidence of this practice is that it's being perpetuated now that this, all this mapping, all these things that were, have been talked about in historical documents, it still persists today. Mm -hmm. And it's not only done here in Hanalei, um, where I'm from, Haena, we have the same type of management thing. Three valleys, Nauwe, Manoa, and Limohuli, all are managed by single ohana, different ohana, and it's 
the same thing. All these three river valleys need best management practices to manage the, the fishing resources, manage the vital resources in order to farm well. Similarly, with Waioli, Waipa, and Hanalei, they all share the same fishery and the same plain, floodplain to um, best serve the people. And mahalo to um, modern day graphics. And now we can actually see you know, that nothing has really changed from the ancient maps. That till today, the same ho'i are there, the same streams are there, um, and the same system is there. You know, little tweaks here and there because, you know, time has changed. You got to change the oil in the car. You got to change the pipes. And that is where we're at. This is, this system has been perpetually done and perpetually cared for by these, these people and for, from time immemorial. But of course, as I said before, Waioli is a place that is cherished by the Ua and sometimes it loves us too hard. And when, you know, when the Ua loves us too hard, we have floods. And that's why we're here today. You know, floods came, broke down this old system. And from that, we learned that, you know, that the Vai comes from conservation land and that in order to fix or do anything, we have that the farmers have to actually go through the 171 process. And so here we are at this green dot hoping that you will um, pass the IIFS so that we can continue and perpetuate this, um, this ancient system. And now I'll turn it over to Joanne so she'll take you to the full huaka'i on the ground. Aloha, I'm Joanne Kaona. I have my dad farm on a kuleana in Waioli right here. Well, I would love to show you in person. I'm going to do my best to share our low e kalo irrigation system virtually. This map shows some of the basic components. Here's our mono, the bright pink circle closest to the bottom of the map. This is our first intake from Waioli Stream. Though, as I'll explain later, as a result of recent flooding, we now have several mono. And you can see a red pentagon right above the pink dot. If you follow the pink line from the bottom of the page upwards, that's our Awai flowing Makai towards Mahamoku, Hanalei Bay. Our Awai has several branches. The first feeds Uncle Bobby, Auntie Chris, Nathaniel, Arohana's Lo'i, and Kimo as well. Another flows to the right of your screen and feeds what we call the Shitoai area, where Reed, Uncle Dwight, Uncle Tanji, Uncle Ofuk, and others farm. There is also the third branch, what we call the split, that flows towards Sierra's Lo'i, and that is where some of the tributaries flow into and mix with Waioli water. This slide shows with pictures how water flows through our mono, Po'o and Awai, then into our Lo'i, then back to either Waioli stream or the lower reaches of the Hanalei River through eight Ho'i. I want to highlight that our use of water is in-stream and non-consumptive, as you know. Food flow is key for farmers like us. All of our use is within the Kalana where our water supply originates. Waioli Stream always has flow and connectivity as we farmers and other community members rely on the streams and bay to feed us. This is part of our ice spot. In the photo on the top, you see our mono as it was before in the 2018 floods with one of our farmers, Uncle Dimi, repairing it. And you see it below that after the 2018 floods completely filled with boulders. The County of Kauai and our mayor in particular have been awesome. Together with our island rep and senator, they have helped to secure emergency funds for the county to contract and repair our mono and awai. Unfortunately, flooding this winter and spring further damaged the mono eye. Though it's still flowing, the blue arrow shows the flow of water diverted by the mono towards the Po'o'ai after our mono was repaired, and then later after floods this past winter. Red lines indicate the repaired mono. So some of these pictures are gonna look different than the ones that Aaron showed, and that's because a lot has changed. It got fixed, and then it broke, and then it got fixed, and then it broke, <laughs> and that is what's happening. But as a result of the 2018 floods, another mono opened on its own, and also supplies water to our po'o'ai. In fact, now we have several mono feeding our po'o'. 
In the top picture, water from the mono flows makai towards our po'oi. You can see Aaron in his orange jacket documenting our po'o. In the middle pic, water from the mono flows both into our awai on the left and back to the main branch of the Waioli stream on the right. The bottom picture shows how even our po'o has been damaged by recent flooding. This is just one example of how our river is changing with the severe and more frequent floods. There is also a tributary from the Hanalei side that feeds Waioli near the first mono. This is another example of why this area is a kalana. Our water and other resources are all connected. Here you see our awai. On the left, you see it flowing to the right to Shitoai. The picture on the right shows the same stretch for the Malka. The farmers did a tremendous amount of maintenance, and I would note that the county's 2020 repairs means that besides our mano, our system is the best shape that it's been in in a while, extremely efficient. As you can see from this map, eight Ho'i return water to Waioli Stream and Hanlei River. Those are the pink diamonds. Six return to various stretches of Waioli Stream and two return to lower reaches of Hanlei River. All feed Mahamoku or Hanalei Bay, all are within our Kalana. I'd also highlight the yellow line flowing right to left closer to Hanalei Bay. Historically, that was an Awai about 40, or so years ago, the county closed the open ditch that ran along Kuhio Highway. So now it's piped and no longer managed by the farmers. This map shows how the whole year returned water within our Kalana. In blue on the left, water from those Lo'i all go back to Waioli. The section in pink on the right goes back to Hanalei. The cross hash purplish section in the middle goes to Waioli, but there's also connections so it can go into Hanalei. Our hui is a, I mean, our hui <laughs> is about a dozen small family farmers with generational ties to this area. Today, with me in this room, we have third to fifth generation farmers. Although we always collaborate on work days and maintenance, we did not formally organize until after the 2018 floods, when it became clear that ent our entire way of life was at risk. We are now a state nonprofit with federal federal tax exempt status, which holds our permits and insurance. Farms range in size from half an acre to about eight acres. But the truth of the matter is that for us in Waioli, aloha aina is in our bones, our DNA, it's what guides us. For families like ours and so many generations working together and farming on the very same parcels, we do this as a way of life, a cultural practice, and to feed our communities. As one example, you saw the testimony from the Watari Taiho Kurilo Ohana, three generations in one family still farming together. As just one example, this is me and my dad on our family Kuliana, farming defines our ohana and is also how we contribute to our community. My dad is now 85 and he's been farming this land since he was about five. As long as I can remember, he goes there to the lo'i every single day. This is aloha aina in action, not talking about it or planning for it, but just doing it. Each of the families in our hui have very similar stories. In fact, nearly all the farmers were raised growing kalo in Waioli and learning the practice from parents, grandparents, and even great-grandparents. For us, makahana kaike, the learning is in the doing. We practice and perpetuate kalo farming best practices specific to Waioli. As I mentioned earlier, the same families have been working together and farming for generations. We kilo, we observed, and adapt. For over a century, we have been managing our resources to support cultural practices and kalo in particular. On Molokai, people talk about aina momona. In Halelea, we strive to ho'olako, to have enough, and enough to share with others. Our little hui aims to feed kama aina, to sustain a relationship-based economy and shared values of aloha aina. Aloha for each other and aloha for our land and water. Research by OHA dated our lo'i kalo to the 1500s. Part of our practice is to care for this very special place. We regularly monitor our water levels, like every single day. We don't have a gauge in our awai, but we know by looking at the water level, whether it's pono for the stream and our lo'i. In all of the measurements that have been taken since the flood, the po'o has been taking less than half of the stream's flow. We also regularly maintain our farms and larger lo'i kalo systems, including the stream when it needs it. In Waioli, our environment is changing, climate change is real. 
We are seeing more frequent and severe storms and floods. This is what things look like in February and March. And this is part of why Aaron doesn't have more low flow missions. <laughs> We had to cancel a lot of trips because of flooding. And then there's the landslide that closed Kuhio Highway. And here are two of the same pictures from the last slide on top with photos taken in January on the bottom. So you can see what the area normally looks like. Note the tea leaves on the right and the shed on your left. In the picture on the top right, Waioli Stream is near the top of the photo by the Hau Bush. And you could see it flowing parallel to Kuhio Highway and the coast not Mauka to Makai. My point is that the 2018 was bad, flood was bad, but we have also seen significant devastation this year. So that is part of what we're dealing with here in Waioli in this era of climate change. But despite all that, our Waioli farmers are resilient and will persevere. Here in Waioli is Aloha Aina. These are some of the lyrics of a song that Ui Tanigawa Lam composed during her second trip to Waioli. Ugi's Mele celebrates and honors this incredibly special place where we live, Aloha Aina. If you hadn't, haven't heard it yet, you should check it out on Kulia Mahi City. Mahalo. And mahalo for this opportunity to share. As Devin mentioned at the outset, the Hui is seeking a numeric interim in-stream flow standards so that we can apply for a long-term water lease under HRS 171. As you saw from the written testimony that the Hui members submitted, we stand in strong support of Aaron's recommendation. And I would note that with respect to monitoring, the farmers have the farmers would ask that you authorize the Hui to work with Deputy Director Manuel and Aaron to craft a reporting schedule and requirements that are appropriate for this in-stream use and public trust purpose. More specifically, we'd like to ask that the requirement be quarterly as opposed to monthly. And finally, our water resources here are interconnected and managed as a single unit across Ahupua'a boundaries. And we ask that you honor and support our efforts to maintain and perpetuate this ancient system of Kalana. With that, the farmers are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Mahalo. Thank you so much. That was a great presentation, wonderful information, very well presented. So thank you all so much for that. All right, uh, uh, questions, commissioners? I can, um, I, I can start. Um, thank you so much, uh, Professor Sproat and, and the Hui out there. Um, I'm jealous you guys are in Halilea. Uh, it's a beautiful place, but we get plenty of beautiful places. But, you know, uh, deeply, you know, just mahalo and inspired in, you know, the ways in which you folks kind of bridge the uh, historical documents and looking at mele and, you know, really trying to honor um, our traditional resource management practices of our kupuna and, and make them, they are relevant to today, to today, but I'm not sure I've seen that in a, in a presentation um, for sea worm before. So, um, so thank you for that cutting edge work and, um, you know, uh, one thing that the commission, so I think we can deeply learn from the Kala farmers there uh, with, with you folks in Waioli and, you know, better understand the ecological benefits, you know, of the opai and uh, the opu and, and other things and these relationships. And that's, you know, the beauty of you talking about non-consumptive uses and documenting these ho'i and, and this practice of, of moving water through Kalana. Um, so, Thank you for that. I, um, every place is unique. Every place is different. But you folks are so resilient through these floods, <laughs> working together, um, and and now forming a five hundred one c three, you know, to to ho'omau these practices. Um, what, what what can the commission learn about working with other communities um, to to move initiatives like this forward? How can we learn from your guys' resilience and experience? Because it, you know, um, what a beautiful thing to see, you know, um, our, our communities galvanizing together and um, restoring Aina. So how do you guys do it? <laughs> well, I will start. Everyone is scrambling here because everyone wants to answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, okay Jill, we'll start. Okay. There is no way us farmers would be able to do it without Kapua and the many, many law students and all of our um, friends along the way. 
I mean, I, I do think this has been an incredible opportunity. I mean, as, as Joe mentioned with the clinic, so we've run this clinic four times and over the past two years, no, well, that yeah, actually two years, we've had 33 students and four attorneys spend thousands of hours um, working on all of the various compliance efforts. And it's been an incredible educational opportunity for our students um, and for me and Ui, who is also here um, with the group. So it's been a great privilege for us and, and a great partnership. And I think in many ways, you know, we have been able to bring together, we've worked very closely with Ian Hirakawa and Linda Chow and the staff at the Department of Natural Resources. Poor Aaron, I have him on speed dial. Um, we talk all the time, but it really has been, I think the coordination has helped between the various agencies and entities to see how we can all kokua. And I have to mahalo um, our leaders here, the mayor and um, Senate President Kochi and Nadine Nakamura, our representative have been huge in providing funding. We could not have recovered. I mean, you saw the picture of the po'oi after the 2018 flood. There was pretty much no po'oi. There was no water coming out. And Mayor Kawakami came down with a bunch and himself and was like moving rocks. I mean, it's just been a real kako um, bottom up effort. And I think that's part of what has made it successful. But I think the communication has been great, the funding and support from outside folks. And really it's the expertise of the farmers that all of us are, are building upon, right? I mean, my our clinic calls the Huya legal unicorn um, because it is. I mean, how, you know, in most places and most people that come before you, we're seeking restoration so that people can farm again. Here you have families who for four to six generations have been working together, all of these families. And so it's just, it's an honor to be a part of it. And, and I really wanna thank without Aaron's Poku, I mean, the measurements that we have in, in 2019 are from him. And he endeavored to come out, I don't know, three, four or five times, but it rained here for like two months. And then, <laughs> so, um, uh, hard, so. hard not to be convinced to go to Halilea though. So um, <laughs> super enticing. Um, so one, one like kind of, I think thing that we've discussed as a commission that maybe you folks can help us to understand, you know, as we're sometimes in our deliberations, we're thinking about what, shared collective kind of management of water looks like and you know in some places it's highly contested and you know we worry hey you know is one farmer going to argue with the other you know how if we restore the stream you know do we have to get in there and, and mitigate every dispute between individuals um and 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 yet here you folks have been farming for so long and what an example. So how, how do you, is there anything you can share about that? I mean, are, are our fears unwarranted or is, is Halilea that beautiful and unique? Everybody smiling and <laughs> getting along. Um, my name is Reed Yoshida. I'm one, I'm one of the farmers. And the president. And the president of our <laughs> Um, You know what? I think our situation is, is pretty unique because as you guys are saying, you know what? Would you guys have to come in and mitigate whatnot? Not saying that over the generations it's been smooth, um, but I think our situation is different because when you look at all the generations, you know, our uncles were all friends, our grandparents were friends, our great grandparents were friends, and so yeah, I mean, you're gonna have butting heads as far as oh, what's gonna happen? But again, our situation because the families have gone back together for so long that it's kind of like everybody's family little squabbles and we just figure it all out. And we've always done it that way. Um, you know, we honestly, if we had to try to pull this whole thing off with this IIFS and all these permitting and whatnot, there's no way as, as a group, we would have been able to do it. And, you know, we were fortunate enough with Kapoor and her group that were able to bridge that gap and get the information from us. Um, Cause I'm sure you guys all know, as far as getting through any of the rules and regulations, all the permitting that is required, which agency you have to go to, who you have to talk to. I mean, we struggle enough with just trying to keep the tower growing. Um, so I, it was it was very helpful that Kapoor's group was able to actually bridge that gap. Because um, honestly, prior to the 2018 flood, I would have never thought we would even be close to being organized the way we are right now. Um, as far as organized on paper, instead of just being, you know, 12 families that have go back hundred years. Um, so that's always gonna be the, the, the struggle, but I get your point as far as, oh, you know, you, would you guys have to come in and mitigate it? 
but I think our situation is a little bit different. Um, yeah. 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 And no, I, mahalo. That was, go ahead, Kapoor. I would just like to add very briefly that, you know, so the, the farmers have been incredibly resilient. They have been incredibly willing to tackle really impossible and, and difficult situations. And so what I would, cons you know, this year there was a bill in the legislature to exempt in-stream, in-watershed um, use of water for traditional kala cultivation from 171. And I would say that even though these farmers are the model of how compliance work can be done, they should not have had to go through this process to do a DEA, to do a, I mean, Every community needs a Kapua sprout that lives there and is happy to do this work for her peeps. Um, my grandma went to church with Chris's mom. I mean, it's a small community here, right? But but they should not have had to endure this process and really run this gauntlet, which they have done incredibly successfully. And so well, we are happy to hold them up and celebrate that. And we're grateful for the work and partnership of Aaron and Ian and Kaleo and Linda Chow and so many other people. I hope that other Kala farmers or other traditional customary Native Hawaiian practitioners actually more broadly should not have to endure such efforts because although it's been a great learning experience for my students, it's also been incredible that respectfully, these farmers are the experts about how water use and watershed management and all of that stuff in white oldie should be. I mean, you folks should just ask them, hey, Reed, hey, Chris, hey, Uncle Bobby, how much water do you folks need? Because they know when we went. Four generations, he knows exactly what needs to be done to Malama the stream and to Malama the Lo'i. And so I think in so many ways, this is um, a great example and we're, again, we're grateful for the partnership and, and we look forward to continuing to work closely with Aaron and Khalil um, so that we can see this all the way through to fruition. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Commissioner Katayama. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Kapuna, of the low stream flows that uh, is identified in the IFS 8 million, what do the farmers actually use? in terms of uh, daily flow? What is the highest amount? That's a great question. They, and it's about half, um, you know, in, in, and that varies depending upon, you know, how this, as, as you all well know over time. So, so these farmers actually miraculously for all of the farms, declarations of water use were filed and not just that, but they were actually verified. And so in, 1989 when they filed and then when the verifications were made between 1993 and 94 they recorded a, a water use of 13.5 million gallons per day and so that was about what was being used although if you go back and actually read the declarations all of them note that they were short i mean this is a significant amount of kalo that's cultivated and we're so lucky that the families and this community is so tight that people work together, that they share. I mean, the farmers are actually like, I cannot take too much because then Uncle Tanji is not going to get or Uncle Afuk's not going to get. They work together to repair the exactly. Hawaii. Yeah. And so it's a real model in so many ways. But the truth of the matter is we don't know. After, three years after the floods, we are still in basic recovery mode here in Halalea. I mean, if I had to guess, um, and I would, I would encourage any of the farmers to correct me, but I would say less than half of the acreage has been put back into cultivation. I mean, for three years, they've been working on DEAs and IFSs and revocable permits and, and you know, perpetual easements, and, and they need to be able to finish and focus on restoring their farms and their homes. So in, in their dream world, are they looking at about 100 acres of kalo you know, under this system? Historically, it was about 100 acres of kalo, but I would note that, you know, the flooding in 2018 was bad and the flooding that we've had since then has been worse in some ways. The river completely rerouted itself. And so we have some lo'i that now will no longer able to be cultivated. One example, Uncle Bobby Watari's land, which is riparian. Now there's about six acres that the river runs straight through. Mm -hmm. um, and so it cannot be fallowed. So as part of this recovery effort, we will be able to determine what will actually be able to be restored and planted again. Um, because what we're seeing with the worsening floods is that it may continue to change over time. I don't think anybody can appreciate the ordeal that the North Shore residents have gone through in the last two years. So 
although I'm on the other side of the bridge, I still uh, appreciate your resiliency and hang it tough in there. And, and we welcome you. you. If you would ever like to come and visit, we would be happy to um, show you around this beautiful place. Thank you. I think uh, Mr. Buck was next and then Mr. Hannes. Hey, real quick, uh, Kapua, uh, how come you're going through 171 a water license rather than traditional and cultural under the water code? Commercial, is that because of the commercial aspect? It's not. I actually, that's an excellent point that you make, Commissioner Buck. Um, you know, so we are going through the 171 process because the mono and the away and um, the po'o are on in conservation land. So the source of the diversion is in conservation land. It comes through the cultivation is all on private land that is zoned ag. And so that is why 171, although you make an important point, you know, I, I feel like the farmers have made a very strong showing with respect to their pertinent rights. And to the degree that the Water Commission recognizes those rights in May or whenever you take this up for decision-making, that would be helpful because as you all well know, 174C63 makes clear that a permit application based upon an appurtenant right, you know, should be granted upon application. So I think there is, you know, there is room for discussion around that, but, um, but it's because the mono is on conservation land. Mr. Hannes. Yes, uh, aloha to all of you, uh, the hui, the model for that wonderful testimony and special aloha to you, Kapoor, for your leadership there. And please extend my uh, aloha to your family. And by the way, if you're in Kilauea, would you please give my granddaughter a hug, a hug for me? Um, you know, we, this work you're doing has been so critical, not only in Halilea, but I know in Navaeha and so forth. And I think when I look at the success of groups like Kua, with Limu and 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 uh, local Ia and the near shore work, I think it's time, you know, to to kind of make this as kind of a not just a, a a good example, but a model for what we should be doing across the Paiaina. And I wonder if uh, Kahuliao in con consultation with uh, the agencies could really work with communities to establish this, because in in a, in a prior matter or before us, we're, we're talking about hosting a, a symposium to bring the parties together at cost and at time and so forth. And it, it, what's really clear here is it's, it's natural. It's part of your way of doing business in Halalea. And it's not just the, the farmers and the community-based groups, but it's the government agencies and it's the landowners. And, you know, obviously without, you know, the Wilcoxes and so forth, they're, they're really critical to this as well. And to have them be a party to this, to set an example for other landowners across the, the state that they don't need to fear this and that there's ways that we can cooperate to the mutual benefit of our, not only of our financial and, and property interests, but to our community interests, to be a much stronger, better place to live, right? That is resilient in times of crisis where everybody works together, that ho'olako is, is kind of the, their way of life as well. So I would, you know, uh, no, no questions, I guess, except just to encourage to, to express how pleased we are by the presentation and how wonderful it would be for this to be kind of a standard of how business and relationships develop around water across the plan. Mahalo, Commissioner Hannes. I think that's precisely right. And we do hope that this will be a model and that decision makers like you and like the land board can look at what's happening um, in places like Waioli and say, okay, well, we understand that, you know, look at Waioli, the stream, the mulibai comes out in Waipa and we have Ho'i that return water to, to Hanalei. And so of course, we're not gonna look so strictly at Ahupua'a boundaries, but are gonna respect the way the community has always managed these resources, you know, for the benefit of the community. And I think it's an incredible inspiration and um, exactly the kind of indigenous knowledge that I think can aid us, especially in this time of climate crisis. Uh, okay, we, we do have a little bit of uh, public testimony on both these items. I'm just going to um, ask people now um, if they want to add comments. Alexa Deiki. Aloha, Chair Case and Commissioners. I will be very brief because you already had a long day. And thankfully, Professor Sprott already mentioned the points I wanted to highlight um, because I'm uh, a student in the Native Hawaiian Rights Clinic, but I'm also a student in the Administrative Law. Um, uh, class dismissed, so that's why 
I've submitted testimony as well for this and also already testifying here. And I really want to highlight that this is like such a great example of like an interagency collaboration, a partnership with the community. And I would hope like after learning administrative law that it would always go this way. So the points I wanted to highlight that Professor Sprouse already mentioned is that the Hui really for us is the legal unicorn and how different this IFS is because here we are um, protecting and strengthening uh, traditional customary native Hawaiian rights. And unlike all the other, um, because for me, I, I live on, I'm from Germany, but I live on Mau Maui is my home. And like all the IFS there and conflicts I've seen there and testified on were always about like restoring streams and we're doing something very different here. Um, the only ask I've had, um, chair case last year at the BLNR meeting for the Hui's perpetual easement and RP, you mentioned that what we're trying to do here is fit an old system into a new legal system. And I completely agree. And what I propose is like how we can best do that is to uh, amend this IFSS in May because then the Hui can finally move forward and take the next step and getting the board lease. And what I would like to ask the commission is to make an explicit finding uh, of the who is a pertinent and traditional and customary native Hawaiian rights. And Aaron actually already has that laid out in his staff submittal. Um, so the who is excited to work closely with Aaron and uh, give him any additional info he needs. Um, but provided that this will not hold up the process and that we'll have the amended IFS in, in May. Thank you. Thank you for that. Appreciate that. Uh, okay, Uilani Tanigawa Lam. I'm a post JD fellow at Kahuliao. Um, I just really want to take the time um, to say mahalo for your time today. Um, and thank you for your, um, especially to Aaron and Kaleo for your work on this. Um, and really express my support and and um, support for the, the farmers of the Waioli Valley, Tarahui. So mahalo nui. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Fernandez. Hi, everybody. Yeah. Um, just thank you all so much for all the work you've done for us. Um, for the most part, I'd like to just stand on my testimony. The one thing I'll add, similar to Alexa's point um, about fitting um, an old system into this new legal system. And I think this is a perfect example of drawing upon um, the knowledge that the ancestral knowledge they contain to figure out how to better the current legal system we have. So, yeah. And then also to the farmers, shout out to you all. Thank you so much for everything. So, yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Um, Chair, could I just make one quick comment? Um, I'm sorry, I have to get my daughter from her school right now. So I'm going to call in from my phone and log off on my computer. And I might just keep my video off for a while. But this has been super informative. Thank you. OK, uh, Jonathan Lee K.K. Shoyer. Aloha again, commissioners. I'm here again for DHHL. Just very briefly, it's a small, much smaller part of this effort, but um, the Hui your staff um, work very closely with DHHL because a water lease from state lands was potentially implicated in this effort that calls for the establishment of a reservation of water if needed by DHHL, as well as potentially um, leasing fees. And we worked closely with the Hui and your staff through a beneficiary consultation as noted in Aaron's submittal. Um, and the Hawaiian Homes Commission voted to um, not seek any reservation of water from this stream and seek no licensing fee in lieu of a licensing fee, seek educational opportunities for our beneficiaries, particularly the uh, community of Anahola, which is actually very peely to the communities in Waiole. So um, we're very supportive of both the presentations by the Hui and the staff submittal from Dr. Strzok. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think that's it. Uh, did I get everybody who wanted to speak? Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. This is a info. These are both informational briefings, so they're not decision items, but we are very well informed and uh, really appreciate everyone's efforts, especially uh, having the uh, testimony from.
this place. It's it, that's that's particularly uh, heartwarming. So thank you so much. Well, Chair Case, do, do, do we have an expected date of when the IFSs will will show back up on our agenda? Uh, Commissioner Buck, I'll take that. Um, we and working with community, um, it was really based on this conversation today. So it sounds like um, there's really no question specific to uh, Dr. Strzok's recommendation as presented. And so um, what we'll do is we'll bring it back next month for approval um, or an action item from the commission. Um, hearing the testimony today, we will look at the recommendation on whether or not to add a, an item um, to uh, recognize the pertinent rights or, or tradition customary practices as articulated and defined in, in the staff submittal. So we'll add though, that to the discussion, but there will be action presented to the commission next month. We'll plan for next month. Yep. Um, Great. Thank you. All right, we're moving to our last agenda item, uh, C5. Please go ahead. All right, Chair, let, can we, um, we'll let people out and then um, I think it's, we have to bring in people for C5. Okay. Thank you so much for everything. So yeah, thank you all. All right, I think you're good to go. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, Aaron Strauch with the Stream Protection and Management Branch. Um, you're going to hear a lot of me. Um, this, uh, for information only, is the status of the request for a surface water reservation of 2 million gallons per day for the Department of Hawaiian Homelands from Honoko House Stream for their Honoko Vai um, pl uh, regional plan uh, in West Maui. In um, uh, Simultaneously, the establishment of interim in-stream flow standards for Honokohau and Kalua Nui streams, which are in the surface water hydrologic unit of Honokohau, and then the Honolua stream, surface water hydrologic unit of Honolua. And again, this is for information only um, to, um, to provide you with an update and where we're going. To, Briefly reorient you, um, as this is, I believe, my third presentation on Honokohau to this commission in the last two years. Um, the Honokohau Hydrologic Unit on the North Shore or North portion of West Maui, um, and Honolulu is right next to it. Um, the Honokohau or Honolulu Ditch starts at about 825 feet in elevation at this uh, Diversion 770 or Aotaki Weir as it's commonly known and um, historically brought water to Kapalua, Napili, um, Honokawai and uh, Lahaina areas uh, for both um, pineapple plantation um, irrigation needs and sugarcane plantation needs. Um, currently, Mahinahina Water Treatment Facility is the uh, largest single user of water from the Honokohau Ditch located right here. Um, briefly, uh, and I apologize, this timeline is not brief, but um, the USGS released their low flow study for West Maui in 2014, addressing streams from Honolulu to Ukamehame. In 2003, USGS released their low flow study for Honokohau, both of which will be relied upon for um, this submittal or this um, informational briefing. Um, in 2017, Seaworm staff initiated field work to study in-stream uses in West Maui. Um, we uh, had a number of public meetings and stakeholder uh, meetings. And in um, 2018, um, the, uh, what we call the West Maui Surface Water Users Meeting, we initiated, this was uh, about the same time or just before major floods occurred in um, following Hurricane Lane and Hurricane Olivia. Um, uh, those floods damaged infrastructure related to the surface water irrigation system. Um, because of that damage and the subsequent um, uh, uses uh, or the, the lack of control over the, the infrastructure, um, the, a formal complaint was filed with the commission in uh, April, 2019. 
Um, in later in July, we uh, released our draft in-stream flow assessment report for Honokoha and Honolulu. Um, we did a couple of follow-up meetings, including um, in all of the water users together again. We held a public fact gathering meeting in September 2019. In November of 2019, um, in Lahaina, we brought uh, uh, this issue to the commission uh, to address the complaint and the commission issued certain uh, modifications necessary to upgrade the system, including the formal abandonment of diversion 768 and 769 on Honolulu and Kalua Nui streams, respectively. Um, more recently, uh, commission staff have been um, consulting with Maui D uh, Department of Water Supply and DHHL and Maui Land and Pine re regarding management and utilization of the water delivery system or Honokohau Ditch. Um, and we have been following up with the uh, items that the commission uh, addressed in their, in their 2019 order, um, including um, uh, modifications to the intake and, and monitoring. Um, more recently, we've followed up with the uh, co consulting with DHHL regarding interim in-stream flow standards and their non-potable water reservation, um, which will be addressed here. Um, so, my timeline is to talk briefly about the formal complaint, the DHHL reservation specifically, water uses of Honoko House Stream, and then um, recent field work, including some uh, more in-depth analysis of uh, water flows, uh, specific monitoring efforts that we've been doing, and then um, formal recommendations to address the formal complaint. Um, I kind of went over the waste complaint, uh, but in order to address certain aspects of the waste complaint, including a lack of control over the intake resulting in water diverted in excess of the needs of, this, of uh, the non-potable water needs, um, and then the lack of flow in Honokaha stream affecting in-stream uses, uh, the Water Commission installed monitoring below the Honokaha system in Honokaha stream at McDonald's Dam. Uh, in 2018, and then in Honokaha Ditch at Mahinahina in 2019, and then in Honokaha Ditch at, at its six um, in um, really close to the intake uh, later in 2019. And so some of the uh, information that I will discuss will be uh, the data gathered by these stations. So to briefly uh, um, remind you of the commission order from 2019, uh, the commission ordered Maui Land and Pine to submit a stream diversion works permit to abandon diversion 769 on Honolulu stream. That permit was then approved in September of 2020. Uh, similarly, a uh, stream diversion works permit to abandon uh, the diversion on Kalua Nui stream and similarly approved in September 2020. The commission ordered the replacement of existing damaged intake at Eotaki Weir on Honoka stream with one that can be remotely operated has not currently been accomplished. Um, the commission ordered real-time metering of each distribution point from Honokoha Ditch. Uh, we've learned that metering has been installed in early 2021, um, although I have not seen the specific data. Uh, and then in consultation with Maui Department of Water Supply, uh, the commission ordered uh, Maui Land and Pine to submit a plan that includes a maintenance or replacement of Honokahua siphon. And as part of the recently signed new per water purchase agreement, Maui Land and Pine and Maui Department of Water Supply will um, have a memorandum of understanding that they will monitor for leaks and maintain the siphon and coordinate its replacement when necessary. And at the moment, we don't believe um, that is uh, the case. So as uh, repairs are needed moving forward, um, they will coordinate the, the um, that work. Just to remind you what um, the main diversion on Honokoha stream, um, Take number one, our Aotaki Weir um, is this large concrete dam across the stream channel. Um, sometimes there's flow over the dam. Um, this is the intake prior to damage by the um, flooding in 2018. Um, this is the, the intake uh, silted in with uh, some damage following the flooding. Um, other uh, photos, I want to specifically show you, the, this is the control gate at the head of the ditch where um, historically the, uh, these, this control gate could be raised and lowered to reduce or increase the amount of water diverted into the ditch. Um, that structure is not operational. 
and um, based on uh, consult consultations with uh, Maui Land and Pines consultant, um, it would be uh, not practical to replace. Um, so we were working with Maui Land and Pine and their uh, consultant to um, look at alternatives to um, replacing infrastructure in order to get water back into the stream. So that is a little bit about the complaint. Um, now we'll move on to the DHHL reservation. Um, this is uh, Lahaina, uh, Pukoli'i area. Um, this is a uh, uh, Honokawai uh, Gulch is right here. This is the Lahaina Wastewater Reclamation Facility. The in, outlined in yellow um, are the state lands that are owned by DHHL or managed by DHHL. Um, up here is the Mahinahina Water Treatment Facility and the reservoir. This Honokovai Reservoir at about the 300 foot elevation has recently been sold from Maui Land and Pine to Maui County. There is also a reservoir up here, Field 140 Reservoir, which is owned by Maui Land and Pine. I'll show you photos later. And uh, up above that is a state owned reservoir. So the DHHL reservation is, um, has been updated uh, recently in consultation with their constituents um, to address the need for subsistence agriculture. And there is a um, broken down uh, about 347 acres dedicated to subsistence agriculture, 14 acres dedicated to supplemental agriculture, 17 acres dedicated to communal agriculture, and 30 acres dedicated to parks. Um, and in their reservation request, um, uh, DHHL specified the um, water use rate, which um, is reasonable for the um, arid region that Honokawai is um, based on our use of IWRES or, or the um, modeling software that we use to estimate irrigation demand. Um, so the total water demand for all of these uses is just under two uh, million gallons per day. And so the, um, therefore the reservation is two million gallons per day. I do wanna point out just um, for um, consistency, the um, use of the same agricultural irrigation uh, rate for land designated as parks might not be um, appropriate. Uh, I'm not saying um, we need to modify it, but um, in previous discussions with the commission, uh, 2,500 gallons per acre per day have been used for um, golf course and park uh, irrigation. Um, and so that's uh, a point that the commission might want to deliberate on is, um, do you want to um, substitute uh, this irrigation rate for 2,500 gallons per acre per day? Um, so if so, the reservation would drop down to 1.91 um, MGD. So it doesn't make a large difference, but I just um, want to point that out if, if the commission wanted to be consistent. So. Other non-in-stream uses of Honokawai stream water, um, Honokohau stream water, um, include the uh, landscape irrigation needs of the um, gentleman estates in Kapalua water surface area, and the golf course irrigation needs, and the uh, resort irrigation needs. There's some small agriculture that's dependent on this water as well. Um, and this is, uh, the water duties that um, Maui Land and Pine submitted to commission staff in 2019. Um, we haven't had an update for 2020 um, related to uh, a number of reasons, but um, the breakdown is, um, without going into all the details, is about 0.7 MGD for golf courses, um, 0.8 MGD for resort irrigation and common area landscaping, 0.13 for other, which includes agriculture and cemetery and gardens and stuff. And then about 0.6 MGD system loss. And then the um, recently signed um, uh, water purchase agreement for Department of Water Supply for up to 2.5 MGD, um, which results in about four and a half million gallons per day of total existing demand right now. Um, the Kapalua Water Company, which wasn't was recently sold to Hawaii Water Service. Um, so while this says Kapalua Water Company, it's now um, more appropriate to refer to it as Hawaii Water Service. Uh, there are three potable wells, two of which have existing pumps and um, fairly large pump capacities. Although the current um, 12-month moving average around 
million gallons or just over half a million gallons per day. There is capacity in the existing infrastructure to supply groundwater to meet some of the non-potable water needs if needed. Maui Department of wa uh, Water Use and Development uh, Plan, Maui DWS Water Use and Development Plan, um, based on the Lahaina and Apili system, which includes two surface water sources and nine wells um, with a mean production average of 5.4 MGD. Um, that serves this region. And I just want to uh, point out that uh, the um, there are existing Maui DWS wells in Honolulu, and that uh, in this uh, Napili uh, Haina water system, about 94% of its use is categorized by Maui DWS as domestic use. Okay, so getting into the um, specifics of monitoring the availability of water and the use of that water. In um, Honokohau Valley at about the uh, 875 foot elevation, so um, 50 to 75 feet above the Honokohau intake or Aotaki Weir is a long-term USGS gauging station. It's been around for over 103 years and um, has provided us with um, some of the um, longest continuous data across the state. Um, this is the, the station itself right here. We know that between this station and Aotaki Weir are two development tunnels and then a spring. And the combined flow of these three sources is about a you know, median flow of 3.4 MGD and a low flow of 2.3 MGD. So using these estimates from USGS, we can actually add that to USGS um, gauging station data to estimate uh, the continuous record of how much water is available at Aotaki Weir. And we get low flow um, values uh, from USGS report of uh, about 19.4 MGD, uh, medium flow to about 11 MGD low flow. I also wanna point out that um, the stream is largely gaining from Malka to Mackay. So the Aotaki Weir diversion 770 is right here and um, it's flowing continuously with gains in stream flow um, primarily through this middle reach. Um, and then uh, there's a small, small losing section in the um, lower reach area. But um, other than that, it's, it's continuously flowing, Malcolm Mackay. Um, the in-stream uses include uh, perennial habitat and abundant aquatic biota. Um, it's uh, ranked um, you know, substantially by Hawaii Stream Assessment for its recreational uses. I've personally been there where um, dozens and dozens of children and, um, and adults are swimming and uh, using rope swings and recreating in the stream. Um, the water is used for domestic uses, uh, including repairing uses directly from the stream. Um, and then finally, this is another one of the watersheds or Ahupua'a that supports um, more than 50 acres, historically more than 50 acres of Lo'ikalo. And uh, the traditional customary practices are ranked, um, or cultural practices are ranked outstanding the Hawaii Stream Assessment. Um, we have a number of uh, uh, po'ovai uh, in the um, downstream of what is uh, called McDonald's Dam, and those feed uh, various low-E complexes. I'm not going to go into um, all of them other than uh, they've been um, in um, certain states of restoration, especially following the flooding in 2018 that there's been uh, a huge resurgence in restoring the hollow throughout the valley. Um, historically, so um, especially while Maui Land and Pine was still growing pineapple, uh, approximately one MGD was being released uh, at it 15 from Honokohau Ditch, um, or as commonly called Arrowgate. Um, and then more recently, up to two and a half million gallons per day have, has been released from Tarrogate. And this is to support um, in-stream uses um, and, and two and a half M MGD uh, in collaboration with the stream gains were believed by Maui Land and Pine to be adequate to meet the in-stream uses. However, um, Seaworm staff began monitoring Honokohau at McDonald's Dam, which is uh, basically above all of the low Ikalo in the valley in 2018. And we've had a continuous um, real-time monitoring station installed um, for the majority of the last two years. 
and um, it is below Terrogate release, uh, meaning it does capture or, or monitor the flows um, following the release of water back into the stream. We also um, have to point out that at Aotaki Weir, some water ha uh, has recently been restored past the diversion. Now this doesn't provide for connectivity, um, and I'll get to that a little bit later, but it does provide for downstream habitat. Um, because Maui Land and Pine wasn't monitoring the ditch itself, um, Seaworm staff decided to at least temporarily install a real-time monitoring station in Honokohau Ditch at, at its six, uh, meaning it's fairly close to the intake, um, uh, which is um, it's about half a mile uh, walk from the helicopter landing pad at uh, Aotaki Weir. Um, and we can monitor flow diverted from Honokaha stream um, directly in the ditch. Um, this monitoring station, however, is before at it 15, uh, meaning there um, is some double counting in the sense that um, what's measured at McDonald's Dam um, is also measured partially at, at it six. So to provide you with a little bit more spatial representation of what I'm talking about, the USGS gauging station at, um, in Honokohau is up here in this green dot, represented by the green dot. Um, the, U the seaworm station at, at it six is right here, measuring uh, ditch flow in red. Uh, the seaworm station at McDonald's Dam is right here in red. And then seaworm also installed a station at Mahinahina um, at the Mahinahina Weir, just past the Department of Water Supplies water treatment facility intake right here. So based on our analysis of in-stream uses, there's about 4.5 million gallons per day or 4.55 million gallons per day of demonstrated use um, uh, for ditch water. And that includes about 0.6 MGD of system loss. In gray right here, we have stream flow at um, measured at USGS station. And then in blue, we have a ditch flow measured by seaworm at, at its six. And as you can see, it varies. And in some days it's quite high. Um, the ditch was designed to capture, uh, I believe up to 50 or 60 million gallons per day. Um, and there is currently no control over the, um, the, the amount of water that can be diverted. Um, so, when there's more flow in the stream, there's more flow in the ditch. But generally speaking, there's anywhere from uh, you know, eight to 15 or 20 million gallons per day flowing in the ditch. Now, some of this gets returned back into um, the stream at, at it 15 or taro release gate. I wanted to examine specifically what is happening during an extreme drought condition. So last year uh, from July to November, um, West Maui is experiencing a pretty extreme drought. And we can zoom in on the data available at this um, point to kind of examine the impact of a lack of control uh, over this system and what the proposed IFS would uh, do. So um, as you can see, the um, demonstrated need is here in green and the proposed IIFS is here in red. And the flow at Aotaki Weir is this gray line. And then the flow at McDonald's Dam is the blue line. So for um, expect, uh, during those inter intervening periods between freshet events, you can see the flow in the stream is, is not um, at the IIFS level. I mean, that's primarily because the IFS hasn't been um, established yet. but um, the flow in the ditch um, continues to be substantially higher, in some cases twice as much as the demonstrated need for um, water, um, for non-potable water. And this is regardless of whether a freshet event is happening or not. Um, to zoom in a little bit more, um, the Flow at McDonald's Dam is represented in light blue. Um, the flow at Aotaki Weir in gray, um, and the proposed IFS here in red. So you get a better sense for um, uh, where the water is going. So when when flows are low in the stream, 
um, they're still fairly high in the ditch. Um, and, and that's primarily um, going to, uh, uh, you know, non, not going to Maui Department of Water Supply, let's say. All right, so some statistics on it. So the proposed IFS is 8.6. Um, the amount diverted over this um, uh, flow, this this dry period was 8.94 MGD. Um, in the medium flow, here's mean flow on the right. Um, the days that the proposed IFS wasn't being met um, is about uh, 64, 52% of the time it was not met. Um, and, uh, and that's from during the dry period. For the entirety of the, our monitoring period, so from November 2019 to April 2021, um, about 36% of the time, the, this proposed IIFS has not been met. Um, so the, the, uh, the amount of water at Aotaki Weir has been about 11 MGD, which is um, the long-term, if you remember, um, the long-term Q90 flow, um, which is the low flow estimated for Aotaki Weir. Um, so it's fairly, our understanding of the availability of water is confirmed, is fairly accurate. Um, and the, the proposed IFS of 8.6 would mean it'd be 2.2 MGD to, um, you know, during these low flow periods. Um, so the flow in Honoko House Stream at McDonald's Dam to uh, zoom out a little bit over the entirety of our monitoring period, I wanna pick out uh, two specific locations and or two specific points in time to demonstrate what the stream looks like. Um, here in July, 2020, when the flow was just below the IIFS, but fairly close to it, um, the stream looked like this. And there is still OPU, um, the, this is you know, just at the proposed IIFS. Um, it's providing sufficient habitat, it's wetted from bank to bank, um, it's deep, there are deep pools, there's runs, um, it a, has a diversity of habitats, and um, it's, it, I would say it's sufficient for extreme drought periods. Whereas um, more recently, at the end of February, we measured flow um, in Honokohau, which was um, way below, like 3 MGD below the proposed IIFS, so right here. What does that stream look like? It looks like this. It's not completely wetted from bank to bank. There are um, really shallow portions. It's just not sufficient to meet the um, habitat needs of Oopu, especially uh, if you want to consider the recreational needs of the community or the domestic needs of repairing users. Um, so this amount of water is just um, not acceptable. Um, to address the waste complaint, um, specifically, uh, Seaworm staff installed a monitoring station at Mahinahina. And this is a long-term, or this is a continuous real-time monitoring station, and it's at a location that has a rated partial flume. So it, um, while we've made uh, verification measurements, um, it's been pretty easy to maintain. Um, I want to uh, show you some of the data. Um, the gray line is the amount of water at Aotaki Weir, so that's the, the amount of water in Honokoha Stream. And the blue line is the amount of water flowing at Mahina, in Honokaha Ditch at Mahinahina. So this is after Maui Department of Water Supply has, has taken their water. So this is water that's not used. There's no um, existing use as defined um, by Maui Land and Pine. And so it's um, what I would consider would be waste. So in periods of dry time, there's, there's no waste, which is what we would expect. But when there's higher flow events um, and not even big flow events, so 20, 30, 40 MGD, that's not a big flow event for Honoko How. 200 MGD, that's a big flow event, but 30 or 40 MGD, that's not a big flow event. We're still seeing a lot of water flowing through Honoko How Ditch at Mahinahina, including, um, you know, basically almost the entirety of 2020, even during drought conditions, when you get a freshet event, there's water um, gushing through. Um, so in the period of time that we've had this station operational, uh, about 56% of the days have had some flow uh, with a medium flow of 1.74 MGD. And that includes the 45% um, of the days that had zero. So if you take those out, well, if, if, you, if you look at the average flow for all of the 
um, the days in this um, time frame from August 2019 to April 2021, average flow is 6.51 MGD flowing through Mahini Hina. And that is not water that's going to any defined use as um, identified by Maui Land and Pine. Where is that water mostly going to? It's mostly going to reservoir, um, field 140 reservoir right here or into Honokawai um, Gulch. Some of it does continue onto Honokohau Ditch um, to um, um, Honopali land, but that's um, not um, for this discussion. So um, what do I conclude? Um, as staff, water is being removed from Honokohau stream in excess of existing demands that does not meet the reasonable beneficial use criteria as defined by HRS 174C-3, which is the use of water in such quantity as is necessary for economic and efficient utilization for a purpose and in a manner which is both reasonable and consistent with the state and county land use plans and the public interest. So um, in order to address uh, this uh, formal complaint as well as establish DHHL's water reservation, non-potable water reservation, um, sewer staff are suggesting that we establish in-stream flow standards. Um, which is necessary to protect the public interest in waters of the state. Um, the protection of in-stream in -stream uses um, shall include, um, you know, all the things that the water code identifies and the commission shall consider physical solutions, including water exchanges, modifications of project operations, changes in points of diversion, changes in time and rate of diversion and uses of water from alternative sources or any other solutions. In terms of alternative sources, we have two primary alternatives, groundwater, uh, Kapalua water, or now uh, as they're known, um, Hawaii Water Service has two installed groundwater wells um, with pumps and then a third well without a pump um, that could be used to meet any increased demand during low flow conditions, as well as the, the availability of uh, R1 water from Maui County's Lahaina Wastewater Treatment Facility. Um, Kapalua Wastewater also treats water um, and um, there's the potential to bring R1 water from Honokovai all the way to Kapalua if necessary. Um, I didn't really get into Kalua Nui because it's um, a small part in this, but in uh, September 2020, as previously mentioned, this diversion was formally abandoned. So the interim IFS recommended for this location is the natural flow. Um, for Honokohau, I'm recommending a two-phased IIFS approach. The first phase can be implemented tomorrow if necessary or you know, within 90 days, um, which is the flows necessary to protect all of the in-stream uses, the public trust uses. Phase two um, will go into effect when um, uh, DHHL starts needing water, non-potable water through the Honokohau system. And DH DHHL as a public trust use um, needs is now reliant on a, a private entity to deliver them water. And this is where um, the IFS would be, um, phase two of the IFS would take place, which is that we would keep 50% of the water in the stream at all times. And 50% of the water would be available for domestic needs for Maui Department of Water Supply, DHHL, and other reasonable and beneficial uses. Um, basically the stream has no alternative. So we need to keep, um, as much water as practical in the stream. So where does that look like? Well, we have a monitoring station at McDonald's Dam, so we can um, in, um, implement phase one. Um, I put within one year, but um, you know that was dependent on modifications to the intake or to other parts of the system to restore flow. Um, so we can have a conversation about timeline for that. Um, we currently have flow bypassing Aotaki Weir following the 2018 flood event. And this flow provides continuous Mount um, uh, wetted pathway. So to the extent that Aotaki Weir or the concrete dam right here that needs to be modified is yet to be seen. Obviously the intake itself or some mechanism to get water back in the stream needs to be modified. But as of right now, I don't think um, Aotaki Weir needs to be modified. So what are the implications of these IIFS? Um, so phase one, um, let, me, let me break it down for you. Maui, um, mean daily flow, MDF is right here. Q50, your median flow, Q70 and Q90 are listed here. Um, this is the flow estimated at USGS. 
uh, at the USGS game, um, monitoring station. This is the groundwater gains in flow um, between USGS and Aotaki Weir. So um, the amount of water available above version 770 is the sum of these two rows. Um, between the version 770 and our monitoring station are um, about 1.4 MGD of groundwater gain. So the IFS of 8.6 as proposed for phase one um, would be um, would, would leave this amount available for off-stream use right here. Um, what are those uses? Well, Maui DWS has 2.5 MGD of use. Um, in phase one, this is four DHHL starts needing water, their use is zero. Um, and Maui Land and Pines non-in-stream uses are about um, 1.8 MGD. And then system loss 0.6. So the total off-stream demand is about 4.3. But really only during those extreme low flow periods do we have unmet um, demand. And that is estimated to be about 1.1 MGD. And that's where the availability of groundwater comes in. So for a small proportion of the time, so about 10% of the time, um, some of the unmet demand will be met with um, groundwater as needed. Um, keeping in mind that there are some reservoirs in the system. In phase two, uh, same breakdown of water available. However, the IIFS is 50% of the stream flow measured at, um, and then measured at McDonald's Dam. So 50% of the mean daily flow is 13.7, 50% of the Q50 is 10.4, 50% um, of Q70 is 8.5, and of Q90 is 6.8. Um, DHHL's not, um, agricultural water demand is 2 MGD. It's inserted here. So the total off stream demand goes up. Um, but we can meet those um, mostly public trust needs of uh, domestic water supply and DHHL with this variable IFS, um, with the uh, understanding that, again, during low flow periods, there is going to be some unmet demand that um, Kapalua Water or um, Hawaii Water Service has the availability ground of. Uh, groundwater availability to meet uh, irrigation needs of the Kapalu Resort area um, for short um, for short time periods. Um, in Honolulu, we already have an uh, commission has already approved the abandonment of Diversion 769, and so the um, IFS recommended is the natural flow um, in Honolulu stream. And I just want to leave with um, some images of the variability in flow at Aotaki Weir. Um, these are two different, um, same location, uh, these photographs taken two years apart. So that's all um, I had. Thank you very much. Huge amount of information as we have uh, come to appreciate you're capable of. And um, uh, so very, very instrumental in putting this proposed IIFS together. Um, okay, uh, questions, commissioners? No, uh, no, no questions for me, Erin. I um, just deeply appreciate your, your effort and um, hard work and, and thoroughness, you know, and really thinking through the, the waste issues, you know, reasonable and beneficial use. And, um, you know, I, I, I think this proposal for, you know, um, 50% um, also makes a lot of sense. So, yeah, looking forward to um, hearing other questions and comments, but um, yeah, I just want to mahalo you for your work. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Aaron, I, I'm a little concerned about what DHHL in particular has proposed. Uh, the request at the long-term reservation for sole use of uh, the last 2 million gallons a day of potable water uh, on the very dry west side of Maui and to use it for non-potable irrigation. Um, and that just it kind of runs counter to uh, my understanding of, of uh, uh, 
what uh, irrigation water is all about. Um, it's my understanding that that uh, the county of Maui is uh, their environmental management department is treating prospectively uh, and would take a few more years to complete the project, I guess, but uh, it prospectively is going to be treating all of the sewage water at uh, the Lahaina sewer treatment plant to an R1 status. And that uh, currently uh, less than half of that's being used right now and they've run out of potential users, although they have two large reservoirs available. Is that your understanding as well? Yeah, I think the, the key issue is that not that the water is treated to R1, but that the chloride content of the water is sufficient for uh, agricultural crops. And because of um, leakage problems of the, the, the collection system on private lands that they cannot force upgrades to, that um, the Department of, uh, the, the wastewater itself um, has, uh, is saline. Um, and so the proposed um, DHHL reservation is is irrespective of, you know, the availability of R1, but that we would hope that the um, water could be blended between, um, you know, the, the potentially two MGD um, from Honokohau ditch that would be reserved for DHHL with the R1 water to lower those chlorides so that it would be, we would get per, perhaps four MGD of, ag, of water available for agriculture, which could be a huge um, benefit for the West side um, in terms of uh, agricultural productivity and sustainability. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I certainly agree with that, especially because the reservoirs for that R1 water are right there on the in effect on the DHHL property. Um, so it wouldn't require any transportation or pumping or anything else. Uh, and right. presumably if you did blend, uh, you wouldn't need a reservation of 2 million gallons a day. You use uh, substantially less, which would leave room for uh, expansion of the community use, uh, which is not for non-potable water, but it's really, really uh, the need is for potable water for the foreseeable future. Um, as you know, the Mahinina plant is, is uh, being expanded and will be undoubtedly expanded again over the next 20 years, which is the life of that reservation. Um, thank you. I, 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 was, I was bothered by that and also by the uh, unmet needs issue of, of 1.3 uh, million gallons a day. Um, you know, when you've got to, you've got to pump that uh, and then put it in the ditch and add it to the water that's secondarily treated at Mihinahina uh, for potable purposes, that certainly adds a substantial uh, additional cost to people who who rely on potable water in the west side. Uh, so I think um, that 1.3 is primarily in Kapalua. So the water wouldn't be put in the ditch itself. It would be used within um, the, you know, the resort irrigation needs. Yeah, but Kapalua's needs are met already without that additional 1.3. Kapalu has a dual system, it's, right. uh, and uh, their irrigation needs are met by irrigation water, which is the way the world ought to work, um, and uh, their potable needs are met by uh, the well water. So to, to, to pump the so well. So during low flow conditions, the um, there's just not enough to meet everybody's needs. So um, with the availability of groundwater as a backup source, or even R1 as backup source to meet the irrigation needs of the resort. Um, you know, the, the, the stream itself doesn't have a backup. Yeah, so net of, net of that blended water uh, that would be uh, uh, useful, assuming the whole 2 million gallons was needed for uh, irrigation on, uh, by DHHL and that farmland, um, that would leave presumably about a million gallons available uh, of potable water, uh, again, uh, so you could meet low flow conditions there, um, presumably. Okay. I think I, I, I think I understand it. I appreciate that. So it, to take, again, uh, from my perspective, um, to take this last potable low cost supply uh, from Hanukkah and, and instead of using it, 
uh, you know, for uh, potable purposes uh, and to serve the public uh, to uh, use it for non-potable purposes uh, just doesn't seem to be the most efficient way to go about it. And uh, um, if that seemed to be where your report was headed, uh, from my perspective anyway. So, I mean, I think there are definitely some efficiencies that can be made and, um, you know, the, the resort irrigation and golf course irrigation needs are somewhere around you know, 1.8 million gallons per day. And mm -hmm. the fact that there's currently being diverted, you know, 8.5 million gallons per day, even if you take in system loss and Maui County's currently 2 MGD use, but up to 2.5 MGD use, there's still a good three million gallons, three to five million gallons that's not being utilized. So where's that going? Well, we, you know, keep it in the stream. It is, um, is Maui land uh, being cooperative in terms of the work to uh, the uh, intake number one, Ayataki gate uh, diversion repairs and, uh, and uh, at this point, are they uh, uh, moving ahead with the, uh, with the, uh, the siphon uh, repair agreement with the county? So the county with their new MOU with uh, MLP, if I understand it correctly, and they're on the this um, uh, meeting, they're, they're representing themselves. Um, uh, the Honokahua siphon will be monitored and will be upgraded as needed, but that need is not right now. So they will collaborate together to move forward with that as needed. Um, the, uh, in terms of repairs to Aotaki Weir, they had um, enlisted uh, Akanaka and Associates to consult. And, that, and between um, you know, the, the pandemic situation and limited access and storm events, you know, not being able to helicopter in, um, you know, they've, they've had limited access. So whether they will, are moving forward or not. At this point, I don't believe they have, um, but that may be something that uh, the commission can address. Yeah, that would certainly be desirable. Okay, thanks. Thanks for listening to me. Yeah, I think Mr. Buck was next, and then Mr. Hannes. Uh, I'm, um, Chair, I'm okay, I'll pass. Okay, Mr. Hannes. Just on, back on uh, Commissioner Meyer's issue about the uh, Hawaiian DHHL reservation. After we've granted a reservation, if we find that there's a better way to fulfill it, that if the water gets treated and we can do it different, are we free to go back and revisit the reservation and, and change it? That's beyond my understanding. Um, I, I do know that the current wastewater system, um, because of problems on private land that county can't force upgrades to the collection system, that there is, there is saltwater intrusion into the system. And that high chloride content really limits the use of the R1 treated water to um, certain types of landscaping and golf course irrigation, not um, orchard crops or, or uh, leafy greens, those sort of things. So that's where blending it to lower the chloride content would be beneficial to everybody. Um, it would provide uh, the county with a, um, a source of water that could be distributed to much greater or more diverse use. It would also be um, provide more um, reliability for uh, you know the availability of water. Uh, if if the county were to upgrade this the irrigation system, um, you know it would provide water for DHHL. It could potentially provide water for um, Kanapali land Correct. for other ag needs in the region. Um, we could you know have but we uh, have but we have to act now with what we know and what we know is they haven't yet. Correct. So I guess my question was if we act now based on the best information available, but then that conditions change in the future, are we able to go back and re so, uh, Hannes, I can Leo jump has a, a comment there. Yeah, so related to, to the reservations by DHHL. So I do want to highlight again, um, this commission when it did uh, kind of after the state water projects plan was adopted, it also reserved water statewide for DHHL's needs. Um, and those primarily focus on groundwater and or potable needs of DHHL. Within that submittal, it also directed staff that when we're amending in-stream flows, 
that we consider the non-potable needs of DHHL as part of that res part of that process. So we're being consistent with what the commission's um, articulated as how it wants to approach surface water reservations or non-potable reservations for DHHL. And because this has been highlighted by Aaron, um, Aaron, Aaron's been doing work in this region. Um, and because Honokoha Ditch um, could service uh, DHHL's lands, uh, we're recommending that this be um, married together as part of the setting and establishment of IFS. Um, it is one of the public trust uses that we need to sure. account for in our decision making. So, and to answer your question, I think the commission ultimately always reserves the right to revisit its decision making um, and to amend its decisions as it sees fit uh, in future decisions as more data is available or as additional needs come. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think we'll live with that. Uh, secondly, Aaron, you've always done a great job uh, reaching out to community. I, I'm really, we're holding this meeting and I'm missing the usual faces of the Kiahis and Kalepa and uh, Archie. I mean, and, they, uh, uh, they should be here. They? I've talked I to know, them. I know, uh, so I know. So I just want to be assured. I know with pandemic, it's been much more uh, challenging, but are, is the community uh, aware of these actions, I see the Maui Land and Pine folks here, but I don't see some of the normal community advocates uh, here. And they're, yeah, we, they're we reached out to them um, even within the last week, but um, I've been continuing to work uh, in West Maui fairly consistently for the last 12 months. The pandemic really didn't slow us down much. Well, thank you for that. It's, it's, uh, I know they appreciate that a lot. Thank you. And maybe they're here in a certain sense of confidence that uh, they know what you're doing. Thank you. Uh, we, we do have some public testimony. I think we have uh, a couple people here available for questions. I don't know if they want to add anything, Mr. Keith Agaran or Mr. Subrata. Anything you want to add? Sorry, thank you, Chair Case. Um, I'm Gil Agaran. I'm representing Maui Land and Pineapple. And I think Mr. Subrata is here as well. And and we're available really just as a resource if you wanna, if there are any questions from any of the members um, about where we are. I, I think that Aaron um, summarized um, the steps that were taken and were, were able, then Maui Land and Pineapple was able to take. Uh, they were fairly limited in some of the follow-up that they had. I think they, they did move forward, of course, with the petitions to abandon but there was a limitation on getting their consultants over to do some site inspections. And then the information they gathered, I think, which has been shared with Aaron and other Water Commission staff about um, some of the thoughts that they have about what could be done um, at different places to, to uh, provide the kind of information that Aaron, Aaron described is currently lacking and also to address how much water is um, going into the ditch and, and, and how to return that water to the stream that's not being used. So, but we're here to respond to any questions and uh, just to get a sense of where the commission um, would like to go um, based on the information that they received today. And I don't know if um, Paul Sabrata wants to add anything. No, thank you, Gil. Thank you, commissioners. Um, I think Aaron's, thank you, Aaron, for the presentation. I think it was um, very helpful in summarizing uh, what we have done in terms of the action items since our last meeting in November, 2019. I think we have spent quite significant resources um, to make sure that it is, is, is fixed um, from the storm damage. Uh, clean up and inspect as much as we can, uh, make sure that the county of Maui and the community, we met with the community uh, at Honokoha Valley. Uh, we were supposed to meet again <laughs> and then the pandemic happened, unfortunately. Uh, but, uh, and we, we, meet, we, 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 we are working and making sure that the different parties, including primarily the um, county of Maui Department of Water Supply is getting what they, they need. And in collaboration, we, we made sure that all the five action items, uh, I believe four of them, we were able to accomplish 
um, or make an effort to finish, um, including include the, 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 the <laughs> except for one item, which is that that uh, remote control mon uh, system uh, over at the Diversion 770. Uh, the location is very remote. It's um, not feasible. Um, and we're, we're having, you know, our, our engineer uh, and consultants are, are, are having challenges um, kind of moving forward and, and, and accomplishing that action item. Um, we have alternatives that we think will work, uh, but ultimately one, one, one item that we would like the commission to request is, is to um, waive the uh, condition for this um, automatic gate system um, and put a perhaps a, a simpler, uh, more, uh, what did you, you, the word Aaron used, something that is more, um, a hardware that that could be that that is not so uh, out of reach just to just to make sure that that there is no waste and that the waste is, is being controlled during high flow uh, as versus having to put in a, um, a a gate that goes up and down and try to try to control um, 20 million gallon of water or up, the ditch can take up to 60 million gallon of water and, and, and not having power um, uh, in, in that area, uh, just proving to be quite a challenge. So uh, our request is to, um, you know, see based on the information that, that uh, Aaron had provided and the, the progress that we have made uh, with the community, with, with the different parties uh, on all the different action items, um, to consider perhaps uh, the remote control can be in a different form or, or uh, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, something that is, uh, that, that alternative be, be, uh, can be considered uh, and, 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 and um, uh, that, is, that, is, that is more viable to, to Maui land um, to implement. Okay, thank you. Um... We also have Mr. Scheuer here for testimony. Aloha, commissioners. Um, like Mr. Teeth Agron, I'm, I'm here for DHHL, but um, we've worked closely with Aaron on these efforts. We've appreciated his patience as the department works through its Honokawai Homestead Community Master Planning and Environmental Review. We're supportive of the proposed reservations. We think they're consistent with your duties under section 101 of the code, as well as the statewide <laughs> projects plan's preference to match the kind of the source. In other words, a non-potable source like the water in the stitch with the non-potable needs that we have. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Um, okay, commissioners, that's all the public testimony we have. Are there any other questions at this time? This is an informational item, so it's not an action item. Yeah, I have one, maybe Chair Kaleo, uh, maybe it's late in the day, my mind's not working too well. Well, what, what exactly is left now for the commission uh, on the uh, IFS to issue here? What, 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 what items do we need to address? Uh, related to IFS in Honokohao, Honolua, and uh, or what's being presented here is, is a measurable IFS. We haven't established one. Uh, the commission dealt with the waste complaint, which was focused on MLPs, diversions, uh, abandonment of some of them and then modifications of others. So we're still working through those with MLP, but we haven't actually, this is the first time we've talked about the IFS in detail uh, with that number that Aaron just presented to the commission. So we've been doing these in two parts now. So it gives the commission a chance to react to the number. It gives the public a chance to opine and provide, you know, questions back to the commission and ability for you to balance. So again, similar to why only the conversation prior um, you know, if there isn't any concerns, you know, we'll bring this back to the commission at a subsequent meeting, could be as early as next month, um, to recommend a measurable IFS be established. Um, and that's why we're here. We're just trying to determine how comfortable you are as a commission and collective on moving forward with establishing IFS. And in this case, because DHHL has a potential non-potable demand in the region, 
to also address address the digital reservation simultaneous to that decision. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions at this time, commissioners? Hearing none. Thank you for this presentation. That does bring us to the end of this meeting, uh, a very long, very informative meeting. So really appreciate everyone's work and um, the progress that we're, we're making collectively um, on these water issues and particularly in interim industry flow standards. Our next meeting is scheduled tentatively for May 18, 2021. And with that, that brings this meeting to a close. Kaleo, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just want to chair um, if the commission can um, jump on to the other Zoom immediately after this really quickly, uh, and then we'll um, have that conversation. Uh, you, you guys will meet as part of a contested case hearing discussion and deliberation. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay, mahalo. Non-sunshine, Colin. Yeah, uh, uh, Claire, could you re resend the, the Zoom on that? On the yep, I will meeting? resend it out to all of you. Yep, thank you. It's, it's in the calendar too, if anybody needs it. Okay, oh, okay. thank you, everyone. by accident. <laughs> okay. In the calendar. Aloha, Chair. Aloha, Commissioners. Mahalo. Aloha. Aloha. Really Aloha Good job.